Yeah, Dr. Ashok, are we ready? We are live, sir. Yeah, we are okay, live. I welcome you all for this uh, Delhi Orthopedic Association PG Teaching and Training Program. Uh, myself, Dr. Manish Dhawan, and uh, with me, Dr. Vivek Jangira, is, we are the moderators. And we have a very uh, learned uh, panelist uh, with us, and Dr. SKS Maria, Dr. Anil Mehtani, Dr. RK Arya, and Dr. Mukesh Kalra. And now I request Dr. Vivek to please introduce the speakers. Uh, so let me start with the first speaker. Uh, uh, our opening best friend is Dr. Alok Sud. He has many years as a teacher. In his circle, he is known, as, uh, known to be a very hardcore academician. Let us first invite him for his first lecture in uh, clinical teaching, improvisations and outcomes. Sir. Thanks, Vivek. Thanks for the kind words. I'll start sharing my screen. screen. Yeah. So good morning, everybody. Uh, the topic I have been interested uh, with is uh, postgraduate clinical teaching, improvisations and outcomes. Uh, see, I begin this uh, talk with the basic premise that educating patients and colleagues is a routine and fundamental part of any physician's work. So these two cannot be separated out. The clinical work as well as the teaching cannot be separated out. And that is why the teaching is extremely important. Now, what is the aim of the postgraduate teaching? The basic aim of the postgraduate teaching is to pass on the skills. Now, these skills can be of two types. These can be objective skills and these can be subjective skills. We all know about the objective skills because all of us are known by our objective skills, which are clinical skills, history taking, examination, reaching a differential diagnosis. Alok, thoda awaj nahi aari. Interpreting, interpreting the, am I clear now? Uh, yeah, you are clear, sir. Your sound is okay, but your sound is actually a little bit less. Otherwise, okay. clarity is okay. Okay. So, uh, the relevant investigations uh, to be uh, how to interpret them and the surgical skills, the research and evidence-based practice. But besides these objective skills, uh, there are more uh, skills which have to be passed on and they are actually more important than the objective skills. These are ethics, the empathy, and learning from your, your own mistakes and set, setting an example for the postgraduates of a true professionalism, staying away from personal criticisms of, of your colleagues. Now, basically, what do you mean by ethics? So ethics are your decisions and your actions, right? The actions and decisions which a physician takes in the interest of the patient, they are sil silently absorbed by your postgraduate training. And basically, when you are practicing the ethical practice, empathy follows itself. So these subjective skills are much more important as compared to your objective skills. And maybe you're not talking about them, but your behavior and your body language, the PG will learn from that. Now, coming to the aim of the PG learning, having talked about such lofty, uh, in, uh, uh, lofty aims in the previous slide, the aim of the PG learning is basically tumbling to passing the exit exam. And therefore, our teaching also has become like that, right? In first two years, the PG gets accustomed to the, uh, to, to the hospital, to the working environment, to the thesis. And in the last year, we keep on adding on certain lectures and certain PG classes, and we start molding their thought in a certain direction. So clearing an exam is not at all difficult because there will be typical cases, there will be stereotype questions, there are even books which are existing on these and there will be right answers. Any trainee who has undergone few classes in a medical college, be it Molana's or Lady Harding or UCMS, will be able to crack the examination. However, this examination, it doesn't test the aptitude. It is not skill-based, all of us know that. It will not be necessarily truly evaluative and as I was telling you that it just promotes a conditioned thinking. It doesn't encourage independent thinking process, creativity and research ideas. More than that, a failure does not mean that that particular candidate lacks aptitude and knowledge. Even vice versa is true. A person who has passed the exam, it doesn't necessarily mean that he knows everything. 
So all in all, the summary is that passing the exam is not equal to acquiring the skill. And therefore, we see that there is low interest in conventional teaching. However, exit exam is not bad, right? It is a time-honored, time-honored policy. It a time-honored principle which works on uh, the principle of carrot and stick. What is stick? Stick means fear, right? So basically, fear is to pass the exam. So with this fear, uh, the candidate goes through the literature and research at length thoroughly, and probably this is the only time in his lifetime when he will go through the literature so thoroughly. And this is induced by the fear of the exam. So it is not bad all the time. It gives the confidence that only a well-read person can have and it prepares you for objective assessment. The reward, the reward is that you become eligible for the degree and for practice, right? There is feel good factor of passing. It brings in the competitive spirit and maybe you may be evaluated and rewarded as your best resident. And sometimes in certain medical colleges, these marks are also uh, used for appointment as a senior resident. So what are the current teaching methods or learning methods for the postgraduate students? Currently, the postgraduate students, they learn in the OPT during ward rounds, operating rooms, right? All of us do that. Teaching rounds, which are taken by faculty and the senior resident. Dedicated clinical case discussions, which we take as classes, seminar and journal club presentations, difficult case presentations, and supervision protocol and thesis writing. So these are few of the methods by which currently we are teaching our postgraduate students. Now these current methods are traditional, right? We learn from our seniors and we are teaching the same to our juniors. So it depends upon the principle of see one, do one, teach one, right? You see a surgery, surgical procedure or a skill, do that surgical uh, skill or procedure and then teach one to your junior. That is how it is built. So these, this involves picking up the skills opportunistically. As and when the patient and situation arises, we learn by osmosis. This is called learning by osmosis. So this kind of teaching and training is unstructured and this has not changed for the last 60 to 70 years. There is hardly any well-defined curriculum. There is no subspeciality training. And all the more, the training period is insufficient. We, we are just training our postgraduates for three years as compared to six years in the West, in the developed nations. The training is non-uniform. There might be dis discrepancy in between training between Molana Azad and Lady Harding. There might be discrepancy in training between Delhi and South India. So this has to be uniform. So there are several reasons for such training deficiency. Some of them are physician dependent. The physician dependent are that we are unable to always practice what we preach because of logistic reasons, right? The patient might be very poor, the patient load might be too much. So we are unable to, uh, uh, we are unable to manage in, in the manner it, he should be managed. So the postgraduate student picks up this duality that, okay, reading the book is something else and in practice it is something else. Second, paucity of research and literature, especially from Indian subcontinent. And very, very important is lack of education training for the physicians. There are hardly any reasons for training dependent because it is the, it is the duty of the faculty to arise uh, to uh, interest of the training in the, in the speciality or subspeciality. So let us take these factors one by one. Yeah. And, uh, a third factor, which is very important, is population dependent. As I was saying that ideal practice may not always be poss possible because, you know, our health, health structure uh, is extremely unorganized. So the administration has a lot of, uh, you know, flag to take. It is not only physicians. So I was talking about less or no literature or research from India on problems which are peculiar about developing nations. Now we in day-to-day -day practice, we keep uh, uh, seeing patients of infections, sequelae, tuberculosis, congenital deformities which are presenting late, neglected trauma. You will hardly find any literature in the Western literature. Now, how do we teach our postgraduate students in such scenarios? So we keep on taking Western principles and we keep on applying them on our patients without any uh, uh, indigenous research. So that way there is no literature or research which is coming from India on these topics. 
and that is why there might be paucity of literature there might be duality in what we say and what we practice all these things are being silently absorbed by the trainee right so don't think that they are stupid though trainees are seeing everything and they are learning whatever we are doing either spoken or unspoken then very important lack of training for us right now you will be surprised that an, a, a teacher cannot teach in a nursery students or school students without education training but at such a senior level at such a complicated level we are expected to teach the students without any education training right although such kind of trends are changing and there are medical education cells now being uh, set up in each medical college now there were popular beliefs in our time that teachers are born and not made and 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 most of us had charismatic teachers who were few right most of us are average but some of them were te charismatic teachers now these charismatic teachers were can be made right they are not always born if we are properly trained like you can make a charismatic surgeon you can also make a charismatic teacher so what is lacking is training now coming to the lacuna on the presenting in the present teaching methods now there are various lacuna in our in our in our uh, teaching i will be taking out few of them now the most important of this i thought is the communication skill right we do not teach our trainees how to communicate with the patient now this the communication should include how to take a consent especially in the medical legal aspect it should explain morbidity risks and implant costs sadly this is largely learned by observation there should be separate teaching teaching time now the uh, mci mci has uh, separated out resources and time for the undergraduates similar thing should be done for the post graduate students like in a number 2 which is very important and will become more important in future is record keeping right so written or digitized records how to keep them is never taught it was never taught to us and we are not teaching it to our post graduate students similarly keeping the discharge and mortality records mlc records pre op and post op clinical pictures and videos they are becoming increasingly important because the teaching will be becoming more and more digitized so special time and resources should be spent by the by the by the college and by the university on developing these resources presently most of us are not good to teach this uh, skill to our students so this has to be done separately in separate classes with separate funds and separate time like in number 3 we lack in statistics and research right most of us for most of us the research is limited to giving the thesis and supervision of the thesis right we do not know anything about statistics we don't have any research orientation and because we do not don't have any research orientation we are unable to pass it on to the post graduate students so the solution is is uh, is both simple and complicated there should be mandatory publications for faculty and trainees in index journals time and resources for learning the statistics should be kept aside right lacuna number 4 now this is the lacuna where most of us will concentrate keeping the communication skill the record keeping behind right even in passing on the clinical skills we lag behind right that is because this is a old system right it needs revamp which is consistent with the present times of availability of state of art imaging and diagnostic methods this can be overcome by including integrated integrated teaching we should include people from radiology to uh, to teach our post graduate students about ct scan mri ultrasound and their uses right most of the times when we are taking case discussions our case discussion stops short on differential diagnosis we do not want to take up management because management part may be there may be disparity in what we are doing actually and what is written in the literature and that is why we might shy away from taking the management part now this has to go away uh, there is more than required emphasis on clinical methods and certain clinical tests which have no relevance or less relevance we keep on harping about certain names and of some obsolete tests and the passing and fail of the uh candidate depends on that i think this kind of mindset should be done away with all of us should uh, acquire a more mature approach and 
case discussion should not harp around, should not beat around the bush on the names of the clinical tests, which are no more useful. Surgical skills. Now this we do not teach at all, right? There is absence of skill labs. There is non-existent cadaveric dissection. There is absence of digital tools for surgical skills and dissection. And uh, the future belongs to the digitization. So we should all prepare videos. We should all, all take help from publishing houses which are involved in making animated and real-time videos because the skills, the surgical skills in future will be passed on in this manner only. There should be ideally regular cadaveric dissection courses at least twice a year. And there should be skill labs which are common to all surgical specialties as well as specialized uh, sawbone on specialized sawbone models and mannequins for learning the skills in orthopedics. Lacuna number five, which is very important, is that we are not doing any rotations. Now we all know that all medical colleges, all medical colleges cannot develop all subspecialties. So there should be at least intra-hospital rotation within the units, if not inter-hospital within the university. Ideally, there should be inter-hospital uh, uh, rotation, and it is possible if it is within the university. And I think improvisation should be done at this level. So what are the improvisations which, 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 which have to be done to improve the PG teaching? The improvisations can be done at the government level and the, at the university level. At the university level, we must develop a very well-defined curriculum a uniform structure training, at least in the university. Uh, as I told you, uh, there should be rotations, both intra as well as intra-hospital. Emphasis should be there on skills and competency rather than clearing the exam. Uh, the training time should be increased from three years with the focus on developing subspeciality as this is the, you know, genre of subspeciality. So you cannot do away with this reality. Assessment pattern has to change. There has to be more emphasis on periodical assessment, skill acquiring and logbook assessment rather than a single exit exam. The government can help us by providing funds and by organizing the health, health, uh, health structure. At the institute level, there should be integrated teaching. And one of the best way for integrated teaching is monthly or fortnightly clinical case meet for selected cases, where the pathologist is involved, the radiologist is involved, and the clinician is involved. Mortality meet is yet another very good way of uh, auditing the cause of death and preventing the morbidity in future. Medical education cells should be uh, established in all medical colleges and they should not only cater to undergraduate teaching but also postgraduate teaching. Orientation uh, first for the faculty and then for the postgrad student should be there necessarily in research, statistics and paper writing. Communication skills and medical legal workshops should be, uh, should be actively participated in. And as I already discussed that mandatory skill lab posting, access to cadaveric dissection, simulated surgical skill dissections and uh, skill developments and access to international libraries through, inter uh, through institute has to be there. National and international participation for the postgraduate should be, should be uh, encouraged via workshops and symposia and quality assessments should include the teachers also, right? Uh, the last slide is that we must do away with this kind of assessment because this kind of assessment does not, it changes altogether the, uh, the focus of the PG teaching. It, it just uh, uh, goes on to uh, passing the exit, exit exam rather than uh, picking up skills. So assessment should be done on rotations and logbooks and all those methods uh, sh uh, sh should be employed, which I have already discussed. As far as theory is concerned, the question should be more, unstru more structured rather than unstructured with the help of OSCE, MCQs, etc. Thank you very much. Now, this, this was prepared uh, only by my personal experience, and I am sure that I have missed a lot of points on PG teaching in this, and I am open to receive all these points. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> now, uh, the talk is open for discussions. Pan panelists may ask questions or may... Can I, up can I ask a question, Dr. Vivek? Yes, yes, please. Uh, Dr. Alok, 
Yeah, good morning. Yeah. Good. Good morning, sir. How are you? Yeah. Sir, fantastic talk. And uh, 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 sir, uh, you rightly said there are many of the tests uh, which uh, should be which are obsolete. For example, telescopy in a fresh case of intertrochanteric fracture. This is one of the you know we all tell our PGs ki ye test karna hota hai you know. Uh, so you rightly said, are we still practicing it? I mean, in a painful knee, uh, just to test a knee when we have an X-rays and CT scan and MRIs, are we still doing all this in the in the medical colleges? Uh, actually, Doctor Samit, you are right. Uh, what I'll answer in this fashion that uh, we have to introduce the clinical methods to the postgraduate trainees, but uh, in this uh, state, in the modern times, when there is so much of uh, uh, diagnostic methods are there. We have to corroborate these clinical tests with the diagnostic methods, right? We cannot, the diagnostic methods cannot be done away, right? So uh, the diagnostic method should form part and parcel of the examination in today's time. And we should teach them the diagnostic methods without losing the focus on the clinical methods. So it, it is a tight rope. We have to teach them both. Right now our focus is more more on clinical methods or rather only on clinical methods. But this, 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 this pattern should change and we should bring in the radiology. Uh, 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 since we are in orthopedics, we should bring in radiology and imaging into teaching, into regular teaching in the management when we are discussing our case discussions. Correct, so, sir. Very rightly said. Because this clashes, uh, uh, clashes with the empathy part. When the patient is in pain and we are only concerned with the test, we have done so I fully agree. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ayuk, Dr. Alok, uh, you have just missed one uh, point. In India, I have seen that surgical audits are not being done properly or at all in most institute. We usually shy away in discussing our uh, surgical cases in most institute. Uh, that is a very big learning platform, which I have noticed and seen and experienced, especially in UK where each case of every unit is discussed and that gives a lot of teaching to the postgraduates. That should yeah. be made compulsory. Yeah, you are extremely right, sir. I mentioned that in difficult and interesting case uh, discussions in the last, mm -hmm. and this is one of the very good ways to, uh, to know our shortcomings. Uh, Vivek, can I comment? Uh, yes, sir, please, welcome. Actually, I have seen this uh, undergraduate and postgraduate teaching in a uh, number of medical colleges in India, physically, and I have seen abroad also. To be honest, we differ from the West is that we are very good clinicians. There is no match in the world as an Indian clinician. And we, it stands true, look, feel, and move. It stands true, that applied teaching stands true even today. But the problem here in India, in India is a system. See, all stakeholders are M and like Medical Council of India, National Medical Commission now, universities, uh, Delhi universities at vice chancellor levels and at the college level. And that should be structured in such a case so that as a medical teacher, it is imparted in a structured way. That the fault is not on a medical teacher or on a medical college or a setup. It percolates from the top. So that is a big problem and which is not in our hands. We retire just teaching and get, becoming a charismatic teacher, as he said it. So that is my point. It should be taken care by all stakeholders. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Vivek, may yeah, I? Yes. Yeah, just one comment. Uh, discarding the comment about discarding certain tests. Uh, one thing I think I must point it out, we, we usually don't say a postgraduate to do a telescoping test in a fresh case. We rather say telescoping should not be done in a fresh case of fracture neck tumor and fracture to canter. Second, whether these tests should be taught or not to be taught, Everybody as a student or as a postgraduate or as a resident is not going to stay in Delhi in Lady Harding or in Maranazad. Maybe they are placing themselves in a peripheral center somewhere in the periphery. And at the first instance, CT may not be available. You have to wait for the x-rays. So it is very, very obligatory and it's very, very good to 
able to diagnose clinically also and it gives you some player also because if you are diagnose something clinically by the way of certain test so knowing test has a clinical relevance for diagnosis this is one second alok pointed out that there should be rotation and we need maybe government should help us i think we all should sit together all the people of all the institutes including private institutes we can all decide ourselves that pgs post graduates and even residents also they could be rotated in different hospitals in delhi we we don't have to be dependent on the university for that we can if university agrees to it it is fine if the university doesn't give us any any clue about anything or doesn't help us we can all sit together and we can always decide we can always send our residents to some other place and those those can send to some other places this can be organized by ourselves also if we keep depending on the government or keep depending on the some administration or other system probably we will never achieve it or it will take too long so it is a good time that we should do all those things but first we should settle our own house there must be inter inter departmental rotation there must be inter inter departmental rotation in, in important departments like plastic surgery neurosurgery if it is available and radiology and these departments and general surgery also because modern orthopedic surgery involves opening of chest also sometimes involves in when you go for extensive spinal surgery you need other parts of the body which general surgeons are more tuned to so we must rotate our pg ourselves and should decide to rotate in different institution also we can do it ourselves thank you can i just add a bit now uh, can you hear me yes sir yeah, yeah, we... yeah so i i think it was one of the most well you know structured and concise presentation by dr so difficult to find points but just to elaborate first thing is that as dr mehtani just said we were teaching post graduates uh, in the private sector from where we had great help from saint stephens molana azad and from safdar jang where our pgs went and did very well considering that we had limited uh, both training experience as well as limited pathology so what we always feel is that we should have regional pgs as we have heard in different languages pgs who are trained in the region and not in the center and we should call them our pgs and not my pg this philosophy of his my pg is also you know very restricting both for the teacher and for the pg himself because if you feel that they are our pgs you also get a lot of learning from people who have gone the the trainer is being trained now that is most crucial other thing which i must emphasize is documentation as well as management strategies we will have to go in whether they are virtual or they are on path or what we will need to learn these two things to the highest order because out there are waiting people there are people who are earning out of creating trouble so you have to be very careful your pg should also learn that along the line so one point which i liked about his was in brief that a longer pg training but a person comes out as a super specialist maybe starts initially on basic skills which is multidisciplinary as we heard surgery pathology radiology etc then comes the broad speciality i'm afraid today what we are noticing is immediately after ms after learning a lot of theory everybody wants to become a fellow they don't want to do senior residency believe me i feel very nervous about it because it is like an orthopedic surgeon doesn't know anything about general surgery cannot palpate an abdomen or worry about a urinary retention similarly an orthopedic surgeon suddenly wants to be say a spine surgeon or a pediatric surgeon or a or a joint replacement surgeon without having basic knowledge of how to laying down a proper plate or inserting a nail so i feel that then the final thing in continuity should be a super specialty in the end for two years so that when the person comes out he is now a super specialist with the knowledge of everything that an orthopedic surgeon should carry thank you sir we would like to take one or more two points before we wind up this talk because we are already 15 minutes overshoot can i say something dr anup yeah yeah dr anup yeah thank you uh, dr anup sud you have really pointed out very well about the lacuna there are two things which i want to say that we need to put in every conference a lecture about medical ethics and evidence based conservative management 
which our pgs have forgotten the other thing whatever we are discussing today for the pgs can we have association coming up something like a joint statement for the pgs that what are the things should be done unless until we jot down the point and do a recommendation either to government and the university all these exercises whatever we are doing goes in vain just limited to the webinar so to put it into the paper and as a recommendation from an orthopedic association is going to do really good work for our pgs i think uh, Dr. the Dr. Arya... orthopedic association should take up this and should include the communication skills the medical legal aspects and record keeping and statistics these four things for pg teaching in all their sessions that will be a great thing from dua okay uh, dr arya please for last comment dr I arya think... are you with us yeah yeah i am with you all already said about it i think uh, we the most important thing i think all senior people are sitting here we Uh, should note it down as far as the interdepartmental interhospital and intrahospital uh, posting as concerned i think these can ourselves can uh, start from the very next session that is most important second thing is about the surgical uh, audit i think we ourselves are afraid of surgical audit uh, i have seen i have started myself in our institute but then the criticism we are as a surgeon don't able to really uh, take it uh, take it more personally and uh, they don't they shy away from taking all this criticism seriously i mean including my own colleagues uh, and and sometimes it becomes too personal so there are a lot of limitations to what we are suggesting finally as dr maria said i say, I, I agree the basic training need to be done like i work in now a super specialty uh, center i see people uh, do away with all good uh, part of the sports injury management but they are not, not even aware of the basic pathology like tuberculosis and infection even a stiff shoulder to them is always uh surgical release and surgical arthroscopy and then they don't even think of differential diagnosis as tuberculosis i mean there are few things i think all this fellowship should always be on but they should come after seniority when basics uh, orthopedics is learned and been uh, trained to do practice and they don't uh, miss the differential diagnosis in general practice when they come to field thank you uh dr vivek i think we should move forward to the next speaker yes, yes i i hand, hand over to you uh, to invite the next uh, speaker yeah i uh, you know i'm very happy and very proud to invite professor lalit many a well known academician and he'll be speaking on fate of clinical research and outcome for thesis so professor many has a wide experience in post graduate training and uh, i request him to start the presentation Thanks, Dr. Manisha. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Is my slide visible? Yes, sir. Uh, you have to put it on the play mode. Now it's okay. Uh, now it's Please working. Start. Okay. Please start. Thanks a lot, and uh, thanks, uh, Professor Alok Sood, for uh, setting this very, very important area uh, ignited. And uh, I'm thankful to the organizers on putting this uh, in the agenda of the conference. Uh, specifically to me on this topic on uh, fate of research and outcomes of thesis so if you ask me to sort of conclude before i start i think the fate of uh, research and outcome of thesis is uh, almost uh, mandatory and compulsory and it happens nothing more than this pandemic area which has made this term research a meaningful word even to the layman and to the general society at large and uh, suddenly we have understood uh, why research is a pillar of how we can maintain the health of mankind so i would uh, take you through in the next 10 minutes uh, through the ground realities and uh, the larger goals which have been achieved and which uh, go on uh, to be achieved all the time so thesis now the various full forms uh, you will 
be able to dig out if you want to. One of them is true happiness and it since it started. So I'm looking at a postgraduate student who's just joined his training program and he might get this full from, from his immediate senior who is sweating it out to complete his thesis. And uh, it would be nice uh, that you could uh, visit this uh, website, phdcomics.com, which connects you to reality of uh, research uh, at the ground level when you, when you begin medical research. And uh, when I look back and uh, see uh, at my own thesis and my postgraduates doing the thesis, uh, this pie chart is uh, very, very depictive in the way that uh, we, we really stress out and burn so much of adrenaline uh, thinking about uh, writing our thesis and then fiddling with the uh, formatting and uh, coloring and various other things. And the actual thesis writing becomes a real small part of the whole game. So uh, in this, uh, this uh, complex area of uh, research and thesis outcome, uh, let's uh, look at the thesis, uh, what are the uh, stakeholders into it. The most important uh, base would be the area of the research uh, uh, which we are looking at. And I'm putting the supervisor as a second part because uh, the postgraduate is coming an absolute uh, raw person into their speciality. He has been exposed to orthopedics in uh, his MBBS, but then into uh, core research and as a thesis, maybe he comes in as the third player. So these are the three uh, main uh, players in uh, thesis, uh, which will finally get concluded. But then there would be three more, I feel, which are the college, the university and the time zone. Now let's go from down above. What is time zone? Meaning uh, the thesis which were done maybe 50 years before and what are done today have a different uh, outlook, a different approach and a different area of research. More so, uh, I think another time zone which is getting added is the COVID time, the pre-COVID and the post-COVID time. I'm sure with so much happening in the COVID time, our ways and practices of doing research are going to get a boost after this COVID era. Universities will have their own guidelines which will affect the thesis. The college will have their own guidelines which will affect the thesis. To read literature on uh, thesis, there is lots written about supervisors as a research entity because he is the person uh, who sort of uh, guides a student first time in his life into a structured research process. So uh, there are various uh, publications which talk about uh, how uh, a role of a supervisor uh, is there. What, what type of a thesis happens when it is the first thesis of a supervisor and what happens when it is the last thesis of a supervisor and what happens in between in the journey. What happens when a supervisor has one postgraduate to guide and what happens when a supervisor has three postgraduates to guide. So there are so many factors which actually uh, affect the outcome of a thesis, which actually is to be looked into. There is literature on uh, uh, what happens uh, to thesis and uh, what is the outcome. Uh, the most uh, measurable outcome would be a publication. There would be other non-measurable outcomes uh, like uh, getting a, a residency or a fellowship program or uh, a future progression of a person's uh, academic uh, life. Uh, if you look at uh, the measurable uh, publication measure across all specialities in medicine, the range of publication of a thesis varies from 5% to 25%. The rates of publications and conversions of thesis uh, into publications is more in medical uh, branches than in surgical branches for uh, reasons most of you could understand. 
and still is uh, there is a lot of uh, paucity of uh, literature uh, i've done some literature review and uh, to my surprise maximum number of publications on conversion of thesis into uh, publications is from turkey and they really have uh, done this in all specialties even beyond orthopedics we did our uh, small bit of uh, an informal uh, survey uh, in our own institute uh, since i was given this topic and what we could observe uh, is uh, the era of 1990 when i joined my post graduation till around 2010 we were able to contact around 104 uh, post graduates and we found out that there were 22 publications so we are reaching somewhere around 20% and then we again uh, sort of surveyed uh, the last 5 years where uh, uh, there were around 48 theses which uh, we covered and 13 got published a slight increase in the publication rate but uh, almost the same and uh, probably uh, this is a very important factor to look into uh, as a department of an institute that what is the publication rate of your department suddenly uh, and on one day when you took take over a department as a head of the department and you announce that all theses should get published it will never happen every department every institute and university has a history and uh, you can change the history but it uh, changes gradually so the world uh, literature says around 15 to 25% conversion rate and different universities would have their different rates which definitely would get changed uh, with efforts but when you ask a postgraduate student for him it is the endless cycle of uh, making edits showing the edits getting the corrections and getting more edits to do a classical uh, graph of a postgraduate student now i'm talking like a pg student uh, if you look at a week it starts with a bright monday uh, with bright eyes opened up that i'm going to achieve uh, the moon but it ends up by the weekend uh, with a head down on the pillow that i'm terribly tired however i'm flat on the graph on my achievement on the thesis work and why this happens is because a huge the trying to do so many things and uh, not even trying you have to do so many things as a human being uh, everything is important relationships family Uh, your thesis your health obviously uh, you ignore your free time and your eating and this new colorful thing which has added so much onto your volume of work and that is a social media response and the time you need to spend on that and then this uh, group of people the thesis committee uh, uh, an impossibly uh, difficult uh, group a group uh, none of them will actually read your entire thesis but they would have a very very specific and important roles uh, in your research project to take it further so to the first part of the talk which is on uh, outcomes of thesis i think it uh, definitely has a, has a mandatory outcome that it creates a culture of scientific inquiry and writing into a postgraduate who is just stepping into this specialized field so the second part uh, the research the word itself uh, sends some shivers that it seems to be a very very complicated and a serious area of you know survival and uh, it it uh, it brings with it so many difficult terms like opportunity idea and earnings and development and innovation experience curiosity and growth and if you really uh, sort of go deep into uh, research and research methodology you get into quantitatives and qualitatives so who what how when and why and the various types of uh, research designs but uh, let me tell you uh, all of us uh, uh, as medical doctors and uh, orthopedic surgeons are researchers and uh, we are doing research day in and day out it would be uh, uh, connected to one patient of ours and then uh, all the patients which we collectively treat 
is there an evolution of an intellectual uh, freedom or if you can say is there an evolution of uh, a researcher yes definitely before grad school i'm going to research whatever i want and then when you get into it i'm going to research whatever my professor wants and when i get a faculty job i'm going to research whatever my tenure committee wants and when i actually become a professor i'm going to research whatever my grant committee wants and the emeritus professor i am going to research whatever and rest in peace or say research in peace so what i'm trying to bring out is that uh, another factor which is uh, the environment or the phase of life you are into also dictates uh, about uh, the research and uh, don't forget uh, the entity which you are trying to research and today's time the corona virus the entity itself is so tricky that uh, it will always put you off and each research will only create more questions and uh, more answers to be looked into rather than a straight away a solution so in 2020 uh, research is about uh, learning and sharing it is about a question and to answer that question you need to uh, accumulate data and that data is uh, guided by its accuracy and honesty and the facts which uh, finally come out uh, lead you towards a theory so if you have to actually uh, solve this pandemic you need to uh, share uh, your uh, data it the simple question is how to come out of it and only if the data is accurate and honest uh, the facts will be right and your theories can be applied so one uh, example i have picked up from orthopedics uh, this is uh, one recent paper on implementation of research evidence in orthopedics a tale of three trials now these are very very uh, extensive and important trials on very basic problems of uh, distal radius fracture proximal humerus fracture and ankle injuries done in the united kingdom by uh, the health technology assessment uh, uh, funding as well as the nhs guidelines and uh, because it is very often asked that uh, does research mean anything at the end of the day does it actually change your health practices and uh, is it uh, really uh, uh, a sol a solving game or it's a confusing game and these three trials are you know real eye openers which uh, ultimately as you can see in the bottom line uh, favored a totally different type of a treatment than uh, the treatments which were evolving in the last one decade so i would uh, summarize by saying this uh, that uh, thesis is a process uh, uh, it goes through phases it is actually the introduction to a postgraduate student on the methodology of research publication is actually a by product and it is not the ultimate goal of doing a thesis in a postgrad education program it is to educate uh, the pg on how to do a research and um, uh, actually we are more than happy that um, we are able to churn around a good by product uh, from these thesis so to encourage an optimal uh, culture of research orthopedic organizations in leadership positions like the delhi orthopedic association need to explicitly support while inspiring and rewarding those researchers who can harvest new solutions i think it is up to us as has come up even in the first talk that we need to take it uh, on ourselves to uh, make this more meaningful and a research has been defined as a coin with a tribute on one side and a responsibility on the other and i'm really happy that uh, we've had this uh, important uh, topic in this conference and uh, I, i can ensure to you that uh, uh, as dr anup has suggested that uh, we will note down and deliberate on uh, what has come out and maybe try to implement it uh, at the society level so to end i would uh, uh, conclude by saying that fate of research and outcome of thesis is almost mandatory and happens happens is it creates a culture of scientific inquiry and writing and you may ask so what so 
actually what happens after this is it actually leads you back to the question which was raised that the culture of scientific inquiry and writing actually decides the fate of research and outcome of your thesis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Manny, for such a, a nice presentation. Uh, now, I, his uh, presentation is open for discussion. So I request any of the panelists have a question. A small comment only. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Okay, the comment is that in the West, we have a research as a separate degree and a clinical degree is a separate one. So if we at a structural level or a regulatory level, if we can separate both things like MSc or PhD degree separate and clinical degree separate, that will make a sense. I don't know how can we help it. Uh, you're right, Dr. Kalra. I think uh, the PhD provision is available in uh, University of Delhi. Somehow it has not been tapped because uh, probably neither the guides uh, nor the students know that uh, it is available. So if a senior resident who is joining a rotation of three years, he can very well uh, sort of do a PhD uh, attached to Delhi University. Uh, Manish, can I uh, ask a question? Yes, sir. Morning. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, Dr. Manny, you ex very beautifully explained the intricacies of writing a thesis. Uh, my one observation, uh, like I was sitting one of the papers uh, in, uh, last well, couple of days back, and uh, uh, I think uh, what I could gather, the, the, this, the role of uh, supervisor is very important, that how to conduct and how to conclude the, the results of a, of a paper, of a research. One of the researchers who presented like an example I'm giving, uh, a case of avascular necrosis, about 10 cases a person had done, did the coat decompression, did uh, bone grafting, then put in PRP also. And he concluded that after 10 cases in such situation, the PRP is uh, working beautifully well and is giving much better results than all others. As conclusion like that is become a bit atrocious. So here comes the role of a supervisor, how to conduct the research and how to conclude, make a conclusion about it. And of course, a competitive studies and other things should come into it. You're absolutely right. Uh, the supervisor has a very, very pivotal role in this. And uh, as Alok suggested, that uh, even the supervisors need to go through a training program because we are fortunate the research methodology has become very structured. So if we follow the, the guidelines of research methodology, we are always going to be on the right path. And I'm sure Dr. Rajgopalan would uh, comment on that. And uh, definitely, I think the supervisor is a central uh, keystone of the whole thing. Hello, may I? I'm an audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK. Dr. Lalit, very well presented. I fully agree with you. Thesis is basically is just to guide postgraduates how to do research. And byproduct may be there, may not be there. But if I also support the point of view of Dr. Sharad, that it is supervisor which has to be deeply involved into that. At each and every step, he has to guide the students. But one thing I just want to, I have I realized that in all the researches, most of the time, we always say result is good. I think we must learn to say when result is not good, we must to learn, we must learn to say that this method is not good and we must learn to put our point forward in the research also in the thesis also or in the paper also. Our most of the paper always say whatever I have done is the best, is the good. But it may not be always. So we should learn to say the truth every time. Whether it is good, it is bad. Something is not good. I think it is more important to say rather than something is good. Because we must tell people that this method is not good and it may not be attempted. Thank you. Very right, sir. Very right. I think negative research was never understood. Uh, and suddenly everybody understands because we started with ventilators in COVID. Then we went with antiviral drugs. Then we went with plasma. And now we have realized the role of negative research, meaning that the result is a negative one and it doesn't have a role. And people have understood uh, that uh, it needs to be published to, uh, so that people are told about the right path. Dr. Maria, please. Dr. Maria. You're not audible, sir. You're muted. Sorry. 
Uh, that was not so that I don't disturb you. Basically, <laughs> what what a fascinating talk, Doctor Manny. Now, some of my things are that one research I feel is the ultimate, uh, 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 you know, evolution of an academic. After learning, after observing everything, then the person goes to add or contribute to the subject in a positive or negative manner. And research, what we should be understanding, should be investigative research to try and find out. So it should actually be a search. Uh, research is that you know something and you're trying to see it again. But yes, it's a new search. Now, everybody is not a born researcher. It, it, people are what we are doing with our thesis perhaps is we are giving a topic more often than the student asking for something which is interesting him or what he's trying to go into exceptions are always there so what happens is god knows how much deep interest is there besides completing the decorum i feel that things like what we just spoke earlier audit you know, they, if we are to give them something to look in, then we have broad shoulders and say, okay, go and research the work that we are all doing without naming anybody. And please find out what can we improve or correct. That is the research rather than saying that a, a fracture of this kind should be treated this way. We will then have then this thing to say that since so many fractures of this kind were treated, so many things didn't go right. And finally, I feel there should be a specific reward for people who spend extra effort, extra time doing research. Well, now, reward cannot be just, uh, it has to be in a direct evolutionary pathway or a promotional pathway or something like that. Because the effort put in in research and the time put in is far more, far more constructive than the results of going and doing two surgeries in the evening. Uh, Dr. Arya, any comments? Otherwise, we go to the next speaker. I just wanted to say Dr. that Dr. Manny has uh, started a point uh, saying what part of the life uh, supervisor got involved into this thesis at the beginning, in the midway, or at the end. I mean, just like to highlight when the first thesis comes to a supervisor, he's very enthusiastic. He actually takes a lot of interest, and it is not the thesis of the student, it is his first actually. Then comes the midway when it becomes a routine part of his life. And he gives some interest, but not much time possibly. And at the end, he is done away. He doesn't take. I think that is one. Second thing, uh, uh, PG is doing research is which institute, which area, which geographical area, also fact. Uh, like people in a most busiest hospital where he doesn't have a time. Uh, he damn care about what the, uh, the PG learns from the previous year students and write. And in a most academic institute, he learns from not only the colleagues, from the professor, from the others teacher in the department. And the same thing in the uh, otherwise. I think uh, as an institute, we should allot thesis to only interested supervisors. Second, uh, PGs also should take adequate interest. And finally, ethics. Ethics are very important. As everybody is stressing again and again, the result should not be modified or should not be actually touched. Whatever comes should be explained in that perspective. That is all I need to comment. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hitesh Lal has raised his hand. Dr. Hitesh. Yeah. Yes. The problem with thesis today is the, the time period is too less. Why the thesis are not converted to publications is because the follow-up is less than one year. And each and every journal lasts for one or two years of follow-up. So I think the thesis time period should be increased. It would be to the first half of the third year, start from late first year. It should be increased so that the guy, uh, candidate has a, at least a one-year follow-up. That is why the, uh, the, uh, patient, uh, the student takes less of uh, patients and the follow-up is less. So they don't get converted into publications. Hitesh, can I comment? Yes. Yeah, in BNB programs, I think what you said is implemented. I think in our uh, MS program in our university, this is what the status, what you are trying to say. In BNB, I think uh, almost like one and a half years is given, or rather two years are given them to write. Uh, Manish, can I make a comment? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, thank you, Manish. 
uh, I completely agree with Dr. What Dr. Sharad said that the role of the supervisor is going to be very, very important. And the good thing is, in the last few years become as mandatory for the faculty. General knowledge has increased a lot, but still many supervisors do not really are in, yeah, unable to guide the student properly with the methodology. And that's what the most important thing. Most important thing in a PhD thesis for a postgraduate student is the methodology. And that they are not able to guide. I totally agree with what you said. And quite often, when you see some of the thesis, it is the conclusion is totally not relevant to their aim or is not proper methodology. I think, but this is improving. That is the one good thing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I request Dr. Vivek. Sorry. Dr. Manish, and just last comment. Uh, uh, what Dr. Hitesh said, uh, that the time period is too short. Is it possible to have an ongoing research in a department? And uh, if each PG who comes to a certain segment and under the say four or five years, they could be consolidated uh, I mean, results we have, which can be presented, including all the uh, researches over the period. Can that be an ongoing research in a department? Uh, can I answer that, Manish, if you don't mind? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I want to stress this. Sir, about, I think it's more 10, 20 years back, I had put up a, there was a MCA meeting where I was there. I suggested that the first and foremost thing is, like uh, Alok said, the three years is not enough. You have to have more period, at least six years minimum, when this can be done. This is, can be kept away from the exam. In the present system of three years, there's hardly any time to increase. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Vivek, please, uh, because we have uh, we are falling short of time, can you uh, invite the next speaker and introduce him? Yes. Uh, so uh, I may invite uh, Dr. Ashok Shyam. He is a well-known name to almost everybody now in orthopedics in India. Dr. Ashok Shyam, sir. Hi. Good morning, everybody. And to begin with, I'd like to thank DOA and DOACON for inviting me to speak on this topic, which is like my first love research. So today my topic will be on case report, my first publication. Since this is a PG section and Dr. Manny already spoke about thesis, I'll also recommend that writing and publishing a case report should also be included as a part of mandatory research for uh, PG students and uh, it will serve a lot of purpose as we go on with my talk and we'll see. So this is my uh, disclaimer or my conflict of interest also being the founding editor of JOS here since a decade now. So let's begin with the historical aspect of how the research developed and as we believe and it's, it's true even now that careful men note what is generally answered better and then begin the same to their patients. So this was in way back in uh, more than 200 years. And so, so it has served us for a long, long time, the same observation and same thing. So this is what case report is actually. These are observational studies, careful observations, clear recorded descriptions and deductive reasoning. I think this forms not only the basis of case reports, but any medical research. And it is also the basis of all our experience or experiential learning as we call it. I'm sure you all know the story, the tortoise and the hare. Okay, so this is what I call as an ideal case report. Very clear and precise, easily recalled when needed and strong practical message. So I think this is the best example of a case report, how it should be written, how it should be uh, appealing to the reader, appealing to the editor and the reviewer. It should be simple, strong message and easily recorded. So getting your first publication, getting started. So I recommend that most of the people who are starting their research or even starting their thesis career, start with a case report. We have a lot of things about uh, writing, about submitting, about review of literature gets cleared by when we are uh, doing and writing a case report. So first question that arises in mind is what qualifies as a case report? Are only rare cases accepted as a case report? 
I think um, uh, most of us now understand that this is not true. And I already wrote a editorial on this point. So the point to stress is that any case that has a clinically valid learning point is a case report. So that's, that's what my definition of a case report is. So you need to ask the question whether the publication of this case will enhance the knowledge of reader and help them provide better treatment to their patients. So providing better treatment to their patients is the basis of all medical research. We do research to do this, provide better treatment for our patients. And if the case report uh, publishing will, it will help in this point, then that is a publishable case report. And this is the first key learning point of this lecture. So you need to establish the clinical relevance of your case before you go ahead with anything. So I'm sure most of the PGs or most of us working in clinical settings have a lot of challenging cases. If any of your case answers this question as a yes, that should go ahead and we should go ahead and publish that. So what qualifies very rare diseases, associations of diseases, uncommon presentation of common diseases, cases which contradict current knowledge. So these are uh, like the general bag of uh, what qualifies that is given in most of the websites and most of the journal guidelines. So all these are there as the qualifiers, but for orthopedic surgery and specifically surgery, there are a few more qualifiers. Improvisations in decision-making, intraoperatively and in rehabilitation, even in a single patient provides a lot of insight and complications, specifically complications of any case, I think should be published because uh, there is no clear cut guideline to deal with complex complications and this needs to be published so that people know. So I have a dictum for that called DIC points, deviations, innovations and complications need to be published. So those are all qualifiers for a case report. So I've been asked this question very, very often. Hey editor, I got this great case is this publishable? So in a conference or when people just meet me, uh, they just ask this question because they know I'm the editor for JOCR. And it's a very difficult question to answer just offhand. Of course, I go through the case, I tell them, okay, this is good. What, but what will answer this question? If you have this question, me as an editor or anybody as an academician offhand cannot answer this. What will really answer this question is literature review. So you need to do a literature review to get an answer to this question. So key uh, point two is thorough literature review. And after the first two points, you need to, once you establish the clinical relevance and you did a literature review, you start writing. Now this is the structure of a case report, which is a standard structure, abstract, introduction, the case report, Clean discussion, conclusion, and clinical message and references. Of course, you can find this in any journal guidelines that are there. I'll just give out basic points on this uh, content writing. These are actually accum accumulated over years with my experience of uh, writing articles and getting a lot of rejections. And uh, so this is like a summary of those, what points to be included. So what is an abstract? Abstract is a brief summary of your case report. It is to attract attention. So most of the time people will read your title or your abstract only. So you need to attract attention through your abstract. Introduction is background information and why the case is being reported. I think this is introduction is one of the biggest misnomer in uh, clinical writing in manuscripts because it's People misunderstand it as introduction of the subject and write, go on writing about the subject. It's not that. It is actually justifying why your case or why your study needs to be published. So introduction justify it is whether it is worthy of reporting. Then this is the review of content and how you write the case report. You have to give all the details so, as, so that the reader can construct the entire case in his mind and knows everything about the case and he can even make his own decisions about uh, what he will do if, uh, if similar case presents to him in his clinical scenario. 
Anonymize the patient as much as possible. Avoid names and initials. Tables of, of other authors. Tables and results possibly compare and contrast with literature. I always ask uh, in GOCR to provide them, provide us with a table of uh, comparative literature, maybe last five years or last 10 years. Photos of clinical science, surgical pictures are very, very essential. So discussion has to be focused on the main learning point. So in the beginning, we established the clinical relevance. So dis discussion is the part where that clinical relevance is highlighted to the reader, to the reviewer, and to the editor. So that's the part of discussion. You have to compare with existing literature, synthesize your own experience with evidence. So case report is actually a very good balance between experience, personal experience, and evidence. So this is the part which actually at the cusp of both and balances both and conveys a very good message. Do not write a book chapter. This is one of the major things that I've seen about discussion. People go on writing it like a long question in a theory paper. References should be recent ones. Incomplete literature review is one of the most common cause of rejection, especially in case reports, but even otherwise also. Literature review is the foundation on which all your research is built on. Focus on your literature review, always. Key point three is to follow the journal guidelines. You have to be very, very thorough with how the journal wants you to format the article. And it's one of the common causes of rejection. So you have to go through it, read it properly. I suggest that you read four or five articles of the same journal, which are published in recent, recent issues and uh, formulate your paper. So after you have written your paper, what next? Get help, second opinion, third opinion. You need to send it to your colleagues, send it to your guide, your mentor, uh, your research group, whoever is in, uh, whomever you know is good in reading, writing, and publishing. You need to get their opinions and uh, get a, it's like an external review that you do before submitting. So last advice is read and revise as much as possible. You need to read all the published case reports on the, your topic. Read at least 10 case reports in different journals. Think about why they were reported and how the author got the message across. See, this is very important because case reports have one or two important messages and you have to give it across, okay? Ethics in publishing even apply to a case report. You have to have a consent, you have to consider privacy laws, and you have to have the confidentiality uh, in place. If possible, deliver a copy of published paper to the patient or relative. I mean, they feel happy and we, I've done this few times and it's really great. Common pitfalls, using sensational languages, writing is as a theory exam short note, unnecessarily trying to establish the rarity of the disease. This is a very common practice. So this part is reported only 10% out of this one part is reported only 2%. You don't need to establish the rarity too much. I mean, don't focus on it too much. Like I said, clinical relevance is the selling point for case reports. Not reading enough, not doing enough literature review is one of the very, very common pitfalls. In summary, the key points are establish the clinical relevance of your case report, do a thorough literature review, follow the journal guidelines and read and revise. So every case is a potential case report. Uh, like uh, uh, Raju Vaishasar was saying, surgical audits. I'll go ahead and say that each of those cases is a potential publication, either as a part of a case report or a part of a case series or a part of a randomized trial. So every case that you see in your clinic, in your hospital is a potential publication. Case report may be the beginning of a glorious and successful academic career. And I'll suggest all the postgraduates to start with a case report. It's simpler to write and, I mean, it introduces you to very good research concepts. So thank you very much. Tell your story uh, in our best way. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashok Sham, uh, with an excellent insight into uh, reporting a case report.
uh, since we are running already out of uh, time, we are two lectures behind. We yeah. may club uh, discussion part later on with other lectures. Sure. Thank you. So may I now invite Dr. Rajgopalan Ayer. Uh, he will elaborate upon how to choose a subspecialty. Welcome, sir. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, good morning, everybody. At the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Dhananjay and DOA for giving me this opportunity where I could hear, get so much information from the colleagues who have already spoken. Now, I have been asked to talk on how to choose an orthopedic speciality. At the outset, let me make it very clear that when we talk about a speciality, our aim is that we as orthopedic surgeon, whichever speciality we take, give the best evidence-based treatment for each and every patient of our own. So in that way, all specialities are equal. There's nothing which is better than the other. So whatever I'm saying in my further talk is only evidence-based uh, literature proved in the incidence of opting by the various uh, incidents of the whatever published places. So it doesn't mean that one is better than the other. I think all are equally good, equally interesting. So I am supposed to tell those who, the residents who are finished, who are doing the senior residency, or even a consultant, how to choose a speciality. Now, one thing is, this is difficult because the whole thing is evolving quite fast. When I finished post-graduation roughly 40 years back, there was no concept at least for me. Today, every postgraduate who finishes wants to do a speciality training. Unfortunately, it is not as easy as choosing which shirt you want to wear today. Today, now the fellowships have definitely increased, subspecialty is also increasing, but the postgraduates also increased. But what are the factors which influence, what has influenced somebody to take specialty is still not very, very clearly understood. Uh, it would have been much easier if I today want to choose, I, I can decide what I want to do, uh, have a committed experience in that and succeed. That would have been very easy for the person choosing. Unfortunately, it is not. And even if it, even if it is, even if today I finish my senior residency and I want to choose, I get everything I want. Even then, I may not know what to do. It is not easy when everything is available too. This is because each of us have that right to change our opinion. The first joint replacement, I want to be a joint replacement person. The first next scope I saw, no, no, that is better. Then I saw a spine, I think that is better. This is something which happens to all of us. So that factor is there. So it is not really easy to choose when you have, this is not a complete list. Uh, there might be something I left out. There are some things new. Spine can be a pediatric spine, uh, specialty, adult spine, adult hip, pediatric hip, so many. So this is not all inclusive, but just give an example. In this, to choose something is not going to be that easy. So I have taken some where we have some published data. This was an article just a year back in JBJS, where they had looked at the factors which influence the residents, fellows, and even some consultants. Let's see what we can gain from them. So this particular one, in um, they have the maximum choice, as you can see there, the initial the top of the list were sports medicine and arthroplasty. And the bottom of the list, leaving out those who are undecided, is a uh, Oncology. Surprisingly, shoulder and elbow was just above that, but uh, uh, oncology kept was in the last. What is very interesting, if you just go back by eight years, in 2011 JBJS, in a separate in a study in a, a totally different part of the, um, uh, compared to the previous one, it showed almost the same thing. The sports, sports and uh, sports medicine and orthoscopy probably, that was inclusive one. That again was in the top of the list by joint replacement. Again, oncology was in the bottom of the ladder. And the foot and ankle came down, shoulder went up. That was the report. So eight years, it has not changed much, which indicates that particular group of people, wherever they had done the study, the things were similar. Now, if you look at a person who was already 
say, I have finished mine. I have taken two fellowships. I have seen uh, joints. I have seen spine. Now, what do they feel? That will be very interesting because he has already seen more opportunities. Let's see what happens. This is the same publication. There, they, they said they chose that or they think that that is better, mainly because the surgical variety. Let me say if I take a uh, uh, spine, I have probably have so many surgeries to do, different type of pains, that may be the one. And second thing, very interestingly, because you have finished, was the job opportunities. And quite surprising for me, the salary came up right up to the bottom. I don't know whether it's realistic in our scenario, but that is the way it was. And things like location and mentorship and prestige. I, I suppose something like one-upmanship, we'll come to that later. So the volume and variety of cases and reputation of the program, it seems to be important to a group who has already done. There was also in some other studies, the personal interest. I mean, that is definitely, I would have thought of higher, but personal interest and diversifying my subspecialty area. These were also some reasons. Now, if you look at this particular article, where you have the volume and variety, this is also for the same, same, the same study, volume and variety, what came down into a single digit is the search opportunities. Now, we know that we don't have a separate specialty as research, but there are uh, universities. One of the best examples I can think of is the McMaster University in Hamilton, fantastic independent research uh, institute a specialty of its own. But every specialty has a research opportunity. That is what is meant here. That was not given, unfortunately, uh, importance in the data collected. Whereas surgical independ independence was an important factor, which is understandable. Every fellow who decides, who comes and asks me, who discusses with me, they only ask question is, if I go to this place, how much cutting I get? So that is one of the factors. And mentorship came it will lower down in this one. So if I had actually gone through quite a few articles, including Kovalas and there are others coming up later, uh, there were many factors. The one of them is market pressure, which I, I really uh, don't want to go into that, but the improvement of surgical experience, clinical experience, excellent outcome, all these things were important, including what I meant by outcome is they are talking about prognosis. Does that decide a person? Yes. One of the colleagues I spoke to said he was first interested in spine. He worked for spine. He found that so many patients don't improve. So he switched on to orthoplasty, prognosis better, every joint, such a good outcome. So these are some of the factors which also were reported. So if you put all these things, whenever somebody asks, I always ask them, what is, do you have a special interest in anything? And what practical problem? Is it possible? Because the number of areas to get is more difficult. Then I told about all these things. Colleagues advice, income seems to be very funny. In most of some of the articles, some of the people, they keep the income very important, but uh, some has given it as low down. In publications that become low down, in practice probably that becomes higher. And things like working hours, particularly in, we'll come to that later, some of the, when there's a gender difference, the working hours makes a difference. Professional upmanship, that's what I said, it is the way I felt. It practically, I suppose, everything is the same. So there's another article went from, uh, from a little different area. So there they found that the surgical experience and autonomy was much, much more given important than research resources and uh, income. So this was a particular, this was a publication entirely in about foot and ankle fellowship. That had a little totally different uh, result. The most of the fellow people whom they interviewed, they said they chose this particular specialty only because the relationship between the consultant and the fellow was the best. Um, and uh, I suppose that is very, very important. But this was a thing found only in foot and angle fellowship. That's also something that we have to learn that that is probably because of the good mentorship. This is from a Saudi Arabian one. I have included is because their working conditions and their things are totally different from the other studies which were from the Europe and the uh, USA and that area. 
American uh, continent. So in their studies, you can see the highest was pediatric orthopedics, totally different from others. And second was foot and ankle, third was joints. And sports and oncology were in the least, uh, sports was 7.3%, oncology was zero. The explanation given by the authors were that probably there were no oncology infrastructure there. And the other reasons were there according to the infrastructure. Whatever be that, it was totally different. So in, if you take most of the studies, if you combine, sports medicine seemed to be the most desired speciality. Oncology, the least. This is what the, uh, for some abstract, you conclude that, that appeared to be like that. So what was the reason for this? Probably those who preferred the sports medicine were more influenced by the outpatient surgery factor because these articles were all three were from JBJS, an American edition. So there, orthoscopy is mostly, so that may be one of the reason. And um, um, second was about the oncology program. The oncology program being the last is mainly because you need the infrastructure that comes in an institution. So those who are interested in academic practice were the only people taking it up. Pediatric orthopedics, the probably the conclusion was that the those who take, think of that, they are not worried about the outpatient surgery facility and uh, altruism and uh, similar feelings probably why they prefer pediatric orthopedics. Gender difference, I think we all know the number of orthoped, uh, uh, female gender in uh, orthopedic subspecialty is completely less compared to the male in all over the world. But in the study published from there, what was interesting was when you apply for a subspecialty, the matching rate for a, for a female orthopedic surgeon was almost 99%, which was much, much higher than the main applicants. But the total trainees, almost 85% were males. So this difference is probably because uh, maybe, I, I shouldn't, I'm not, this is what, again, they have um, commented in this particular article that that probably they were thinking of more free time, so that probably less duties, lesser working time. This may be the reason why some of the female orthopedic were choose to, had chosen hand or pediatric orthopedics or sports medicine. Other motivation was personal satisfaction and stimulation. So the last about this, some of the participants was mentorship. I think this is where we came with the supervisor, which we talked earlier, like in research and everything, Mentorship is probably a very, very important factor in some of the um, published data that was given a good percentage, but not in the top, somewhere in the middle. <coughs> and second interesting thing was, as a consultant now, if I think what, what I want is totally different from what the person residency, resident who has just finished his postgraduate, that is different. The resident thinks most important is where he can have, uh, they took the importance of the prognosis and surgical chances, things like that. Whereas the person has already experienced both. He was talking about where, you know, specialty where the lowest was the lack of competition. That's meaning that he was looking at getting a job and things like that. So if, when it comes to that, when it comes to look at a job and career, it's an income deciding factor. And this was this was an article published in 2012 JBJS, where they looked at how the medical students choose orthopedics as a career. So even, even though that is one of the high income group there, I, I think so, they said that income is not a deciding factor. So at the end of the talk, if I'm going to choose now, after um, almost 45 years since I entered orthopedics or more than that, um, I think first thing I can think of is what I want to do. What is my career setting? What I want to do? I want to be in institute, if I can decide about it, or I want is to enter into a, a private um, uh, uh, multi-speciality hospital, or I want to be individual practitioner. I think that should decide where you want to, how much independent you are going to be. And second thing after that is the people who are going to train me. What is how good I have a good mentorship program, have educational opportunity, how much variety of cases, and what surgical independence I get, how much I learn to do. So the top two factors to me seem to be that including the all other factors is when you choose a subspecialty, among the other factors mentioned, surgical variety and job opportunities, 
But when you choose a particular fellowship program or when you particular institute, you think of a volume of variety cases and overall academic reputation. But as my last slide, before I conclude, these are all some of the conclusions I have drawn from whatever literature I could get. And it is up to you when you choose to draw the, make it from this particular insufficient uh, information. <clears throat> you, you should have the art of having, drawing sufficient conclusion from whatever I given as said by Samuel Bristler, who is a famous English author. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajgopalan. Uh, because of shortage of time, I think, Dr. Vivek, you agree that we should go to the next speaker? Dr. Vivek? Yeah, we, because the other two lectures, will nature to previous two lectures, yes, yes yeah. am, I, am I audible? Uh, yes, sir, since yes. the other, other coming two lectures, they are similar in nature to previous two lectures, so we can take all uh, discussions later on. Sure. Okay. Take all the four now talks. Yeah, sure. now we invite Dr. Raju Vesh for his presentation. Good morning, friends. Um, my topic is slightly off the line uh, from the theme, but uh, it's quite relevant. As an editor of a few journals, we, I have noticed and most journals have experienced in the recent past during COVID time, that there has been a surge in research and publication, which is a good thing uh, that has happened. And that has really ignited the researchers to come forward with their research for publication, which was pending for uh, quite some time. But from the editor's point of view, it was a tough task to deal with enormous increase in the numbers of submissions that were happening in the, especially during the lockdown period in the COVID time. So uh, the <clears throat> surge is like a strong wave-like forward movement that rushes and uh, sweeps uh, everything. Uh, and that was happening in the field of research and publication. The causes could be divided into pre-pandemic and pandemic time. In pre-pandemic time, PubMed uh, had made a significant impact on researchers uh, to publish because it is considered to be the gold standard. If you have a publication in PubMed, your reputation and your recognition definitely increases. Then uh, advances in information technology help researchers to access uh, the research material and to do publication much more easily than what used to be in our times 30, 40 years ago. There has been therefore increased research, increased researchers, increased enormous number of uh, journals across the world in all specialties uh, and number of institution and research lab that have been increasing. But in the pandemic time, uh, there has been an urgency for the information about this disease and the virus. So there was a need for information on this crisis. And hence, everybody got into gear to find out uh, uh, in their specialty what has been happening. There was an urgency There is still uh, for the solution to, to their problems and about this disease. Therefore, most of the publishers have actually instructed their teams to fast track <coughs> all the manuscripts that come for COVID. And that has made a very uh, uh, early publication of any accepted COVID articles. And uh, whether your uh, journal is indexed in PubMed or Scopus or not, they would accept COVID articles on their platform. Uh, priority for publishing COVID articles was therefore uh, certainly there um, during COVID time. Um, but because of this surge of publication, a lot of uh, imbalanced uh, uh, publications uh, also got through uh, relatively easily uh, through the net, um, which were hardly read by the readers and uh, they may not contribute much in future in way of publication. 
Uh, we, uh, in the Journal of uh, Clinical Orthopedics and Trauma, we have seen a significant surge in the uh, submissions, as you can see, uh, we had the first lockdown announced on 25th March until 31st May. So you see the graph uh, in orange shows uh, submissions compared to 2019 in the same month. There have been almost two to three times submissions uh, during the peak of the pandemic, which is now the, the, the rate of submissions have been decreasing to sensible limits. So uh, we had uh, almost more than four submissions per day compared to uh, around two uh, previously. And we had published quite a few number of uh, articles. Uh, COVID had a positive impact, highly positive impact on the research and publication. And the main reason was the lockdown, the, I feel because uh, people were forced to stay indoor in their houses, uh, they had this opportunity of looking back on their own work of finding new research areas and uh, do the research and uh, publish it rather easily than uh, going to the hospital and doing their clinical work uh, uh, instead. So uh, they had spare time to finish the pending jobs. Then there was a peer impact because a lot of publications were happening. So people were uh, uh, sort of uh, indirectly forced to do the research because their colleagues have, have been publishing. And every one of us has a deep desire to publish. And this was the, the COVID has given us the opportunity to do so. Plus there was initially an increased acceptance of by the journal, especially of the COVID related article and faster also. And there was a rapid editorial and publication process. This has slowed down uh, in recently. I will come to that later. Uh, our journal of clinical orthopedics and trauma also published uh, and uh, received a lot of articles related to uh, uh, COVID and orthopedics. And now we have almost 140 articles that have been submitted. We accepted about one third of these and published. The, uh, and all these articles are now available in our website, COVID resource. Um, the significant thing about COVID related article is the high number of citations that they have received in a very short time because of uh, a lot of urgency to publish and a lot of information to publish uh, because of this uh, crisis. So we have received a lot of citations on these articles. Um, we have also published uh, our own uh, experience of analyzing the data of various journals to, to PubMed and found that uh, the medical literature has responded almost as quickly as the spread of this virus, they activate matches. Uh, and uh, um, the orthopedic related articles were mostly published uh, in the American journals of bone and joint surgery and JAJS. But uh, uh, we also published uh, plenty of articles in, in our journals. And uh, the JCOT has uh, in the top five journals that are published on COVID and related orthopedic problems. So friends, there have been an infodemic of publications in the recent past. Uh, infodemic may be a relatively new term for most of us. It means an excessive amount of information concerning a problem like COVID, such that the solution is made more difficult. That's an INE, because a lot of things are being repeated or uh, being presented as personal experiences, uh, et cetera which may not be uh, the, uh, true uh, or applicable everywhere. So this pandemic has given us the opportunity to publish on this crisis exorbitantly. And most journals have seen an expo exponential rise in new submissions during the peak of COVID, which I have also shown you in a chart, in a graph. Uh, but it would be, and we predicted that, it would, however, be interesting to see if there would be any reciprocal future dip in submissions because all these stocks 
of uh, your data research has finished uh, and that will lead to a uh, decrease in submissions in future that has been happening now. So uh, what I noticed um, that uh, we have been receiving, uh, uh, what, are, what were the type of publication uh, uh, submissions that were receiving during COVID-19? There were, of course, newly conducted research or reviews, especially on COVID. Uh, the research, uh, the researchers which have done research in the recent past were, but could not submit because of lack of time waiting for submissions. But the last two groups were also there. The older research which was pending uh, somewhere in their database uh, waiting for submissions. And uh, because everybody was publishing, so I must also publish uh, was also there. So a lot of people digged out their old theses or research work, 10, 12 years old also, uh, trying to publish it after so many years and hence all the data and information was outdated. So how did I, we uh, as an editor uh, have to deal with uh, such increased submissions? The most important thing is screening of submissions. Uh, um, before sending it for reviews or to associate editors, whether it's uh, out of scope of the journal, are these uh, data and information outdated, or the authors have been uh, sending repeated, repetitive messages uh, through their manuscript, which has already been published many times before, or there is no quality or relevance uh, of their uh, information research in the present scenario. So a lot of desk rejections need to be done to control this uh, surge in publication. And the editorial process has to be quick because the data related to especially COVID becomes outdated within a week or, or, or so. And hence, if you really want to help your journal or the author, the, the decision positive or negative should be taken pretty quickly. So early review process and decision making is very, very important. The role of editor in chief is very important because he is sitting in a hot seat uh, where he is getting so many uh, submissions. Uh, so his role should be higher than normal and he should be proactive in uh, taking decisions and delegating the uh, submissions for review and editorial process. So you increase your reviewers database, recognize and empathize with the reviewers and editorial board members because you're putting them under stress by giving more work. Uh, and also the general office uh, and managers uh, during COVID time have reduced because of the disease and other uh, reasons but the work has increased. So you need more support from the journal office and managers uh, during this time, which we got to a publisher Elsevier. And we are very happy that we could publish 11 issues instead of six issues uh, in, 29, uh, in 2020. So the implication of this search is that there is a flood of information that is coming which we may or may not be able to cope effectively. And most of the, the, the uh, submissions may be missing important evidence. So we need to be very strict that we filter out good research from the bad research and do not allow the, um, the bad research to get published because of uh, COVID time. And so stretching of uh, coping mechanism uh, must be there. Uh, we uh, have to reduce the uh, burden of overload of submissions by identifying high quality publications. As we know from uh, the higher level of uh, uh, hierarchy uh, evidence article must be published than uh, single case reports uh, and other things which may not be that relevant. So data from randomized controlled trial systematic reviews and meta-analysis take the precedence over the uh, lower hierarchy evidence uh, uh, submissions. Uh, now, uh, what 
uh, has changed since uh, the lockdown, that there has been a decreasing in submissions rates. Non-COVID submissions have started to increase uh, than the COVID articles now. And there has been increased rejection rate of COVID articles because primarily uh, most of the COVID articles that are coming now have repetitive message which have been already published uh, by many authors in several journals before. So there is nothing new to uh, add on. So there, there is better hierarchy and quality research papers now st really started to come. And now we are reaching to a normalcy or, or you can say a sanity of submissions with a reasonable uh, control. So to conclude, we know uh, uh, the, the saying publish or perish, which is true. But uh, as has been mentioned before, publication is the end product of any research and that must be achieved by all authors. Uh, and hence the publication is very important. Uh, there is always a deep desire amongst uh, all of us for a publication, which is a good thing. And that should be harped on even after COVID has uh, gone. Um, we must find time to do that. Several, uh, there are of course several hindrances and obstacles that are present in this journey. But once you uh, start writing and publishing, and if you publish a couple of articles, then you know the art and it then becomes easy. COVID-19 pandemic has contributed significantly developing interest in the research and publication. It was also uh, mentioned by Professor Lalit Mani the editor of IJO. Uh, editors, reviewers, and the general managers have brought an extra work or burden on their shoulder in the recent past, but uh, they have no choice. Um, and uh, now things are coming back to normal. They have, we have already crossed the, the more stressful time, and now we are coming to the real world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Raju Vaish. Uh, Dr. Vivek, uh, please invite the next speaker. Okay, may I now, now invite uh, Dr. Anup Agarwal. He will be delving upon fellowship and training opportunities in this COVID times. Thereafter, we may take few um, discussions part. Dr. Anup Agarwal, sir, Thank please. You. Thank you, Dr. Vivek. My screen is not sharing. What problem you are facing? It's not sharing. No, oh, you had opened your presentation in the background. I have. Okay. Sir, uh, you are using Mac or Windows? I'm using Mac. Okay. Uh, then uh, what you are getting on the screen, sir? There are there is some sort of desktop one, desktop two, sort sort of thing. Sharing desktop one. Okay. Okay. That's good. Uh, so desktop one pe sir, niche aapka jahan pe PPT saved hai sir, wahi chale jaiye. Sida wo desktop one ke baad to aapka main desktop khul gaya hoga. I yeah. can't see that it's shared. My PPT is already open. Actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nahin, PPT. PPT is already open. Sir, close the PPT, put it on the desktop, and then share the desktop one. Okay. I have closed. Now I'm sharing desktop one. Mm -hmm. Can you see my screen no. now? No, sir. No, sir. No. Sir, can you unshare it? Just, just do it. It's not shared. So how would I unshare actually? Share computers. I know. No, no, side actually. 
timing what we can do uh, till dr anup agarwal is setting his screen we can take one question manish sir by by time you continue your discussion yeah, yeah I... we can take it yeah can i comment sir yes sir sure sir actually the case report part presentation was excellent by dr shyam just i want to may, uh, make aware of the house in new regulations by the M nmc regarding medical colleges they have come out with the regulation that every post graduate student and a senior resident should have one national publication or international national presentation and a national poster present presentation these three are mandatory in all inspections now for all post graduates and to appear in final exams i think i don't know whether colleges are implementing or not but these new regulations are there with every college now dr mukesh uh, nowadays it is very difficult to say national or international journal because all journals are now international agreed right? but the problem is these so are if the... someone is if someone is publishing in ijo it doesn't mean that it is a national journal it is an international yeah. journal but these are the uh, these are the wordings of the regulations i think this needs to be changed actually anyway it is not in my hand no no i know uh, they have do, do, dr lalit me dr lalit me put it in white paper this is wrong nmc they have done it another one is this regarding choosing a sub specialty just i want to make a comment i tell you very honestly i was a flute player uh, and i got 20 rupees in a radio audition yeah anup sir now it's coming sir okay anup sir dr mukesh you can put complete your comment so i was telling you that it is 20 rupees i was getting in audition so that was not the point why why should i choose that uh, where i don't get a bread and butter Mm -hmm. right so the point was i chose the my parents forced me to become a doctor which i never wanted to be then the choosing a specialty sub specialty was the same problem so in india we have very little options the first comes is a bread and butter that's all thank you thank you uh, now i request uh, dr anup agarwal to carry on with his presentation dr anup thank you uh, thank you uh, dr dhananjay dr hitesh dr manish dhawan for inviting me to do a con uh, my talk for today is fellowship and training opportunities what is happening sir just click on the slide yeah 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 okay so i have taken a leap out of dr alok's talk that what are we actually missing in postgraduate teaching it has a direct impact on the fellowship training why it is required communication data keeping research clinical skill and surgical skills these are the point which we actually missing during our postgraduate training so do these points can be covered up during fellowship programs so i looked into is there any study which talk about the fellowship program how it is happening so this is one of the study which was done in department of medicine in canada where they talk about fellowship training a qualitative study of a scope and purpose across one department of medicine and they concluded that fellowship serves as a variety of purpose which benefit both individual trainee as well as the academic enterprise and fellowship can be categorized within distinct categories it could be individualized it could be clinical it could be research so they also concluded with uh, reviewing the different fellowship program and talking to fellows that what are their purpose actually so their purpose was to increase the clinical competence increasing their confidence to gain a specialized skill and very important acquisition of marketing skill this has become the key story for many of the young surgeons and pursuing an academic career was the last so perhaps our fellowship programs which we all are running does not cater to the need which is required for all the fellows and for the research 
And that is what we see when we see, look at the fellowships, the richest fellowships are the least one which are opted out by most of the fellows. So we all know word is one and we have about 1000 fellowship and training opportunities all around the world. And out of that half of in India. Now these are approximate uh, things. There are nothing with collective data which is actually available. And if you look, there are about 200 state chapter fellowships in India and there are about 250 private institutes which are offering fellowship and training opportunities. And amongst us, the Indian Orthopedic Association is one of the leader and that provide both international fellowships and national fellowships. And what we have done as the uh, fellowship committee is that in 2017, we had only 28 fellowships. Then in 2018, we increased to 34. In 19, we increased to 51, but COVID had as its own impact we were planning to make it 17, 2020, but since many of the fellowships could not be completed in 2019, so we did not think about it increasing it this year because we have extended it and this year we are not offering any new fellowship. This is what has happened during the pandemic. So this is the offering from Indian Orthopedic Association and these are the fellowships which are international fellowships, IUA Orthoplasty, IUA Singapore, IUS UK Junior, IUA Hong Kong, IUA Malaysia, IUA Turkey, IUA Korea. All these seven fellowships are for less than 45 years of the age. So these are for the younger fellows and these two are for the senior fellows. So we do have fellowships for more than 45 years. They are UK Senior and IUA Ireland. So these are the internal, uh, international fellowships which are available through IUA. And then we have IUA inland fellowship, that's the national. The N number on the left side, these are the fellowships by Dr. S.S. Babulkar, Dr. G.S. Kulkarni, IUA Traveling, IUA JMRF Pediatrics. These are the one of the most wanted fellowships. But if you look on the right side, the Panacea Biotech Research Fellowship, Research Grant for Implant Instrument, Dr. Ashok Sen, Gupta Visiting, and Orthopedic Research Foundation. These four fellowships, we hardly get any applications during our fellowship program. So what we lack is that most of our fellows do not want to go into the research. So we hardly get one or two applications. So maybe we don't have any applications for these research fellowships. Then, so that is a point of concern for all of us. Then other fellowships which are offered by IOAR, UA mentorship and senior fellowships. There are about 10 senior fellowships and 30 UA mentor fellowships. Senior means more than 45 and UA is less than 45. I need to tell you a word about IOUA mentorship program. It's a wonderful program which was started by IOUA two years back only. And this is only for the younger people. It's a simple program. Suppose any person, any PG, any resident wants to look for an orthoplasty and he wants to get a train under Dr. Raju Vashya or Dr. SKS Maria. So he need to contact Dr. Raju Vashya, fix up his program three to four weeks, and then he need to inform the IUA office, and we can then coordinate with the mentor and the fellow, and this program can be conducted. And every year, these 330 fellowships, and we had this year 54 applications for this. So this is one of the most hit fellowship. Again, all these fellowships are for the surgical and clinical skills. None of them are for the research. Then there are other fellowships which are offered by different Indian associations. These are Indian Orthoplasty Association. They offer five international and three national fellowships. These are again wonderful fellowships. The international fellowships which are uh, offered by Indian Orthoplasty Association are Indo-UK, Indo-Irish, Indo-Australian, Indo-Korean, Indo-US, all these fellowships again are very sought after. All these are for less than 45 years of age. And most of these are finalized during the November and application start during the month of the April. 
Then Indian Orthoplasty Association again give few the national fellowships. These are seven, two Dr. KT Dholakya, two IA at Chennai, and three, one at Delhi with Dr. SKS Marya, one at Chandigarh at Max Hospital, then another at uh, Jaipur. So these are the fellowships which are offered by Indian Orthoplasty Association. Then another subspeciality society, Indian Orthoscopy Society, it provides 10 fellowships every year, three as CSSM International Traveling Fellowship, four as a National Fellow of Dr. Gopal Krishnan, and three IAS CSM National Fellowship. All these fellowships require for the person to have a minimum two years of experience of orthoscopy before they can apply. And all these fellowships are for younger people less than 45 years of age. Then we have few international common and very sought after fellowships. The CQUAD provide 50 fellowships every year. You can see the whole chart, Alexandria, APOA, then APOA, EOA, Hiranandani Orthopedic Education, APSS, SUT University, Casablanca University, Ganga Hospital, our Indian Hospital, HKU CQOT Fellowships. Then there is Lagos National Orthopedic Khola Fellowship, Marker College, Wuzburg, then PKU Shenzhen Hospital, CQOT Mid CQOT Fellowship, TCH CQOT. So these are 50 international fellowships which are offered. And by the end of October, these fellowship closes. Again, this year it has already closed. Then another association, International Association, Asia Pacific Orthopedic uh, Association, it provides another 50 fellowships every year. Uh, they have nine sections and every section have four to five fellowships, trauma section, hip section, knee section, foot and ankle society, pediatric society, spine society, sports, infection, and research. And let me again tell you, the research society fellowships are the least opted fellowships, which are again opted by the fellows. Then AO Foundation, we all know the Synthes AO Foundation, it provides through AO Trauma, they, they have about 140 centers all across the world. And out of that, about 80 are into Asia Pacific, and then there are about 100 centers, training centers for AOS spine. Apart from these two clinical fellowships, which accounts for almost 250 training fellows, there are two research fellows. These, again, AO Foundation fellow, research fellows, fellowships are very sought after fellowships. And there are N number of applications. They have a strict criteria for looking for this. And we had Dr. Vivek Trikha, who was the research officer for India, who were uh, looking after these fellowships also. So what has actually changed during COVID? None of fellows could go to the hospital for almost two months of lockdown. Everything was closed. There was no clinical work, limited number of people. So it has changed the way we were learning. Our learning process was only through the web. So almost all the clinical fellowships of attaining the surgical skills had a stop. The world has a stop. But should we stop? Is there anything which has changed for us? No. Post-COVID, we have again come to the same. So I would conclude with the saying of Swami Vivekanand, arise awake and stop not until the goal is reached. So for all fellows, what has not stopped? We have started again, People, hospital have started, all the fellowships have been started. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anup Agrawal. You may now stop sharing your screens. Uh, now, last four sessions, they are uh, open for discussions. We may limit uh, discussion time. Uh, uh, because we are already uh, trailing by two lectures. Uh, Dr. Vivek, can I, can I please start? Yeah, be brief and... Um, yes. Start. Thank you. Yes. So uh, my first uh, uh, discussion would be towards the uh, fellowship part. Uh, Dr. Noob, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, I want to talk about the criteria that most of the fellowships have. 
now the criteria is a number of the main criteria is number of research papers and uh, i would uh, um, i would differ in this you know i always differed in it now research when we talk of now most of the medical colleges well established institutions in cities in class a cities well they have a very research oriented kind of atmosphere uh, where there are pgs and there are interns and there, there is a pro proper protocols now you will agree with me most of the panelists here will agree with me uh, there are so many class b class c cities where there are medical colleges and there the atmosphere of research might not be so the even your uh, your hod or your uh, your guide may not thesis is a compulsion uh, like everybody said so we can't hear you dr samir so probably he is talking about the criteria for selection and some moderation into it yeah yeah so you yeah yeah please uh, uh dr samir uh, probably even you can't hear oh what has happened your audio we can hear you and how come i have started sharing no oh, yeah, okay so so okay so probably you are right that there are n number of uh, orthopedic surgeons dr samir are you back we can't hear you please unmute yourself okay you may continue I yes sir i am i'm there now dr roop i am very much there okay so your point is well taken actually uh, the criteria which we had for fellowships there is an application form where we do talk about that how many publications you have done in national international journals what was your thesis and everything and that is what has actually changed my perception because i come from a private practice where uh, i could see that lot of younger surgeons who directly go to smaller cities not involved into the research they could not enter into the fellowship programs and that is where comes into this iua ua mentorship program we have opportunities where research is not the only criteria we are putting in you want to work under somebody you want to learn arthroscopy you want to learn arthroplasty you want to learn spine you choose your mentor we are there to cooperate we are there to coordinate with your mentor and will be able to give you and let me tell you that is the purpose that we are steadily increasing these ioa ua mentorship program it is the i would say the flagship program of iua where i am really working where i want that every person who is willing to get trained under anybody inside india should get an opportunity without a fail and that is where we are working actually and that's the reason that i had already proposed that we should increase it from 30 to 50 this year we do have a lot of money and we need to really invest this money for training of these young fellows so i do agree with you dr samir mehta and that is why we have this iua ua mentorship program where research is not the sole criteria for taking them for the fellowship it is their interest into that sub specialty it is their interest to get trained which we are considering Uh, thank you very much that very really rightly answers so one small uh, one point and for dr raj gopalan ayer if is there uh, well uh, on the on the basis of what you put up the highly sought after is uh, fellowships uh, for the last 8 years or so is sports medicine and arthroscopy and uh, sir i am also an arthroscopy and sports medicine surgeon uh, just want to make a comment on this that why a young person gets attracted towards sports medicine uh, one reason is that they relate with the patients when i was young and i was myself a sportsman uh, i was a swimmer and i am still a racket player so i could relate with his problems and i could i got very interested in his problems of hamstring strains and of ligament tears and all that so this was an extension or the the sub specialty chosen by me uh, was an extension of what i was already doing so this is one big reason that young attracts young uh, uh, you know that uh, this this field unlike spine where the patients are you know lady in morbid conditions so this is can be one reason and i was doubly lucky that i was given a thesis of by my boss uh, by my hod of on arthroscopy so this was divinity that helped me getting this so this is one reason of getting thank you uh, dr samir 
Uh, people are very attracted to arthroplasty also. So th there's no reason why you're saying your spine only old people will come, huh? <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> what, I, I, what, what, uh, my perception is people go in for arthroscopy because it's easier to set up and practice. I mean, it doesn't involve too much of infrastructure and uh, it doesn't small, uh, it doesn't have to be institutional practice. Like you know, in the spine, you need an ICU backup. Uh, you need a bigger infrastructure, more risk. Arthroscopy is relatively, you know, uh, it doesn't require that much of a setup. And probably, you know, it doesn't require too much of, um, uh, too much of, uh, I guess, uh, risk also. And uh, ICU backup and those sort of things, patients are relatively fit. I think that is the reason. Uh, not because you're saying... Yeah, but I, mean, I would slightly differ, no? The glamour of orthoplasty is... Uh, really surging into orthoplasty fellowship is higher than any other special subspeciality. I just share some short comment. Uh, like having more publication is a disadvantage for a government job, honestly. As a part of uh, many expert in many interview boards of the top, uh, I'm telling you this, I have seen people having 50 publication in last three years. And that became a disadvantage for that candidate. So this is very common. So we have to see how much time he has put in publication and how much time a clinic he knows. This is, these are the part of intrus of assistant professor, I'm telling you. So having more publication sometimes is a disadvantage. Well, I'm, not, I'm not really sure about that, sir, because most of the criteria for selection, you know, they have... They no, that's not really true. The only other thing I would say is that in countries like UK and all where they have a set set program for training, after I mean automatically after finishing their CCST or their PG level training, they opt for a fellowship. It's somehow somehow inbuilt in their system. So maybe that's I mean right. if we can have and second point I would like to uh, state is that we started quite a few fellowships. So that doesn't require any publications or research. It's purely based on uh, on a MCQ system and plus interview. So yes, Dr. Faruqi, rightly said. Um, many many younger uh, people they are uh, very much looking forward to all these fellowships and all. If anybody else wants to comment, I would like to invite. Otherwise, may we, we may hand over the session to Dr. Tomar and Dr. Yeah. Samardit Singh. Yes. For the uh, Vivek, one comment. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Thank. I really thank Dr. Anup on bringing forward uh, the details, and we will archive this and maybe relook at them. You can also add ISCSA fellowships, which are uh, robust over the last uh, ten years, and we have uh, helped around five hundred people on arthroscopy and arthroplasty. So that we do around fifty fellowships every year from U.S. till New Zealand, covering almost all, all the globe. Can I ask you. a question from Dr. Anup? Yeah, uh, Anup, uh, so many centers offering fellowships, different uh, uh, mentors uh, offering fellowship. Is there any regulatory body who can assess whether this uh, infrastructure is adequate, the mentorship is adequate, proper teaching, proper uh, guidance has been, been given? Because so many people are even private centers uh, are coming up with that. And uh, at times, maybe the purpose is other than giving the fellow, just collect more people around, more hands there to, uh, to uh, help for them. I mean, so is there any regulatory body? Yeah, Dr. Sharad, there is no such regulatory body as of now in India which can coordinate and uh, do the thing. So same thought, with the same thought, we started looking at the centers all around in India and we try to do an accreditation process. We did a thought about it that can IUA Fellowship Committee do that, that we have different centers, private institutions who wants to take the fellow. They have fellow through the IUA accredited fellowship program. But the problem we suffered to get an accreditation was it's a long process if you want to accredit any center. You need to have the data from there, then you probably need an inspection, then probably you need a committee who can look after that and then categorize center into A, B, C type of fellowship. So it's a long process. We already have started a thought process into that, that as an IUA fellowship committee, can this project be taken up to accredit the different fellowship centers all across the India who are willing to participate in IUA fellowship program? But otherwise, there are no such coordination or accreditation body in India 
who are doing so and you are rightly pointed that most of the private these private institutes are luring the fellows for the sake of hand rather than giving them actually training so it's probably mutual benefit trainees think that i'm getting trained and the uh, mentor thinks that i'm getting a hand also so yes it is there so dr the, anup and isksa what we are doing is we are getting a form filled after the fellowship so it is like a testimonial uh, which uh, says that i i did not assist any case it says i saw five cases so and those testimonials are uploaded on the website so anybody who is applying can uh, look at the testimonial and since it is coming from the fellow uh, the next person who applies knows what he is getting uh, dr lal we are doing the same thing that we have a fixed pro forma where mentor has to sign that he had attended such clinical settings the ot's and all that but we are not uploading on this uh, platform of iua so probably you know as soon as we update our iua website uh, i'll take this point of yours and yeah. we'll try to upload that those things testimonials also Do, uh, dr lalit i think a simple solution would be to have a log book isn't it that, like they have in in the nhs they have a log book and you write down how many cases you have done supervised how many you have done independent independent how many you have observed and on based on that we can have a criteria so that at least the students who are going they are not used as working hands And, and the problem the, is log books are filled here by hand. In abroad, like NHS, in other countries, they are computerized. No, no. Whatever you assist, whatever you assist, whatever you do, it is entered into the computer. Data is hospital based. Here, the data is cooked. The problem is this. Whatever, <laughs> ha, that is a problem. Here in NHS, what you do is you put your uh, ID number. The whole year it comes. What you have done, sir? But he signed to carry, no? Super. Ah, no. But the problem, no. Sign is you. You. How do you sign? How do you sign? You know it. Ab koi to integrity or sanctity rakhi hai. Now, let us be honest. Let us. I am honest. I am telling you, this is very difficult in scenario, Indian scenario, because we are not true having the two moral values. And and we don't have surgical audit and a central record keeping system. Yeah. So yeah. we can't actually you know uh, say that if any surgeon is saying that this month we have done hundred surgery and we can really put a thing that yes he has done or he has not done. And that's where no, I said no. We want to start a process of accreditation of the private centers for fellowship program. And I am doing a bit of work on this that how it could be done. So it may take some time, but I definitely looking forward to you all to give send me your suggestions that how it can be done really. I guess I a big ne has to be made somewhere. Otherwise, ये तो कभी आगे चलेगा ही नहीं. I mean, because young surgeons and they won't have an opportunity to because they'll be used at as you know just working hands. They even if they have done two year fellowship, they are just second or third assistant. So it doesn't make sense. I think we need to start this somewhere. Okay. Uh, uh with this uh with this session there are many things which which came out hope it uh, practically uh, uh, to our next uh, session on covid pandemic and impact on orthopedics to dr tomar and dr samarjit singh yeah ba good morning all everyone and i welcome you all I, am i audible yes, yes sir yes sir yes, yes, so this was an excellent session on academics and publications but the next uh, session is going to be even more uh, interesting and this in, uh, this is of interest to all orthopedic surgeons that is covid pandemic and its impact on orthopedic practice this is very unprecedented times that no one has ever faced earlier and we are facing so many challenges there are no specific guidelines we have to work we have to work for the safety of our safety of our finances and safety of our patients as well so we have a highly learned faculty to uh, enlighten us on the various aspects of orthopedic practice and we have a uh, three luminaries of orthopedics as our panelists two from delhi dr anmol maria welcome you dr rajiv jain welcome you and dr john mukhopadhyay from patna we welcome you sir 
and the first talk is by professor vivek trikha from a all india institute of medical sciences uh, that is impact of covid protocol on golden hours in emergency management we welcome you dr vivek trikha for your talk please and we okay. have two moderators me dr al tomar and dr samarjit uh, dr samarjit singh we will moderate the session sir we have dr ajay shukla as panelist also okay okay so am i audible and visible my screen says visible yes sir Fine. okay so without any further ado let me thank the delhi orthopedic executive and dr dhananjay especially for giving me this opportunity to be speaking on this topic which is impact of covid pandemic on the golden hour in the emergency management so just before we start that i'll just like to give you one overview that right now 10 days back on 20th november india's covid tally was more than 90 lakhs and the death rate and the death toll right present is more than 135000 patients who have died in this covid times just to give you a perspective what we deal with in trauma every year we nearly have 1.5 lakh deaths every year because of road traffic injuries in india and because of covid we already have around similar sort of deaths till now so we are dealing with some basic problems out here and the basic fact of covid is that it is going to be here to stay come what may the vaccines may come but for the next one year we are dealing with covid pandemic especially in our country it has led to unprecedented challenges for our routine clinical care but most importantly it's the trauma care and the front line warriors i would say not the covid warriors the front line warriors who are dealing with the brunt of may managing this challenge if you remember that tiananmen square scenario around 30 years back one person taking care of the entire tank brigade which was coming to him so it's just a similar scenario for the emergency department people because they do not know what lies in store for them and every patient might be a covid person another perspective majority of patients nearly 15% are the healthcare workers so there have been over the last 8 to 9 months you would have seen a lot of blueprints regarding how to have a dedicated covid center how do we shift the covid positive patients here covid negative patients there we make a different different wards for everyone but this cannot be copied to a trauma emergency because the basic premise of all these centers and the blueprints is that you are having a covid test and you can segregate between covid negative and covid positive which is not possible in a trauma emergency where the first hour or the first initial few hours are going to decide the life or death of a patient so the questions we need to answer for this is how do we maintain the quality of trauma management without spreading the virus in this times how to follow the international guidelines the principles while reducing the risk for healthcare professionals and how to protect our infrastructure from getting overwhelmed the first thing first we have to have some protocols which need to be implemented and proper monitoring of these and their compliance needs to be done whenever we are dealing with these protocols so the approach to a trauma patient the basic principles which we follow is we know that we have to reduce the morbidity and mortality minimize the disease transmission among the people who are there in the trauma area which may be the healthcare professionals or the other trauma patients who may not be covid positive but they also can be infected by having lot of patients together and also prevent the healthcare professionals and the healthcare system functioning because you might have your trauma team getting infected and once it in gets infected where is the next line of force that you are going to bring which will be trained in an emergency department care for dealing with this scenario looking in the world literature there are very few literatures evidence which says that what and how the things have changed in the trauma scenario this is from han christof pape from switzerland in a european level 1 trauma center where they found in a brief span of around 2 months post covid that the patients of trauma had decreased in the emergency area the iss or the injury severity score of these patients was relatively less as compared to the pre covid times because maybe the 
things are slightly slowing down as our pace of work is going to happen. But the most important thing which you can notice out here was that the time duration spent in the emergency area had increased. And also from admission or his the arrival into the hospital to a whole body CT scan, this means you have stabilized the patient till that time, that has also increased, which can be a possibility because we have to take extra care and we slightly go slow during this time because you have to take care of the other patients as well as the healthcare professionals while dealing with these patients. And which may not be best for the patient himself who is having those life-threatening injuries. If you look at our own scenario at Ames Trauma Center and the trauma center which has been shifted to the main center now in the emergency department, in the last five months from April to August, we had nearly 8,000 patients who were managed and the red critically ill and the severely ill patients had around about 4,000 patients had to be managed. So it's not that the trauma scenario in India has decreased considerably, I would say. It is nearly the same or it is around 75 to 80% for what was there in the pre-COVID era. So what is the emergency management and the key points which we need to take care of? The first thing first is you have to consider all trauma victims are COVID positives until you prove them otherwise. You cannot ensure and see even if he's my relative or your relative that he is COVID negative. You have to first test him and ensure that he's negative. You cannot do that in a trauma scenario. So what you do, you continue your initial assessment and management as per the ATLS protocol or whichever protocol you are following to ensure that the life of the patient is taken care of, making sure that he does not suffer from any threatening injuries. You have to be very pragmatic and practically oriented to decide which treatment you are going to do. And you may have to stop on slightly unnecessary or which can be delayed. The methods or procedures which can be delayed should be delayed and not taken otherwise straight away in managing these patients. And all life-threatening, I'll repeat, all life-threatening injuries will need assessment and stabilization before testing for COVID-19 infection. So you need to, on one hand, consider all as positive, not test them, and at the same time, ensure that all the life-threatening injuries have been taken care right in the same way as it was done previously. So that brings us to the question, which is the COVID test which we are going to do until what time we are going to wait for that? So we know that RT-PCR roughly takes six hours to 24 hours in the best of hands. The CBNATs and the true NATs take around four to six hours in the best of hands. Again, I would say the rapid antigen test, which takes around 20 minutes is not so sensitive. So even if it comes negative, you have to consider the possibility that the patient can be positive. And there is a new light in the horizon, which is the Feluda kit, which has just been launched around 10 days back, which is takes around 30 to 40 minutes for the test to be done. It is an indigenized method of testing, CRISPR method, which is used. It is very cheap, around 400 rupees is the cost. Its sensitivity and specificity is around 98%, equivalent to or better than the RT-PCR and can give results within 30 to 40 minutes. So this may be the game changer now for the trauma emergencies in all over the country where it is being marketed by Tata as Tata MD Check, which is Feluda kit developed by ICM, CSIR will be giving us the immediate or at least 30 minutes test of the COVID and most of the orthopedic fractures, which can be, are not so life-threatening. We can have this test, get the report within one hour of their injuries, and manage them accordingly for most and 99% of the trauma orthopedic injuries which they suffer from. So right now, we take care with the gene expert in our hospital, the true NATS, which cause it gives a test within three to four hours for orthopedic patients. And subsequently, I think the Feluda kit is going to be the beneficial because we can get the test early enough for the orthopedic surgeries and the interventions to be managed in these trauma victims. Primary survey and resuscitation, the golden hour period, 
the principles of life they never change they remain the same you need have to take care of airway breathing and then you take care of the limb threatening procedures however what has changed in covid era is the safety measures for the healthcare providers you now need to be more cautious of the safety for the healthcare equivalent to the trauma victim and for that as i said you need the protocols and specific regulations again i would say don't forget that there are nearly 100000 health staff patients in covid era in india who have been infected and the first top two states for them are delhi and maharashtra this was in september so 3 months before we around 90000 health staff was infected so patient and healthcare personal safety is the number one priority in the trauma care because here you do not know whether the patient is covid positive or negative this is one add or one message which had come and which i always keep take care of yourself before you take care of others this is for the healthcare professionals because there is no need of heroics all you will get is a garland either way you end up either the saving of the life of the patient is there or your life is at danger so how do you reduce the risks number of personnel should be reduced ppe has to be imperative and mandatory for such patient people who are managing these patients reduce the aerosol generation and have a proper decontamination and disinfection process right there in the trauma area how do you reduce the direct contact so here in our hospital and in most of the hospitals what they have done is the ed team has been divided into hands on and hands off team the hands on team is the one which is directly dealing with the patients taking care of their intubation their primary assessments and all the emergency interventions which have to be done for their airway breathing and circulation especially for the red area patients and the hands off team are the relatively second line which do not come directly for a long time with the patient they are mostly for consults and the technical supports and the logistics so you can divide them and so that you have a team which is getting experienced and a second line of defense also whenever there is a problem with the first line most important which brings us is the personal protection equipment you need to have the level 1 level 2 and level 3 the level 1 are the routine things which we are using right now the gowns the masks and the gloves the level 2 and the level 3 are the ones which you require in a trauma emergency red area patients and the healthcare professionals because those who are dealing with the secretions with the airway management and the intubations need to have a coverall n95 a face shield gloves and covering all their body because you do not know which patient is covid positive or negative and during the heat of the moment when you are saving a patient's life you might be putting an endangering your own life without realizing the fact when you are doing an intubation or a suction or you are taking managing a bleeding in the axillary artery or in the proximal humerus area you may not remember when the patient is coughing and you may get down with this covid area so the golden hour most of the aerosol generating procedures like we give oxygen to all the patients of trauma many of them require ventilation or tracheal intubation or suctioning all these are aerosol generating procedures which have to be done mandatorily in the trauma area there is no alternative for them you have to deal with that so what can we do we can just protect ourselves while dealing with them we cannot keep them aside so let's face it with full protection on there is a high risk of infections which we need to avoid and you can see an intubation or a bag mask ventilation being done for a small child and all the people are wearing a proper level 2 or level 3 ppe kit with a face screen all the gloves and the n95 mask and every precaution has to be there right beforehand while dealing with these patients when you do an intubation you need to have a complete pp as they are using and this is one of the patients in the trauma area even the nursing professionals who are dealing with these patients and dealing with their nursing care also need to ensure that personal protection is at the paramount area then comes the minor ot procedures in emergency which may be some chest tube insertions suturing debridement putting in a lot of saline washing the open wounds 
and the abscess drainage. All these again, I would say, come in the PP2 level two and level three equipment where you need to cover entire body of yourself, have a face screen, wear the masks and ensure that personal protection is kept to the maximum. Orthopedic management, this is our own setup where people are wearing gowns. And if you want, if you do not want to, we have been lucky enough that in our hospital, our orthopedics department has been providing us and has provided us with respirators, with our full respirators, which have been given to the residents as well as the consultants who are dealing with these patients and which gives us more than 97, 99% full protection for the prevention of aerosol, which comes into our my, into our breathing system. We have been managing a lot of orthopedic patients in our emergency department since the lockdown is over and the patients in the level one center, like you can have the gowns, masks, or mm -hmm. the PAPR, which can be used. Diagnostics is also important. Ensure that there is a proper imaging of red area, which is in portable way. Patients are not shifted, rather the diagnostic comes to the patient. Non-emergent imaging should be delayed. The routine CT scans, which we do for the orthopedic injuries can be delayed till the COVID result comes and a dedicated CT room should be there in the proximity for the emergency management. This is how the ultrasounds and the DSAs or the angiographies which require can be done and are being done in our setup. We have done nearly 4,000 CT scans over the last five months. And all these precautions are paramount. It has to be inbuilt in your system as a protocol based because you cannot do and change into a PPE when the patient is going to come to you. You need to be prepared for that. Even in life-saving emergency surgeries, you need a specific dedicated operation room if possible, or if not, at least ensure that you have a OR which has been said to be a COVID area or a COVID OR where all the precautions will be taken care by all the personnel working there. There has to be a special passage, a urine directional flow, and all should be wearing level three protection, which should be used. Surgery, which we are doing, in acute emergency, life-saving should only be for damage control and life-saving methods. And all focused efforts should be made to shorten the operation time or the overtime time for the patient as well as for the healthcare professionals. So this is what we follow. If it is a life-threatening, we straight away take him to an OR where the pelvic stabilization, vascular or laparotomies are done to a OR which has been designated as COVID OT where without the reports, because you cannot have reports and the patient's life is paramount. Everybody is wearing a PPE. And later on, during the time of intubation or so, you can take a swab and send it. But the report is going to come later. You save the life of the patient first. Most of the other fractures of orthopedics, they can wait for four to six hours. So by that time, you will get your CDNAT, TrueNAT reports. And then you can manage them if they are positive in a separate center or if they are negative you can get and manage them in your own center in the proper protocolized manner. We have been doing nearly 200 surgeries every month over the last seven, eight months. And there has been no let up from our department and we have been getting good care and expert guidance from our seniors in our aims for this. Finally, biomedical waste management is one thing which we miss out especially in emergency department where all the PPEs, face masks, the suctions, the tubes and the gloves which have been used on patients who were not tested for COVID positive or negative should be properly disposed of because we remember that the person who is taking out that infection material from your hospital is also a vital part and a key part for your hospital management. So let's not think not of him. We should be taking care. Make sure all the infected things needs to be incinerated in a yellow bin and other plastics to be sent for autoclave in the red bin. If possible, if possible, you should have a specific and separate laundry where the patients have not been identified as COVID positive or negative. And wherever you can have these controls, use the 0.5 hypochloride and then wash them with 70 degrees centigrade. I would say that in this present COVID times, we were till now taking care purely and purely of the patient's survival. But now we have to make a very fine balance between the patient safety and our own protection as healthcare professionals. Because if we do not 
take care of our own self right now which may look selfish to some people in idealistic circumstances but remember until unless you are alive you cannot cannot fight the war the next day so you have to ensure your own safety at this moment the take home is the trauma care cannot be compromised come what may even if it's a covid pandemic or not the atls guidelines need to be followed in the golden hour all trauma patients are covid positive until they are proven otherwise life saving measures take precedence over everything else and you need to be prepared as a service care provider that you take proper precautions while saving the life of the others ensuring that you have standard protocols which are written down and followed properly with the proper brief and reversing and taking care of them that is what is going to ensure that you have a smooth recovery for all the trauma patients and also ensuring good safety for your healthcare professionals thank you very much for your hearing thank you dr vivek for wonderful insight into the thing now i invite dr sudhir kapoor i think questions will take it at the end of it will be better that will save us some time is it fine with everybody uh, uh, dr kapoor is teacher of teachers and now he is going to give us insight into going back from lot of surgeries are we still is there a scope for cars so let's see some uh, worldly experience worldly wise experience is my my ppt visible yes is it visible yes sir visible sir okay dear <clears throat> well uh, good morning to all of you uh, i must appreciate the combined wisdom of the scientific committee who have given very very apt uh, article or titles to every every faculty i think uh, our vivek has done a wonderful job i like to do a uh, similar thing with my presentation regarding application of cast and conservative management well the plan of my talk would be i'll uh, tell you some historical facts which are relevant to us to this talk like uh, pop sarmento and even ao also and how orthopedics has changed in covid i think dr vivek has dealt uh, with uh, nicely i may need not elaborate upon that then fractures which are amenable to conservative management like fractured tibial diaphysis fracture shaft tumors what are the factors or peculiarities or contraindications to conservative management Uh, i cannot cover all the fractures which can be managed conservatively or which can be in the cast but i feel fractures like uh, let us say uh, tibia or a supraglottic fracture i like to tell few final points and finally i'll summarize my talk well uh, while researching for this uh, talk i was going through the io manual there was lot of uh, uh, in the historical aspects they did talk about hippocrates and other other cultures but they never mentioned about indian ancient culture and i was surprised when i was searching that i found this thing in susur samita uh anchana peedna sankalpana and bandhana well these are similar to uh, traction manipulation and plaster application this is from susur samita i think we need to be uh, we need to be knowing this fact that our ancient people did know about uh, a uh, conservative management of fractures and they were treating the patients properly also with all the things which are which are following now uh talking of plaster of paris i think that it was uh, introduced for the first time in 1952 by dutch military surgeon and it was discovered uh, accidentally during a fire in a gypsum uh, uh, setup where they found that the footprints made by the shoes set rock hard after it rained on the baked mud telling them about the importance of uh, using a uh, semi hydrated calcium sulfate impregnated bandages for the plaster application i think that must have changed the uh, way of immobilization of fractures and the things must have must have become very very handy in that regard well the conservative management of fractures which i have been dealing with will not be complete unless i mention uh, uh, about sir john charley and uh, and about the thomas print Though Dr. John John Lee is known for his uh, invention of uh, THR, but I think his uh, his manuscript on close treatment of fractures is a wonderful thing. Any person who is interested in managing the fractures conservatively must go through this. The understanding the different forces acting against the uh, across the fracture site and how to immobilize, how to reduce is given wonderfully well. I think every every orthopedic surgeon must read this. 
uh, Thomas Flint, though uh, devised by uh, uh, Sir Thomas, it was popularized by Robert Jones, and it did uh, change the treatment of fracture shaft to the femur uh, in World War One and later also. Uh, we have been until this date we are following it for uh, primary care of fracture shaft femur. Uh, <clears throat> it will not be out of the place if I mention about the fracture shaft femur being managed by different fracture shaft femur and uh, uh, fracture in the intercular area also being mentioned, being managed by different types of traction. Uh, I have seen all this traction in my lifetime, in my career, and I am sold to Hamilton Russell traction. I have yet to, yet to come across any more mechanically balanced traction than Hamilton Russell traction. This is one traction which can aptly reduce anterior fracture and will unite with almost 100% certainty. In a patient who is PSE fit, there is no harm in trying this traction even today also. This is the most mechanically balanced traction and very comfortable for the patient also. Well, why I'm talking of uh, AO, the um, progenitors of internal fixation in this, in this uh, uh, talk, a uh, reason will become obvious in a minute. AO, which founded in 1958, uh, they, um, uh, they had three cardinal principles of fracture management, that is restoration of anatomy, internal fixation, and um, the early mobilization of the limb and the patient. But mind you, over a period of years, they have been, they have been intelligent enough to shift from rigid fixation. When AO was introduced, we all know that seeing a callus on a post x was taboo. It was thought to be a sin. The fixation was supposed to be inadequate if one could see callus on the x -ray. Gradually, they have understood and they have changed to stable fixation. It is not, it is not a bad thing to see a callus and interlocking near if you see a callus, you are happy. And recently, they have understood the importance. They have, uh, they have uh, stressed upon the importance of soft tissue coverage and the, uh, keeping the blood supply intact and shift from shift to biological fixation by sliding plates and so on. So we have seen a shift towards conservatism, even in AO also, from rigid to stable to biological. This talk will be incomplete unless I mention about Sarmiento. The storm created by AO, by, by everybody fixing the fractures, was halted to some extent by Sarmiento when he introduced the principle of functional bracing. In his principle, he demonstrated and proved adequately that in a closed system of brace, the dislocating forces of the muscles across the fracture, they become compressive forces. And the controlled micro motion allowed, during, allowed while wearing a brace promotes callus formation and maintains good position. I think this was a wonderful uh, monoscript, uh, um, in, um, monogram, which you must read even today also. And we must thank him for introducing the concept of PTB, patellar tendon bearing cast. We used to be a cast and a splint, which we use now also. It is a wonderful thing. And all of us understand the importance of regaining knee movements in a fracture of the tibia, which is possible with this cast. Uh, I mean, uh, the audience must be made aware of this thing also. It is not uh, orthopedics, but still, uh, we, must, we must understand that since 1981, there is a village or a small town by the name of Putur in Andhra Pradesh, where for the past more than 150 years, they have been managing fractures by conservative management, even without the help of the x-rays. And they are using different, uh, uh, different things like uh, bamboo sticks, herbal paste, egg white, and they're quite popular in South. And I have seen few cases treated by them and they are reasonably good results. Anyhow, that's besides the point. Uh, let us understand that in this uh, COVID time, it has been again proven that cast is not able. It, 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 it can be of help to an orthopedic surgeon wherever judiciously used. I will not elaborate much upon this. Dr. Vivek has dealt wonderfully it has, uh, it has affected the COVID pandemic has affected our practice to a very, very large extent. extent. Hospital resources have been uh, diverted to management of uh, uh, COVID patients and the arthropic surgeries have decreased. That is the cold arthropic surgeries have decreased to a large extent. Even the patients who are got a life-threatening uh, uh, life threatening conditions, even they only they are able to get some, some orthopedic help in the emergency. Uh, the patients who are 
not so emergent emergency um, not suffering from so much emergency um, fractures uh, they are being delayed and during that period of delay we must understand that we can get over that period we can use that period by traditional techniques of skeletal traction it is not a bad idea to teach our residents once again how to put a put a proper uh, upper table pin in my last uh, in my last institute where i was working i in my two and a half years stay there i never saw a table pin being put now we are putting it and it can be used judiciously till the time patient's covid test has been done and patient is fit to be operated well there are certain contraindications to uh, conservative management i think the audience uh, would be aware of that just to revise it any open fracture or a complicated fracture with a neurovascular injury is a contraindication displaced fracture neck femur that of course is a contraindication to conservative management adult femur shared fractures again a contraindication femur fractures in children at least before 10 years of age can be adequately managed with conservative management and of course displaced articular fracture like a tibial plateau fracture would require ultimately a uh, surgery a uh, fact there are few factors which we must understand if we, if any orthopedic surgeon wants to succeed with conservative management he must keep in mind few factors i'll show you examples also the hematoma must be kept intact the periosteal sleeve which will be intact which is not seen on the x ray must be made a judicious use of i'll show you in a management of supranal fracture how to make use of this then we must use functionally effective adequate support which should be covering one joint proximal one joint distal wherever possible principles of sarmiento must be used then till the time you understand the the different forces which are acting across the fracture site you cannot manage because conservative management requires a sustained effort it is not like a surgery where the maximum uh, where maximum care stress is done on the day of surgery then you can relax a bit but in uh, if you are managing a fracture in plaster you have to be very careful in every weeks uh, review and see that everything is going well there is no plaster sore the fracture has not moved plaster is not hurting anywhere and these are the, the small things you should require for a uh, fracture management if you are uh, giving a cast uh, the fractures which are amenable to conservative management in general most of the upper limb fractures they can be treated by cast except i feel uh, let us say uh, displaced intercondylar fracture or a similar fracture most of the fracture in the upper limb and quite a large amount of fractures particularly fracture tibial shaft that i can uh, prove can be uh, treated with a plaster cast uh, these are all the other fractures which can be treated with a plaster cast i will not name them all now it is not possible to show each and every example i will just show you three or four examples of different uh, uh, with different uh, fractures which can be managed with uh plaster or the uh, cast or by the conservative management the first is the supracondylar fracture humerus uh, i think you one must read again i am stressing one must read the manuscript written by uh, uh, written, written by <clears throat> i have already mentioned about uh, charles cole method in 1950 uh, we must understand there are three three distinct displacements in uh, fracture supracondylar fracture humerus posterior lateral and rotatory rotatory displacement usually corrects itself during the method of reduction if you are following the proper method reduction of the other two things that is the posterior displacement and the lateral displacement that would require uh, your care and that requires two particular steps i'll just uh, spend a minute over them giving a simple traction either in extension or whatever maximum maximum extension possible uh, maximum uh, less extension less flexion possible will mostly correct the side to side displacement if required you can manipulate depending upon the uh, whether the displacement is posterior or medial but many times in a fresh case giving a simple traction sustained traction under proper anesthesia these fractures must be handled under, under proper anesthesia which be which would be mostly ga in a child and a sustained traction for about 30 40 seconds would adequately reduce the fracture in in majority of the cases some amount of lateral displacement may be corrected then comes the then comes a crucial step of correcting the posterior displacement uh, while giving the traction that direction traction to the forearm which is initially vertical but gradually changes goes on changes the direction 
it is in initially in the line with the um, upper uh, 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 humerus then it becomes towards the towards the roof when with the help of one thumb the posterior displacement is corrected maintaining the traction as you do so the triceps and the intact periosteum locks the flexion position and it is said that uh, to check it simply see whether the acromion and the tip of the olecranon they are in one line or not either in one line the fracture is adequately reduced and a sim it, i mean uh, according to the original original uh, description can be measured in cuff and collar uh, we in our country mostly give a slap uh, this is what i mean by uh, making a judicious use of the periosteal sleeve the periosteal sleeve is ruptured anteriorly posteriorly it is intact though loose and once you do the proper reduction it locks the fracture in position a very good reduction which was achieved by the method which i have shown you earlier now tibial shaft fracture a uh, lot of you can examine the patient but lot of information can come if you examine the uh, patient under anesthesia which could be gs spinal or even the block also simple cast fixation will be sufficient for a fracture which has got a moderate displacement where the periosteum is intact and the entrosseous membrane is not grossly ruptured uh, now i'll show you an example which would be a which would be a very illustrative example for all of us uh, and before that we must understand there are few finer points for tibial uh, tibial uh, plaster few points are from the books and few points are from the personal experience plaster must be applied in parts patient could be either supine or sitting if the patient is supine then keep a support under the upper end of the tibia while the traction and counter traction is being maintained if the patient is sitting many people advocate uh, doing their tibial reduction with the patient sitting because the gravity helps in that situation the support should be behind the lower thigh this is a very very crucial step the tibial uh, fracture tends to be convex posteriorly assistant must keep his palm of his hand continuously under the fracture as shown in the illustration a palm of the hand not the fingers must be maintained behind the fracture till the time the plaster is set sustained traction and counter traction initially for about a minute is crucial ultimately we are aiming at 5 to 10 degree of uh, knee flexion and neutral or 5 degree of equinus at the ankle the anterior surface of patella and the second toe must be in line otherwise your fracture is in uh, the fracture there is some rotation mal rotation at the fracture site cast must be a bummy cast going beyond mid thigh extra padding padding set tendo achilles support at ta with the hand of a palm not a not a finger and this is a very very crucial practical point many people forget whenever you are applying a fracture a plaster in the lower limb always hold the let the assistant hold the hold the foot or toes with two hands not with one hand if the assistant is holding the foot with one hand there will be invariably varus <clears throat> the assistant with one hand holds the lateral toes and with one hand holds the great toe only then the varus can be avoided this is a very very practical point not given in any book this this uh, fracture came recently to my department 45 years old male a segmental fracture of the tibia and on close scrutiny there is a fracture of the upper upper tibia also besides the segmental fracture upper tibia fracture line going like this and a tibial spine fracture also the fracture was discussed in the uh, department meeting uh, interlocking should be done and we should be keep, we should be ready to fix the tibial spine also and maybe we have to put the Uh, once we do a tibial uh, nail, the fragment may lift up, and then we need to put a screw. All these things were discussed. Well, I decided to give a plaster myself, and this is the result. This is a plaster applied about two weeks ago. You see the center of the ankle, uh, center of the knee, and the center of the and the ankle. Sir, please, we are running short of time. Please. Okay, dear. I'll try to do a short. Are in perfect line. now talking about the proximal humerus fracture i think this uh, study is known to everybody i am not going to detail this is the largest study in uk a multi center study done in 250 patients which which with their concluded 
that these results do not support the trend of increased surgery for patients with displaced fractures of the proximal humerus. They have proved beyond doubt that the fractures of the proximal and the humerus can be managed. Most of them can be managed conservatively. In the last, about the fracture shard femur, this is one fracture, a fracture shard of the femur is destined to unite unless an orthopedic surgeon decides to intervene. I put this photograph to show you the amount of muscle coverage the humerus is enjoying. It will unite in whatever position you hold it. Traditionally, we have been holding it in the hanging cast in which the weight of the cast and the gravity help in reduction. Recently, a cast in extension has been in, in fashion, which, uh, uh, which takes the use of taut biceps and triceps to maintain the reduction and hold it in position. This is one patient managed by one of my colleagues with the extension cast, which is shaft the humerus, changed to a small sprint and the good union occurring. I'll summarize that in conservative treatment provides a way out in difficult situations like this pandemic. Traditional methods can guide us to manage the orthopedic injuries till the peak of pandemic is over. It is an opportunity to rethink and revisit conservative methods. Let's draw new guidelines and exercise control over the hours to operate every fracture. And finally, cast is not an evil. It can prove to be an angel when executed judiciously. Thank you so much. If there are any questions, please ask right now. I may have to leave it earlier. Thank you very much for, uh, for an excellent presentation, Professor Sudhir Kapoor, sir. And uh, cast is not an evil. And in fact, it has uh, helped us to sail through in this very difficult times. So the question and answers will be taken after the session because okay. we are running very uh, short of time. There is only there half an hour left. There is some memory. Are there memory. any questions or from the panelist to yes, Professor? I just, okay, so I just like to make one comment on the supracondylar fractures in children. So if you're going to take the patient into OT and give them a GA and reduce the fracture, putting in a couple of KYs doesn't take any extra time. So I think it makes a big difference to re-displacement of that fracture. So I think if you are going through the extent of actually taking the patient into OR, giving him anesthesia and then reducing it, the maximum aerosols is when you're intubating the patient. So to me, because then you can safely extend the forearm without worrying about displacement, the elbow without worrying about displacement. Otherwise, I think all the other, uh, a lot of these fractures can be managed conservatively. And certainly in COVID times, there's an indication for managing them. Thank you so much, Dr. Mukhopadhyay. And thank you, sir, Dr. Sudhir Kapoor, sir. And now I will invite Dr. Gurinder Bedi for the next presentation, <laughs> that is pre-operative checklist to ensure patient safety. Dr. Gurinder, okay. please start. OK, um, so good morning, everyone. I think uh, winter used to be a good chance to meet up with your colleagues and do a con. It was a lovely time. If you've ever been to the Habitat Center, you could stand in the sun, enjoy the coffee. I can't remember any lecture there, though, but uh, there was a lot of physical interaction, which I think I'm missing now. But uh, nonetheless, I'm sure we'll make the best of it next time that we meet. But I'm miss missing those cultural evenings as well. So this is where we are now. We 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 really confused about the way forward. What should we do? What should we not do? Then these kind of articles keep keep coming out in the literature again and again, which talk about the high chance of post-op complications, number of ICU admissions. This is a comparison of COVID and non-COVID patients. Then again, this kind of a paper, which actually started it off from China, which talked about if you were not doing any testing on people and you actually ended up operating on them, these were routine elective surgeries, uh, about 50% of them ended up in ICU, huge percentage of mortality, one-fifth died. And what they showed was there are issues why a lot of these people will have a problem if you're not careful. So it's a potentially lethal condition and that's the problem. I know most people will get better, but it is at the end of the day, still a potentially lethal condition and it's highly contagious. So one person in the house gets it, everybody gets it. One casualty patient walks in, invariably, if you're not taking precautions, at least five to six carers will get it and the morbidity can be significant. So we're learning more about the morbidities as we go. So we need to know this. We know that there's a hell of a lot of healthcare workers getting involved. That's what we make this, this told us and possibly there is a there is something called a high viral load that might be one of the reasons why we seem to keep getting involved. And there's different changing changing levels of education about if you're in a conditioned room, positive pressure, negative pressure, why the droplets 
keep on getting spread or how the how you keep on getting this thing so hell of a lot of things is what is going to happen to you in the hospital so it's not at all a easy time is it there are different times the challenging times which are there so different times also because if you're a private practitioner and if you well even if you're an orthopedic surgeon in the government setup there's very little work coming your way so your normal day to day routine is actually quite disturbed you will end up getting desperate because the itchy fingers are going to creep in in one of these days and you will end up operating on something which you were not really doing very well before any anyway and you remember you're all working on a different regular schedules because the priority is being given to the covid patients you coming at the end and, and, and the whole setup is very very different these are unusual times also because the type of the workload is different it's not the kind of you know the same kind of pattern which you use been used to working for so many years and it's not the way that you really worked when you push to one one corner you you saw so aware of the other person whether he's going to carry infection not carry infection you're adjusting your mask all the time you're wearing those difficult to wear clothes if you go on to operate or if you go to emergency manage and remember you are still in charge running a service which has to be rationalized and the priority has got to be given to the to the uh, to the covid patients which is there so this is one of the papers which which came out raju uh, raju wrote this along with the uh, abit what they basically talked about there is you know it's a different way of working that we are all all getting used to it we're postponing things we're looking we 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 are seeing a lot of different infections we're seeing a lot of different, different ailments which which are there so it's a different way to look at it your investigations are slightly different people don't want to go into an ecd scanner people don't want to get an mri scanner done you're actually talking to people on the telephones more than anything else you're you you're sending off the whatsapp messages so there's all a different way to remember and remember there is a challenge with this you're not only predicting the patient you're also predicting the medical staff and your colleagues and remember what you what happens to you in the hospital you can actually take it back home into your house and actually end up end up having giving bigger problems to the people at home so it's all it's all good to talk about the theory but the problem is you don't know when is it going to end and it could actually go on as as we're discussing maybe for a year or even two years and then you start getting confused about what is my priority what is not my priority in this but as 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 the popular radio jingle goes काम तो चलता ही रहना चाहिए so these were the initial thoughts which which came out i think lalit lalit and rajiv both here both were authors on this paper so essentially they talked about what what dr sudhir kapoor talked about that if there is any chance that you don't or you can you can avoid operating go on and avoid operating this is what we started over remember this is what we were thought we were just postponing it till we can actually get get back to doing it that postponing thing from a few weeks has become to almost a year so things are actually different and too many people are suffering from a lack of treatment whether it's a cardiac issue whether it's a stroke diabetes we we just having to sort of you know live with the complications of things we could have sorted out earlier and we need to think about changing what we call as what is emergency and more and more we we realize you cannot have a cookie cutter approach you cannot just keeping the same thing again and again and, and taking it to other people so the philosophy as has been rightly said again and again everybody is covid until you can prove it otherwise but i i'm fairly confident when i make the next statement orthopedic procedures are low risk procedures i am aware of those whatsapp messages about the sores and the and the generation of of blood and everything nobody is actually shown why the nia in the blood nobody's shown that an orthopedic surgeon uh, using doing a knee replacement has actually got this thing i know there is a there is there a generation of fluid particles i know they can be vectors for the virus which is floating in the air but it's not getting transmitted by blood to the best of my knowledge and you got to take your precautions and obviously i'm not asking you to throw caution into the air test every patient whenever possible and if you do not have the facility for backup keeping them separately do not operate on them Now what about patient selection we all talked about dividing the patients into these kind of categories and this is an algorithm was there so many of those algorithms which keep coming on there is no denying as a doctor you do not have a right to refuse a patient whether your facility has it or not you have to actually manage this patient so these are the emergency patients we are talking about so we'll talk about that later then you come to the other the other patients and then the 
then the algorithm actually goes. Remember, the big problem is the aerosol generating pressure. So anybody who's working in the mouth, the ENT surgeon, a dental surgeon, an anesthetist who's going to keep you know, looking down the throat, the liquid generation and all, he's the one who's at a bigger, bigger problem. You are not at the end of it. You can actually walk into the operation theater 20 minutes after he's already done the intubation. So this is a very uh, good algorithm. I, I, I hate to admit it, but I didn't really make it. But it makes a lot of sense to me. So you need to divide the institution into COVID positive, COVID negative areas. And you need to have this, the standard operating procedures which you need to define in your thing. And you need to think about alternative. Now let's have a look at what, what, what are the options that you, you might end up with. So the emergency patient is the one who's going to be operated within 24 hours. Some facilities will give you an RT-PCR test. Some facilities will not give you an RT-PCR test. But if this is the patient that we're dealing with, we're talking about emergency patient and we're talking about urgent patients, so they can all be sort of clumped together in, in, into one group of patients. What you need to do is, and again, I'm, we've all gone into what is an emergency, not an emergency. Remember, if you have to operate, you have to operate. And you are a surgeon, you need to pick up your scalpel one day and operate. But always, even in the emergency, do a rapid test, but do send your RT-PCR off for different reasons so that get your history from the patient as much as you can in terms of contact tracing, in terms of travel, uh, uh, other family members, long cough, etc. Look in the social contact. More importantly, what is his background? Does he have a lot of problems which are happening? And remember, the inflammatory markers are your best bet in terms of where are you picking up this guy? So if he can be right in the peak of his inflammation or he's developing into an inflammatory phase, that's the one who's going to give you a problem. And these are the basic investigations you need to get done. So at the very, very basic, get your CRP, D-dimers, and ferritin. I mean, that will actually give you an idea where you are with your inflammatory cycle. All these patients, needless to say, protection, uh, person protection equipment, regional anesthesias, straight into the OT, straight out, no pre-anesthetic rooms, less pre-anesthetic conversation. One, the designated person does it. You don't want to send your resident to start fiddling around and then come and rescue him in the middle. You want to be there. You want to walk, clean your hands, get in and finish this and quick off. Very little role now for fixators and all. And much better you take him once, you fix him, plate him, and, and get him out. So that's, that's again, another story. I'm not going to get into it. So remember, few personnel. We don't want to crowd the room with a hell of a lot of people and, and expose all of them. You don't want a crowded OT. You don't want a pre-anesthetic area. You need to drop in and out in or uh, just close to the OT and have a bath when you finish off. Remember, these are the ones who are almost sort of proven, proven code positive or that you can test. And sent very, very important. He needs to be made aware that, look, it's all being done for his best, best interest, but things can go wrong. If you're in private practice, make sure you tell them that the billing will go up. And if the patient cannot afford that kind of a billing, I think he needs to go somewhere else. Every patient has a potential of ending up with the ICU. This is the next category. Here you have some amount of time. So, I mean, needless to say, you've got 24 hours. You, you, you actually go in and actually check his... Check his RT-PCR and you operate only when the results come. These are the kind of things, you know, that you're talking about. People who already, you know, had a fall. These are the kind of semi-urgent scenarios which you have. Patients already had a fall had a fall and was already prone positive. Asinuma lung with a periprosthetic fracture, COVID positive. And these are things which are happening every day. So you need to have some sort of a treatment plan in your mind. So these are all things you will have to sort of go with the idea. Look, I need to sort of sort this out. You can't just keep sitting around so here's some of the evidence which looked at what happens in semi-emergency. It's very confusing, I can tell you. So one paper which came out in the semi-emergency was looking at the proximal neck of hemorrhage. This man tells you that actually if you stabilize them, you can rehabilitate them better. Then you look at this paper which, which comes out, which tells you that if you actually end up having these patients who get picked up, high chance of developing a complication. So really doesn't help you too much, but... If there is a chance for a few days of delay, you cannot leave a, a, a fracture neck of hemorrhage waiting for 10 days. It's not going to happen. You are going to kill it irrespective anyway. So there's a third paper, which I haven't mentioned, which is about the fact that if you do a CT scan, you'll see a lot of things. So what would you do? Uh, my suggestion to you is do a repeat RT-PCR again, if you think there's a, there's a discrepancy in your findings or something, and then you can do a CT scan. Just keep a check on the blood, check the inflammatory markers, don't catch him at the peak of his cytokine storm. That's a, that's a big thing. And you might need to ventilate this post-op. You need to have this SOP which runs with the anesthetist involved with it. 
who are actually going to sort of you know have some sort of a, the protocol in terms of less patient contact less face to face quick in quick in, quick out policy where are you going to operate on them where are you going to put them even the even the the gda who's going to transport the patient needs to be provided and looked after as as, as we we just just told us about so now this is the most contentious area should you do elective surgery now should you not do elective surgery i remember i said so if you really want to be sure do do at least two rt pcr test and you add it to a ct scan now you're really reducing the chances that you actually miss something so what is not an elective surgery dr gurinder so this, up early, please running sure. so time, this, please. these are the some other criteria which which can be used and why would you like to postpone as i just said you're trying to protect the other patients you're trying to protect the other people so this is one strategy which came out about how to do this in terms of where you are and what is your threshold capacity and then you can decide how how to, how to take it forward so you can uh, you can think about uh, of offering some alternative surgery which may not always or always be, uh, always be available but you need to keep dividing and triaging these patients to who's a high risk low risk kind of a thing these are the kind of patients who maybe you should not try to operate and remember the anesthetic has to be taken in consideration for regional anesthesia or more general anesthesia your operation theater has to has to be as we as we set up there are papers available which actually help you the best one which came out is what david parvezi collected a group of 77 people and asked them questions about getting a consensus remember this is a consensus based treatment in terms of when should you think when should we actually go ahead and start operating what are the issues we need to look at and this is a fairly fairly good paper if you want to read it came out of the american jbjs but talked about who should not get operated when should we get operated what kind of facility should you have what kind of a test you have this is all a consensus based statement on about 77 experts so there is there are some help from the literature not an evidence based kind of a literature but once you get this kind of a set up set up properly get your pre anesthetic checkups done and normally that would help you start off or kick start your work but where and how is what you need to pick up thank you so much uh that was an excellent presentation thank you very much for winding up uh, in time and uh, i think Uh, Dr. Samajit, please uh, ask the second. Uh, uh, I'll now invite Dr. Uh, Farooqi, Kamran Farooqi, for his talk on spine trauma surgery in COVID times. He is professor at AIMS and will give some insight on that. Okay, you are yeah. not possible. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right. Can you can you see my screen? Yeah, can see it and hear you well. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Samajit, Dr. Dhananjay, and DOA for uh, you know inviting me to give this talk. And uh, my talk has been actually made very easy because Vivek and myself work at the same center, and obviously the protocols we fall follow in the emergency are same. So. i would just be sharing my experience regarding specifically to spine trauma uh, during this uh, pandemic so we all know i mean this i'll skip through this since we are in short of time that uh, we started uh, the lockdown on 24th of march and it was ended uh, by the 31st of may and then gradually uh, the restrictions kept easing off and uh, uh, and so that's how we managed and, and different stages that we have gone through of treating a trauma and and particularly um the spine trauma the only thing i would uh, you know highlight from this is that uh, we chose to defer elective surgeries that we are not doing any elective surgeries and in fact at aims uh, all routine opd admissions have been uh, suspended and they are extending the suspension of routine surgeries uh, till now and we don't know how long that will last so on, the only thing we are operating now is emergency surgeries Uh, life saving surgeries and trauma and 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 oncology and orthopedics as such uh, uh, with regards to orthopedics so these are the only two two things we are operating at the moment and we are not uh, doing any elective work at the moment uh, 
so we all know this. I mean, we have almost crossed six million worldwide, and in, even in uh, sixty-two million worldwide, and India also. The figure stands at ninety-three thousand. Uh, in Delhi itself, I mean, we are almost five and a half lakhs, and we know about all the stats. So, uh, the important thing to uh, note here is that you know, from asymptomatic carrier, the transmission can be anything between twenty-five to fifty percent, and uh, almost. You know, incidentally, when the patient comes to us in the casualty, and suddenly we come to know the patient is COVID positive, so there there are almost eighty percent of patients who don't have any symptoms, and they by and large asymptomatic, or even even the patients don't know that they have any symptoms of COVID, uh, and they come to us only with trauma, complaints of trauma and fractures. So that's something which is to be we need to uh, keep in mind, especially in the emergency department that the patient can be covid positive i mean the dictum is that take them to be positive un until proved otherwise and orthopedic surgeons are somewhat a unique group because especially when we are do dealing with trauma uh, we are exposing ourselves in the ed itself and and then if we have to operate upon them uh, and the reason is that we can spread to our colleagues to other healthcare workers and to our family uh, our, our family itself. I mean, we have to get, get back home, and we have our family staying with us, so we can be a source of transmission to them and whoever we can come in contact with. Uh, this was an interesting study in which 26 orthopedic surgeons from eight hospitals, uh, you know, they got infected with COVID. Uh, this is from Wuhan, and what they found out was that 80% of the ortho surgeons they got the exposure in the general ward, and and 20% in general places, and only 12.5% was in the OTs, operation theaters, while doing surgeries, and or or in outpatient or uh, in the intensive care unit. I mean, most of the exposure was from general ward, and uh, and and vice versa. They transmitted most commonly to their family members. So that is something we have to keep in mind. That if we have people susceptible to COVID, then we need to take extra care uh, when dealing during these pandemic times. So the challenges we face as ortho surgeons uh, dealing with trauma and spine trauma is that how do we protect uh, the vital medical force uh, uh, at our center and to ensure the safety of admitted COVID negative patients, right? Uh, so that we don't transmit to other patients as well as to our uh, other he healthcare workers and our colleagues. Uh, the second thing is the how, to, how do we manage to uh, optimize the patient before they go in for surgery and especially while respecting the social distancing measures. And the third challenge that we faced is, especially with the COVID times and all the stress on ICU beds and ventilators, how to procure ICU beds, especially uh, with respect to cervical trauma. I mean, that is something, the big challenge that we have faced uh, during this time is the non-availability of ICU beds because uh, most of the ICU beds in a hospital have been taken up by the COVID, uh, you know, COVID uh, patients and we need to reserve them. And, and, and it, getting an ICU bed especially for cervical trauma is a big, big challenge. And that's where I think uh, that's something we have learned during this time that uh, probably cervical trauma is a big issue. Okay. Another thing that we faced was that because uh, I bet most of the open spine surgeries do require blood and blood product. So especially during the lockdown in the first phases, which lasted till about end of May uh, before the unlockdown phases began, uh, there was an issue getting the blood and blood product because the donations were not coming in, the patients were not coming for donate, donation and getting a blood uh, you know, product could be a challenge because the blood banks are running short of donations. So they are not able to provide the blood. So we need to plan for the blood products in advance and inform the blood banks that, okay, we are going to need so much blood and this group uh, so that somehow they can arrange and you can only do surgery once the blood is arranged. And the thing was, especially uh, initially, you know, when the uh, lockdown was uh, just imposed, in those times, there was an issue in getting the company guys to get the implants because, I mean, I mean, obviously no hospital keeps all the implants. So we have to order the implants and uh, they have to, uh, the implants have to be supplied in time, one day before at least, uh, to the hospital for sterilization, et cetera. So getting those implants was again a challenge, but uh, somehow, we circumvented that by issuing them letters that they are supplying, uh, you know, hospital or medicine, medical related stuff to the, uh, you know, um, 
to the hospital and uh, even with those authority letters they were allowed by the police personnel and the traffic personnel to come to our hospital so that we worked out the solution but that was initially a challenge uh, uh, so uh, with the beginning of the lockdown and the surge in cases what happened was that tra a trauma center jp and atc was closed down and we shifted to main aims uh, main aims and we were allotted thankfully we were allotted beds and uh, the whole trauma care facility shifted to the main block and the whole of trauma center was converted into covid 19 uh, however uh, although we did have a slight reduction in number of cases and trauma cases which reported to our ed initially but then being the tertiary trauma center and i guess uh, we were one of the few very very few centers who were dealing with spine trauma as such so uh, we did continue to get a lot of spine trauma cases due, even during the pandemic and lockdown period and especially once the uh, lockdown has been lifted then we are get, getting a big surge like uh, uh, not exactly a surge but the number of spine trauma cases uh, which are coming in has definitely increased so what the protocols like are more or less the same which we have followed i mean initially when rt pcr and cbnat were not that universally available uh, what we did was that all the patients who came they underwent rigorous temperature checks and screening for risk factors um, and then the patients who were suspected of having any symptoms they were isolated in a designated gray area and then uh, covid testing was done only for them initially we were not testing all the patients uh, when the kits were not uh, you know that universally available uh, so initially we were what we were doing is we were doing a symptomatic screening and only patients who were suspected were uh, being tested uh, however um, and then obviously um, all the patients and attendants were you know we were we insisted that they should wear a mask and they were resuscitated everything else was according to the atls protocols the only thing was that we were taking care to wear all the pps and all the residents who were there in emergency department uh, they were taking all at least level 2 or level 3 precautions uh, later when we started uh, getting they were uh, you know the kits were ubiquitously available then what we did was that we the protocol shifted to test based testing so whoever whichever patient we were thinking especially with spine trauma of operating and admitting uh, they were done either a rt pcr or cbnet test so that is the protocol we are following now that all the patients who require admission before spine trauma we do a rt pcr or a cbnet on them and only once the patient is negative and then we get the report uh, can the patient be shifted to the ward so that is the protocol we are following we get the testing and then in the ed and only then once the patient is negative uh, do we shift the patient to the ward and uh, and all the healthcare workers in the emergency department they uh, they wear the ppes as per our institutional protocols so um, the minimum basics is n95 mask a face shield uh, a level two or level three, uh, especially those people who are going to deal with the airway of the patient in the red area, they are wearing a level three, I mean, full precautions. And otherwise, our residents are wearing level two gloves and boots. So that's a, that's a <clears throat> level three uh, PP. So this is for pe people who are going to deal with the airways. And otherwise, uh, our residents are wearing a level two. That is a cap, a mask, a visor, and gloves. So we that that is the main thing that we stress on in the emergency department so once the covid negative status of the patient is established then only we transfer the uh, patient to the ward and try to put them uh, you know take them to the operation theater as soon as possible however if the patient does test positive then what is to be done then the what we have done what we have carried out is that we transfer the patient to our dedicated uh, covid care facility which is the trauma center now and once and the once the patient turns, you know, it's sent to the COVID care facility and taken care of there by the dedicated COVID team. And once the patient uh, is COVID negative, then the patient is taken back to a trauma ward and then operated operated upon. So that is the protocol we follow. I mean, test all the patients of spine trauma. If they are negative, we admit them to the ward, and if they are positive, we send them to the trauma care center and uh, to the COVID center. And once uh, the co the patient turns COVID negative, then we transfer them back to a trauma ward and operate upon them. And even in the uh, in the COVID center, uh, there is one orthopedic consultant at least uh, all the time who takes care of uh, and residents who take care of all the orthopedic patients who are COVID positive and who have been transferred to the 
uh, COVID center. Um, uh, in the wards, we make sure that because the visitors are not being tested, so make sure that at least we have a minimum visitor policy and only have a visitor uh, if it is essential. So that is one thing because we are not testing the visitors, so we don't have any control on them. So that's why we have a minimum visitor policy. Another thing that we did initially when we were not that short of beds was to have a social distancing between two patients. That is uh, that we uh, implemented by keeping alternate beds vacant. So uh, we didn't have uh, the patients admitted on consecutive beds, but we kept one bed vacant between two patients. So that is another form of social distancing we tried to do. And all the nursing staff, all healthcare workers use PP as, you know, a strict uh, emphasis was used on use of visors and PPs whenever we are in touch with patients. Extremely, extremely frequent use of alcohol. Every time every, on every bed we used to do use sterilium or any other alcohol-based uh, sanitizer. Uh, and we did daily rounds uh, with minimum. The, another thing we did was reduce the number of residents. So only on-call team and the ward in charges were, uh, were the residents on rounds and only one consultant took round at one time. Normally, I mean, we have a big team, but we made sure that only the bare minimum residents who can carry out the work and only one consultant did the rounds. And uh, among the you know anesthetic consult consultation uh, considerations when dealing with these patients, uh, because anesthetists are at the higher risk because these patients I mean by mandatorily require intubation. So uh, I mean they are the anesthetists are the highest risk of getting a catching a, a COVID infections. So uh, all the pre-anesthetic consultations were done only after a COVID negative report. That is one thing we did. And even on the day of surgery, before the patient is wheeled into the theater, a reassessment was done for uh, any risk factor because we tested. Another thing which we followed, another protocol which is strictly followed at our hospital is that uh, all the COVID report, uh, reports are you know, valid only for 72 hours. So if, it, if the previous report is more than 72 hours, we have to get a repeat COVID done and RT-PCR is done or CBNAT. But uh, we don't, uh, you know, uh, take a report which is, which it is not valid if it is more than 72 hours old. So that is another thing. So repeat testing. Uh, Dr. Faruqi, wind up, please. Yep, uh, I'm more or less done. Uh, I mean, from an aesthetic point of view, uh, so I'll just show you, I mean, we operated about 36 patients over this times, and four patients had tested positive, for, which were, you know, sent to the uh, COVID center, and we operated on them once they were the, COVID negative. So this is just a data I'm sharing. 36 patients uh, were operated during the COVID times and uh, 22 bus fractures, eight chance fractures. Uh, unfortunately, we could only operate on one C-spine because like I said previously, uh, getting an ICU bed and ventilator was a big issue. So that is why, I mean, others are uh, as expected, distributed equally in upper dorsal, dorsal lumbar, and lumbar as expected. The only, uh, you know, outlier here is the C-spine that we could only operate on one uh, C-spine which did not require a, a ICU bed. So, so that is the only outlier that I would like to say. Uh, rest of the things are, I mean, more or less routine. I mean, as expected, most of the ca cases are concentrated about uh, dorsal lumbar, lumbar and mid dorsal region. So uh, I would say the only challenge we faced was getting the ICU bed and C-spine was very less. Uh, most of the patients were Asia grade, uh, were actually NSCCA, ASA grade one. So that was not big, but however, we did have patients who had chest trauma and there were patients who were NSCCA grade two and three as well. Um, so what I would like to say is that they were reduced during this time, uh, but still we did continue to get spine trauma because we were uh, we are at, at tertiary referral centers and probably spine trauma was not being operated in close by uh, NCR region and nearby area. So most of the referrals were made to our, our center. Um, all the surgeons use, I'll just show you a, a photo. Uh, we did, the precautions we did was uh, we used the PPEs along with the visor and N95 mask. We did not use much of pulse lavage and we tried to do uh, minimally invasive surgery wherever it was applicable. So this is the kind of uh, you know visor we wear along with the N95 mask. We do have respirators. The only issue is that voice transmission becomes a bit difficult and difficult to communicate with the residents once you are wearing. So we use N95 and a visor and obviously the full PPE kit. Uh, in the post-op care, uh, we tried to discharge the patients a bit earlier as soon as possible so that uh, they're not exposed to COVID infection if it's happening in the hospital. 
and the other thing is that we have to differentiate between any chest infection that might have they might have and uh, possible covid-19 infection that's something we have to keep in mind uh, in the post admission care i mean we do repeat the covid test after 72 hours and especially if it is suspected and sir please write up please write up yeah okay so uh, on discharge tele consultations were given uh, we did continue to carry on our academics and to summarize now covid is part of our lives and we need to continue to do academics research as well as patient care uh, thanks very much thank you very much for an excellent presentation uh, and the question and answer question and comments will be taken after the uh, the presentation the next talk is by your president dr sarath agarwal i invite him for the talk and the topic is multi specialty versus only ortho specialty hospitals which are safer, safer in these covid times dr sarath agarwal please thank you uh, thank you dr tomar i'll just share my screen is it visible yeah it is visible right is visible. Uh, thank you uh, i was bit intrigued <clears throat> when i was asked by dr dhananjay to speak on the difference between a care in a multi specialty hospital versus only ortho specialty hospital and which one is safer for surgeons actually this is the topic he had given me uh, which is safer for the surgeons so i sat and thought uh, is that does, does it make any difference and when i start analyzing because i could not get much data in literature on this particular point but when i sat and thought about it i think uh, I, i thought i mean i could see that it does make little difference uh, my job has been made easier by most of the speakers uh, <coughs> who have spoken earlier and so i would be just rushing through some of the slides few points i want to emphasize with dr threka said that 87000 healthcare workers were got involved till uh, with covid in uh, till september and dr kamran has in, uh, quoted a chinese study in which they said the 80% patients uh, doctors were uh, got infected in a journal ward so uh, it, it it does make a difference where the orthopedic surgeon is working and uh, uh, how he is conducting himself during this period this we all know about what causes corona virus but the the more the one important point in the, this is that a lot number of patients are asymptomatic so they will not will not be knowing who patients are can be infective who may not be infective and another important point for us is there is an increased susceptibility and mortality in patients with multiple comorbidities including old age obesity hypertension pulmonary cardiac problems and diabetes if they are operated uh, during this period uh, mostly the symptomatic treatment uh, the dilemma and challenges for the orthopedic surgeon which uh, dr uh, uh, gorinder has brought out very well that there is an exponential expansion of the patient population in need of hospital hospitalization surpassing all available sources so it going to impact all fields of uh, uh, medicine and so similarly so orthopedic surgery as well and i said earlier there is a lot number of patient who are asymptomatic and become a carrier so the dilemma of uh, uh, orthopedic surgeon would be that orthopedic surgeon may have to de specialize that he may have to leave orthopedics and start taking care of uh, covid patients and uh, uh, at times he has to take care of uh, surgical emergency orthopedic emergency in covid patient which leads to high degree of anxiety and depression the what would be the safety measures for uh, orthopedic surgeon uh, what would be to postpone the uh, uh, elective uh, surgeries so that you reduce burden on the health system healthcare system and make more availability of bed to the hospital uh, but it becomes difficult how to decide which case to uh, do which case to be avoided at the moment and in the process at times the emergent and urgent patients may get affected I'll give you a couple of examples like this patient having a failed hip now he has got disabled he got pain he's got discomfort how long uh, can we ask this patient to wait i mean in our situation we had to make this patient wait at least 2 months before we could operate him or there is another lady who has such such kind of disability because of uh, degenerative arthritis of the knees uh, when we can give an, a result of the kind which is there the same patient on the right side with a total knee replacement how long can you ask this patient to wait so such cases become a dilemma whether to make the patient wait or we go ahead with the surgery in during this period so how to identify an elective procedure ohio hospital association uh, have defined elective surgeries as the one which uh, all accept which are threat to the patient's life 
or to an extremity or an organ. There is a risk of metastasis and progression of disease, or there is a risk of rapidly worsening severe, uh, to the severe symptom. Such situations, we may need to intervene early. Otherwise, all others we can take as an elective surgery. And similarly, stable and unstable diseases have been, decide, uh, have been defined where stable case, uh, cases we can postpone, while unstable cases needs to be operated. Uh, what will uh, elect postponing elective surgery would do? It reduces uh, and, uh, the pressure on the hospital, save resources, diminishes perioperative peri complications, and reduces unnecessary patient traffic, decrease the spread of disease among patients and health care, uh, care provider. Uh, Our that all uh, have come out uh, with five categories, A being the most urgent and uh, E in which they have taken deformities, arthroplasty and trigger finger as group under E, which can wait uh, 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 for a longer time. Dr. Gorinder has extensively discussed this particular flow chart given by Our that all, where we divide the patient to emergent, urgent and elective. In emergent cases, we need not, uh, we cannot sort of uh, test the patient, operate like a positive patient and then decide later. In urgent, we do have a time and then decide and elective of course can be made to wait. So uh, what can orthopedic surgeons do? Uh, what precautions we can to take at different stages of a patient to protect ourselves? Uh, in outpatient uh, cases, we are, as clinic, we need to screen the patient. If they are positive, then we may have to ask them to wait. At preoperative phase, you look for uh, simple different signs by temperature and oxygen saturation, by medical history, uh, history of travel, and as many other speakers have said, uh, testing by RT-PCR. Similarly, we need to reorganize the hospital ward for uh, COVID patient creating adequate social distancing, wearing basic precautions like having basic precautions like wearing masks, adequate disinfections, and uh, 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 I mean, make exclusive wards for the uh, COVID patients. A number of visitors have to be minimized. During the perioperative phase, again, different speakers have spoken. Uh, we need to have separate uh, OTs for the, uh, for the COVID patients. We have proper uh, uh, ventilation system and uh, only necessary material has to be brought into OT. We minimize the number of personnel in the OT and traffic has to be minimized and all personnel has to wear uh, PP, adequate PPE. Uh, it has been emphasized again and again that regional anesthesia is, uh, is better and, uh, than the general if possible. And if at all, patient has to be put into general anesthesia, it should be intubated in a shorter possible time to prevent, uh, protect person from uh, any risk, uh, from the healthcare workers to protect from any uh, infection. Uh, surgical procedure should be done by the highest, highest skilled surgeons so to avoid prolongation. Minimally invasive approaches should be considered so that you can shorten the duration of surgery. Electrocautery and power tools <clears throat> like bone saws, reamers should be, and drills used to be minimized to avoid per, uh, aerosols. Such patients to be transferred if they are COVID positive or suspected COVID patient to, uh, to isolated wards, isolation wards through dedicated corridors. Surgeons should be aware of common post-operative complications, and uh, if they are positive, then to be managed uh, uh, as per protocol. Standard enhanced recovery protocols to be followed in post-operative phase, which means the hospital stays to be minimized, and most of the work of telemedicines and telecommunications, including for further consultation, physical therapy, and follow-up. Now, what happens in multi-specialty hospital? What can we expect in a multi-specialty hospital? Either it will be a partially or fully, fully COVID hospital. There we expect heavy influx of COVID-19 patients. The maximum resources and manpower of the hospital will be directed toward COVID care and less resources would be available for orthopedic patients. Mm -hmm. Orthopedic surgeons may be asked to do COVID duties, and there would be, as I said, many asymptomatic COVID cases which we surgeon may not know and uh, get uh, the risk of getting infected. Uh, doctor orthopedic surgeon may have to get involved in COVID patients having uh, orthopedic emergency, so there is high chance of health healthcare staff, including doctor, to get uh, infected. As compared to that, uh, uh, in an ortho specialty hospital, it may not be an active, most likely would not be an active COVID facility. So it like unlikely to be overwhelmed with the COVID patient. And the infra, so the infra, major, majority infrastructure and resources should be available to the orthopedic patient. And it becomes easier to, easier to set protocols to prevent COVID cross infection. As we understand, the protocols for orthopedic surgeries during pandemic are different than other specialties. In a uh, orthopedic specialty hospital become possible to enforce them uh, these protocols more rigorously, train the staff effectively, including ortho for orthopedic work and orthopedic specialty hospital. 
so uh, another aspect of safety is telemedicines which can uh, be used at many stages uh, to deliver uh, safe advice to the patients can be used for patient triaging post operative follow ups monitoring the patients and in rehabilitation uh, but at certain stages it cannot be in certain situation cannot be used like for suture removal cast change or some uh, cases where need a clinical examination and there can be many obstacles also in this right implement uh, implementation uh, which include infrastructure costs uh, education of the patient and the provider data protection ethical and le legal uh, uh, questions and the payment regulation so to conclude uh, friends the data suggests there is a increased likelihood of orthopedic surgeons to engage with ortho uh, covid-19 patient in the hospital more so in a multi specialty hospital occupational hazards to orthopedic surgeons and other healthcare workers also to the families and neighbor uh, would be there if the healthcare workers are exposed to the infection orthopedic surgeons should prepare to take proper precautions against occupational risk of exposure especially in asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic surgical patients in preparation consider increasing level of protection and uh, infection control and their implementation during different phases of pandemic it will be easy to implement such measures in a ortho specialty hospital where more infrastructure facility shall be available for orthopedic patients easier to set protocols and force them rigorously and train the staff effectively exclusively for orthopedic work in those uh, hospitals so orthopedic uh, specialty hospital may be safer not only for orthopedic surgeons uh, other healthcare workers but also to orthopedic patients as well all in all one has to believe that medical practice including orthopedic surgery will differ after the pandemic is over implementation of new technologies restructuring our health system with incorporation of telemedicine has to be considered as well as reorganization organization of our traditional training programs will be crucial for a more effective and optimal delivery thank you thank you dr sharat uh, because we have been running late in the session and since we have a gbm which is taking priority over this uh, the orders are from organizers uh, to carry on with the gbm first and remaining two talks will resume after the gbm so i think we will disperse for the gbm which is also again online okay and link is already probably shared with everybody thank so you we will be going up for the gbm at this stage there are three three presentation left uh, and we will resume this uh, presentation after the gbm gbm is over thank you very much for all the speakers and the panelists thank you very much for this inconvenience ye gbm ka link kahan yaar yeah dr dhananjay is that okay uh please uh i mean as per the constitution gbm takes precedence over any other session you have to have minimum 50 number of uh, participants in the gbm to make it valid i mean this is a constitutional requirement and <clears throat> since this is a a, a doa event we really cannot uh, you know interfere <laughs> in the sanctity of the gbm i'm i'm i'm, I'm really sorry and i do apologize but somehow i mean i couldn't get away from it we'll try to wind it up as soon as we can and uh, what else we can do is we can simply uh, resume the session c on time that is a priority because the session which, which was running late that uh, remaining talks we can take up later on subsequently whenever and let's see let's keep the fingers crossed let's hope that the gbm gets over fast okay just thanks to everybody i will not be able to join later because i've got another webinar that i'm involved with so uh, it was interesting and i really enjoyed the talks but uh, i unfortunately i won't be able to join in the later session so the john thank you so Great. much for okay, joining us so. even for this small time we really appreciate <laughs> and we apologize at the same time no no not a problem at all no. i enjoyed it so that's okay thank you so much sure okay thank you thank you so much thank you lek <laughs> thank you everyone But have we does the link change for the GBM or it is the same this one? There's a separate link for the GBM for the Delhi Orthopedic Association member only, okay. and uh, it has been shared widely through the Gmail. I mean, all the mails from the DOA as well as on the various groups which are available on WhatsApp. 
So, um, so we exit this group now to join that. Yes, please. But it so won't, can I just uh, say something? I mean, so, I mean, people they can stay on this group or they can go to the main uh, hall mm -hmm. and go to the poster uh, and see the see the posters. Or the proceedings in the hall B, they are still on. Of whatever we had done, uh, we had uh, uh, conducted uh, sessions in the hall B in the morning over there. You can see them. And uh, moment we finish the GBM, we will be back here. Anyone who wants the link for the GBM, let me know now. I can uh, WhatsApp the link immediately right away. Uh, Dr. Benanje, uh, yes. sir, wo, uh, that GBM link. Some people are having problem with that link. So I yes, but I did it. try. I did try with the with the with the password and with this thing, I was able to. Yes, ID log. and password is working. So yeah. link, yeah. if it's not working, then we should log in with the ID and password. That's yes. the only yes. thing. Yes, precisely. Yes. Thanks. Thanks for it. Thanks, Doctor Dhananjay. Sir. Ah, uh, Doctor Manojayar, please send ID. me the link. I don't have not received. I have not received. Ah, uh, right, fine. Coming along, boss. We are waiting okay. for you in the GBM. Right. Thank you. ठीक है देख लो करा जो भी है जो भी है फिर उसका बोल दो डॉक्टर अभिलेख को बोल दो फिर
हेलो रवि हेलो Amit, doctor, doctor Amit, hi, 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 welcome. How are you? Uh, can you uh, just start uh, getting your your panelists on board so that uh, we should be able to resume <coughs> our session shortly? Uh, I have requested Doctor Shekhar Agarwal and uh, Doctor Yash Gulati. Uh, I got a message from uh, Doctor Maheshwari that he'll be joining late. Okay, no problem. So let us hope for them to join, uh, Doctor yeah. Yash Gulati and Doctor Shekhar. <clears throat> yeah. Hi, good afternoon, Doctor Amite. How are you? Hi, Mandu. I'm good. How are you? All good. Yes. So I see uh, uh, one of the Bhavuk is there. He's going to our opening batsman for this session. I can see Doctor Amish. Yes. Sir, Sir, uh, good afternoon, Doctor Sen. Uh, and uh, Dr. Chabra is Dr. Chabra there. also. Dr. Chabra also. Sir, can you confirm that uh, first there will be Dr. Malhotra's talk, uh, and uh, then uh, our session will start. Dr. Dhananjay. Uh, uh, Babu sir. Babu sir. Uh, yes, Malhotra sir. Malhotra sir talk and uh, the other two talks that were of the last session. Na, we will yes. continue after this session. You continue okay. with this session, sir. Okay. 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 So as I see, I think. Uh, we are almost ready we i'm just waiting for the panelists to come in so should, uh, can anyone call uh, this gentleman dr shekhar and uh, dr yash gulati <coughs> sir shekhar sir is in gbm he is coming in a while sir okay so i think we can uh, start is is that okay if if it's yeah, yeah, go sir. ahead and then yes, let this guy. okay so uh, uh, good afternoon and welcome uh, to this uh, very interesting session which is the future of futuristic orthopedics so as uh, we all know, uh, realize on day to day basis that technology in orthopedics is coming in a big way and uh, some of the technology will be here to stay and some of the, uh, the technological advances will not uh, give us any tangible advances over the others so let's hear uh, the six beautiful talks on this topic so to begin with i think for oh, let me just go through the program it's uh, bhavuk uh, uh, who will be speaking on role of ai in uh, orthopedics so over to bhavuk <clears throat> thank you sir uh, i am i hope like uh, my screen is visible yes sir yes so yeah, uh, please go ahead sir <clears throat> so i thank uh, doa for giving me this opportunity uh, uh, to speak on a topic which is very uh, dear to my heart uh, nowadays so uh, speaking about the artificial intelligence uh, uh, we know that the data volume and complexity is growing day by day and if we look at the some of the statistics you know we can see that every 73 days the rate is the medical data is doubling every 73 days and uh the number of people the the number of uh, the uh, the number of financial data is also increasing day by day and we also re have real are realizing that the uh, there is a global shortage of healthcare workers is going to be there by 2035 so this is actually a mismatch between the data and the volume of the work which we have and the workforce which we are going to have in near future and we have already realized and there is already data that the 45% of the medicine which is being practiced is not evidence based and if we have to keep up with the new professional insights uh, uh, in the form of literature we have to read approximately 29 hours per day which is not possible and uh, the uh, this is the us data that uh, the number of retail prescriptions they need to fill uh, every year is going to be in billions uh, uh, recently so uh, coming to the artificial intelligence this term was coined by john mccarthy and it basically denotes that the computers they could learn to perform the task through the pattern recognition which we as human do uh, without our involvement as such 
so basically machines they develop some sort of algorithms uh, so they that provides the machines the ability to solve the problems that traditionally required the human intelligence uh, so just for an example like in netflix you watch some movie and then the netflix suggest you know the the type of movies which is according to your taste uh, and your uh, your likings so you can choose uh, from those pictures uh, they if you go and you browse certain um, uh, website for some um uh, product or some clothing or accessories you will soon getting those pictures on your uh, on your social accounts or on your uh, or in your ads will start coming on your apps uh, regarding this this is all ai and sub- this is the same example if you if you uh, uh, if you buy a, a, a product on amazon you will soon uh, you will soon see the um, the you know the products which the other customers they have bought uh whosoever have uh, purchased uh, that product also so you know this is all sort of ai and in this presentation which i am going to give is already have component of the artificial intelligence um, this powerpoint presentation which i have formed with the new office 365 it has got artificial intelligence uh, in built which gives you the the backgrounds and the and the format of the slide as per the content of your uh, of your uh, presentation so uh, the artificial intelligence the landscape is quite wide you know including from robots from mach- to machine learning which we are going to discuss the different aspects of the artificial intelligence and this is cha- this is changing rapidly you know from face recognition technology to the uh, self driving cars the artificial intelligence is shaping our future in a very rapid way so if we look at the broad aspects of the artificial intelligence so if a machine is able to mimic the human intelligence by uh anything it is called the artificial intelligence whether it is about uh, dictaphone or anything which can mimic the human work it is artificial intelligence uh sub part of it is the machine learning when you involve some sort of maths and statistics and you develop some algorithms where the machine can improve uh itself then we call it as a machine learning and then there is a further subset of machine learning is called the deep learning where uh, you use the complex neural networks like the neurons in the brain there are complex algorithms you know when uh, which can com- which can process the images uh, the audio and the videos and then they can transform transfer uh, transform into some meaningful data which is uh, useful to, for your day to day practice so if we uh, there is a question you know which is frequently asked what is the difference between the machine learning versus the statistics so it is all about the prediction versus probability statistics tells about the probability so if i tell you that the 90% of the hippies they take drugs it is the statistics but if i can if i tell you that by looking at the picture of hippie i can tell whether he has taken drug or not this is called the machine learning this is the prediction so this is just a simple uh, definition the another terms which we commonly heard in artificial intelligence is about the supervised versus unsupervised uh, machine learning so suppose if i have got um, uh, 1000 x rays of uh, of uh, proximal tibia fracture and i give it to a, a artificial intelligence uh, machine and i tell and i tell that machine that this is type 1 this is type 2 this is type 3 and so if i will give this machine uh, 100000 1 x ray so that it can tell that it is type 1 or type 2 or type 3 uh shatsgar uh, uh, x ray so this machine can learn this is called supervised learning the unsupervised learning is that if i just give the 1000 x rays to the machine and i don't tell which x rays which which type is this thing so the machine can come up with some new classification on which it has itself recognized some unrecognized patterns and what are the clusters you know of the different types which are uh, which the machine thinks they are same to this so you can uh learn you can look for the patterns which are not recognizable by uh, as by us as human but but the machine can predict the uh, the, uh, the 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 pattern so this is important this is called the black box phenomena where we are giving the input into 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 the machine and then it trans it gives us the clusters so it gives us the the uh, the differentiation between these these factors suppose if i have the, uh, the, the we know the lenke classification about scoliosis so it there are six types but if i give it to the machine then machine can give up maybe around 42 types or maybe around 50 types uh, which are which are behaving differently as per the, the the machine so these machine algorithms they can be run unsupervised but you can also frequently validate you know after the 100 x rays you can see whether the the machine has validated or not so there are frequent validation can also be done so partially supervised machine algorithms are also there the deep learning basically employs the complex neural networks in which you can feed multiple data and then you can look at for your particular outcome so this is called the the deep learning when there are complex algorithms multiple running into this thing which are frequently checked by themselves and then they are amalgamated into a, another complex network so it is a form of a very complex uh, artificial neural networks and there are special softwares and there are special machines for this 
so these are called the artificial neural networks so just for an example like if we look at the uh, the human decision making as a as a as a basic step then if we if we go from above you know for different types of machine learning then if we look at the google diabetic retinopathy you know so so the if you just take a picture of the retina any any technician can take or a machine can take just by looking into into the into it the picture of the retina and and then it can tell us to you about the grading of the diabetic retinopathy without involvement of any doctor or or any uh, any technician then it is the uh, an advanced form of uh, of of artificial uh, intelligence uh, this thing the another type of artificial intelligence is the natural language processing so natural language processing means when the computer can understand read or write what human can read or write this is very specially useful in electronic medical records so the computers can record whatever is available in the form of electronic medical records and then it can itself you know formulate or it can it can process the uh, the the future uh, medical records suppose if i tell that i book i want to book this patient for carpal tunnel syndrome i have to just give this instruction and then the computer will itself see um, his blood reports and his other parameters whether he has got hypothyroid or not if he needs a, an endocrinologist opinion first are the uh, what are the precautions he need to take what are the uh, the uh, the pre operative uh, treatment uh, how uh, uh, how much prediction is there that he will improve after surgery or not what uh, instructions to the patient need to be given everything can be just done by the computer in the form of uh, of, of a machine learning and it can be processed uh, uh, like that only the another thing is the internet of things uh, so when we have uh, we all have smart devices now in the form of the uh, the wearables we have the smart watch we have the smart uh, pad we have the smart phones so if we can incorporate these smart things into with the artificial intelligence it is called the internet of things and it is also known as the mobile health so this is very important in today's world so we are now we have the wearable sensors also so suppose if i am prescribing a patient a, a brace for a scoliosis and i just incorporate a sensor into the into that brace i can monitor the how much time the patient is wearing the brace and what are the times you know when uh, he or she removes that brace and what are the factors related to that why he or she is removing the brace similarly if a patient of total knee arthroplasty if i am going for rehabilitation i can uh, i can incorporate a small sensor into the into the implant itself and then we can see that the the how the patient is rehabilitating whether it is properly being done or not so these are called the remote patient monitoring and we are moving ahead uh, with this and uh, the major application in orthopedics is coming up uh, especially in the image recognition pre operative risk assessment clinical decision making analysis of massive data and the predictive analytics and risk prediction so there are several papers are coming up which are using these uh, these uh, artificial learning technologies uh this is an example of a 3d spine model vector formulation and automatic detection of the ais so it is it is being replacing the school screening programs nowadays we have this eos machine and we can do a 3d reconstruction with this and then we can uh, draw the uh, the uh, these sort of special diagrams which we call as the davinci view which we can see the rotation of the vertebra and then people have also started looking at the different unsupervised learning clusterization of this thing because the the outcome is being seen that it is de depending upon uh, these factors uh, we are we have collaborated with the uh, the luton and dunstable university of uk at aims and we are uh, identifying the manufacture and models of an orthopedic implant which is the impro project so we just feed the x ray and this machine can tell us the which company manufacture and model of this implant is for for any revision surgery the another aspect is the uh, the fire which is spelled as the fhir which is the fast healthcare interoperability resource so we have the different electronic medical records and we can combine it with the artificial intelligence and similar on this pattern we are we have uh, developed this srs22 uh, hindi uh, validation and we have the hindi version so we have developed this uh, app at aims uh, which is the asics apps the aims fine initiative crooked to straight and in this we gave the option of uh, patient uh, uh, filling up the uh, the choosing the the uh, the uh, hindi and the english versions and then he or she can uh, take up the at different follow up schedules they can take this score which has got various components and then we can use this uh, scoring systems into predicting uh, whether the the, the patient is uh, um, is is uh, what should be the outcome of a particular patient or a particular type of scoliosis in this thing uh, another um, uh, area in which we are working is the integration and application of ai in care of patient with scoliosis so how to classify uh, x rays and what should be the fusion levels so we have uh, we have funding approved from the icmr and this is being done under the aims it delhi collaboration the another uh, project which we have submitted to dhr is 
predicting surgical complications in patients with diatric spinal deformity under AIMS at a Delhi collaboration. So basically, again, we are going to use the artificial neural networks in this program. We have certain uh, clinical data and the radiological data, which we have for uh, approximately 500 patients, which we have operated in last nine years of these deformity, uh, pediatric deformities. And then we, uh, we are going to feed relevant clinical laboratory and radiological predictive risk factors. And then we are we will have a training set of 80% patients. Then we are going to test the findings into 20% of the patients. And then we will have certain uh, outcome measures uh, depend uh, the various prediction models, and we will use the artificial learning. So this is the, the way which we are progressing, but there are certain more applications. Uh, there are endless applications which one can think of. The challenges are that these are somewhat complex. You need somewhat specialist uh, to ha have to help you in developing these protocols. There are some ethical issues because patient sensitive data is being tackled. Uh, the another uh, problem is the adversarial attacks. When someone can manipulate the data, whatever is being feed, and then there is a de-skilling because some people think that it can de-skill our clinical skills of a, of a physician. But one thing is certain that we must uh, merge the health and the health data to give the, the best outcome. And uh, the important thing is that we at human, we, uh, we excel at the common sense, compassion and the the uh, the morals and the AI system excel at the, uh, the pattern recognition. So if we can merge uh, these two, then we can have the best AI that is called the augmented intelligence. So everyone here, we can uh, see that the, our future is being influenced in a great way. And the best way to predict our future is to create it. Thank you. Thanks, Bhav. That was, that was really interesting uh, concept. And uh, I think in the future uh, years to come, AI is going to, whether we like it or not, AI is there to stay. And uh, it will influence clinical uh, care also. That's we all. Any questions on this talk? We may have one question. No. Okay. Then uh, thank you, Bhavu. Uh, thank now you, we, we have the next speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Ketan Jalal. He's an engineer by profession. He's going to speak on uh, the scope of 3D <coughs> printing in post COVID era. Mr. Ket Ketan, please. Thank you, Dr. Pankaj. Um, thank you. Uh, Delhi Orthopedic Association for giving the opportunity. Um, as uh, as you mentioned, I am an engineer. I am a biomedical engineer. I'm not a surgeon, but I've had an opportunity to uh, work in this field for almost 18 years. So hopefully I'll be able to give some insights. Uh, let me just share my slides. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, my talk is on uh, scope of 3D printing post COVID era. What we decided to do is um, we, we, wa we, share, we want to share our experience. We are a 3D printing um, uh, supporting orthopedics. And, you know, last six months, we have had an opportunity to actually support orthopedic surgeons across India, uh, especially during the COVID times and how we were able to do that. So we've, what we have done is we picked the three examples that we'll kind of share, uh, we want to share and, and uh, talk about. So and then th these are three different areas that we want to talk about. One is a 3D model and how a 3D model was created for an acetabular fracture. Another is, uh, um, that one was in Chennai. You know, the other one was on the surgical guides and how, you know, for uh, shoulder, reverse shoulder arthroplasty, you can use these guides to accurately position your glenoid uh, component. Uh, and the third one is uh, on the customized implant, uh, 3D printed implant. Um, so hopefully this will give you an opportunity to kind of see how you can leverage some of these technologies and uh, and actually help you in your day to day, uh, especially post COVID era. Uh, so in the acetabular fracture example, you know the patient um, had a uh, during the COVID time, 84 year old uh, female um, a surgeon was quarantined, so there was uh, not much we could do. We we were able to get a CT scan of the patient. We were able to create a 3D model of that patient. So once we had uh, you know this 3D model, like Dr. Bahuk said, you know image processing. Uh, is still not there yet. So we had to, you know, we use uh, these uh, FDA approved software for segmentation and creating a 3D model. Once that 3D model was created, we shared that 3D model with the surgeon um, uh, to understand so that they can understand how exactly the fractures are in what directions. Um, the model was not enough. The virtual model was not enough. So we actually go went ahead and um, printed a physical model, you know, uh, wherein we, we were able to send the surgeon that physical model so that he can plan the surgery, he can, you know, place it, he can, you know, uh, use this model to create a, a pre-bend plate and things like that. Once that was done, and this was done all while he was sitting at home. Um, one of the things we, we 
we were able to leverage was um, to use local uh, local 3d printing services so that we are not spending too much time on shipping and all especially you know we this is another thing we learned that um, the whole local concept is going to work in the long run because you know in fact one of our uh, partners in mumbai were in quarantine region so they could not even manufacture the part that we wanted to so this kind of helped us uh, change our plan and we started now manufacturing these parts very near to the surgeon so that it can be delivered right away um, another example is on the glenoid axis guide you know reverse shoulder arthroplasty fractured um, uh, scapula 62 year female uh, again ct scan was done we created a virtual model uh, so here's an example of a virtual model you can see how the uh, <clears throat> the glenoid uh, surface is is uh, fairly shattered uh, we were able to plan the surgery virtually um, look at everything work with the surgeon to identify the exact axis in which we want to uh, do the plan and uh, execute it so for the execution we were again you know able to print it locally um, in this is uh, this is a case in delhi so we we printed locally in delhi provided this uh, in in one business day and then you know using these autoclavable parts the surgeon was able to you know place this uh, use this in the surgery to identify the location and kind of uh, pinpoint the axis where exactly um, that axis could be so here's an, a small video that kind of shows the positioning of the guide and then uh, and then drilling it right there Okay, and then the third one, which is more on the customized implant side, especially with uh, you know advent of three D printing and uh, metal three D printing. Now we are able to actually uh, print uh, an implant that is customized for that patient. So here's another example. This was a case uh, in Baroda in Gujarat, uh, a failed fracture of a talus, uh, male, thirty five years old. Uh, again, we started with a virtual model. What we did was once we had the virtual model, we mirrored the other side, which was a good side, and then. Once that uh, mirrored model was uh, was again 3D printed, um, in this case also the surgeon was uh, quarantined at home, so we were able to deliver these models and the uh, different sizes of the implant uh, talus implant component that um, he wanted to look at. So we created about six different sizes, you know, small, medium, large, you know, extra large and extra small. And then he was able to plan um, even the ligament attachment and how we wanted to do. Um, we, we, we continued to send him models and then we would have a video call to kind of uh, plan the surgery while he was at home. Um, once that was done, once he approved the design, we were able to um, manufacture this in a medical certified facility, um, a, a 3D printed titanium implant for TELUS. Um, <clears throat> so here's an example of how, you know, that, uh, that titanium implant was being, uh, be, being manufactured here. Um, so these are the <clears throat> these are the models. We ended up having three different sizes, so that intraoperatively the surgeon has an option of choosing which size uh, he or she, he wants to use. Um, and then uh, yeah, those were you know post process made ready for the surgery. And these are some pictures kind of in the surgery to show you. You know we we had a trial component. We had the final implant. Um, these are some ligament attachments that uh, he used. Um, and yeah, so this is the post op uh, video that kind of shows how how this is. What is what is fascinating for us is you know our ability to mirror the good side of the ankle and you can see the um, you can see the contours here and it's fascinating that you know that the contours really match well with the with the patient and this is hopefully what uh, what helps with in terms of having a patient specific implants and and allowing to have a, a better outcomes in the long run um, how does this work as a process? Um, so just a quick overview of uh, the way it works is um, typically a CT scans are taken. Um, it needs to be one millimeter slice. I think that's the most important piece is as long as you, are, you have a one millimeter slice thickness CT scans, um, we are able to take that in and uh, provide the, the, uh, the 3D models. Those get uh, uploaded to platforms like mysegmenter.com wherein you know, this data gets uh, received post-processed, uh, visualized, and then um, you, know, you can see the entire traceability of uh, printing as well as delivered uh, autoclavable parts in the surgery. Um, these are some examples of you know, now the advanced, uh, advanced these platforms allow urgent communication as well. You know, before you used to have these physical models and kind of mark that and you know, talk to the engineers. You know, with these kind of digital platforms, it allows us to also kind of communicate with surgeons on what exactly um, they are looking for so that uh, while they are at home, they are able to have these, um, these uh, communication details uh, that help us kind of move forward uh, and get their feedback whenever they are free, not, uh, you know, as 
especially in these covid times it becomes very difficult to to get their physical time and actually meeting them physically so we have we have moved more towards the digital platform wherein you can we can communicate through these platforms um this is kind of the network or how how things work um the surgeon and the you know the hospital staff uploads the ct scans um the surgeon is able to look at the 3d model on their phone or on their computer uh, of course they are also able to use the guides and the models or even an implant in the surgery um the patients the link is open so the patients uh, we we were able to incorporate like a, a payment portal so that the patient is actually making the payment through the same portal and then the 3d printing service bureaus who are locally there near the surgeon is able to print it quickly and then deliver it as soon as uh, as soon as the, they can uh, so in conclusion you know the 3d printing technologies are here to stay especially with covid era um, especially when you have complex surgeries and it actually does help uh, surgeons uh, plan and execute with confidence um, especially you know whether it's uh, anatomical models uh, surgical guides or uh, customized implants with that i want to thank you um, and uh, over to you uh, dr pankaj uh, thank you ketan that was really a uh, very useful talk and insight into 3d printing 3d printing as we already know it has found a place in clinical uh, delivery of healthcare and orthopedic care so i mean uh, and i can see dr shekhar has joined us so dr shekhar do you have any uh, comment to make or question for ketan hi mit hi uh, i joined just now so uh... i won't be able to make any comments so last uh, uh, so i can see dr shekhar agarwal also there Let's see is he there or not okay uh, okay uh, i have a question for uh, uh, ketan yes uh, see uh, 3d printing has a lot of applications in tumors trauma and uh, the the specialty that i practice is uh, uh, arthroplasty joint replacement so in a revision case scenario uh, we do find that in case we have a lot of uh, input from technology like 3d printing so can you tell us uh, can you can you uh, take the implant which is already there out of the uh, planning and you just can give a accurate 3d model of the bone is that possible with the current uh, technology that we have yes sir yes sir so it is uh, even though it is a cumbersome work we can do it in fact we have had uh, one case in ahmedabad and chennai where it was a revision hip case where you know the patient's screws were all over the place so we were able to identify those implant components that were floating inside the patient in 3d model as well as provide the you know whatever the bone loss that was there what is what is finally available to the surgeon and then a lot of times you know we don't promote customized implants a lot of times you know you already have standard implants that are available for revision surgery that you could use so we support those things you know we, what we believe is preoperative planning you know better visualization once you have better visualization once you have better planning then you are able to execute it a little better uh, but yeah absolutely uh, it is possible it does take time because Uh, because of the metal the scatter marks and hopefully like dr exactly. bhavuk gar said you know because of the scatter marks it's a very manual process where we have uh, basically biomedical en engineers who are specialists in imaging who are able to identify the difference between what is a scatter and what is actually a bone so once that is done then the 3d part uh, becomes uh, pretty straight forward but yeah it's it is it is very much possible today okay yeah and another important uh, aspect of 3d printing would be the cost because that is the commonest question that is being asked so what is can you give us an idea what is the tentative uh, uh, what range uh, one could expect the cost to be in like uh, for a pelvic model or for a shoulder model yes sir so what we have done is uh, um we we have done a, like an entire tiered approach so you know we have uh, dr you know guys like dr lalit maini who are uh, kind of the godfathers of the 3d printing um so what we have done is we we have created if you are interested in printing yourself then you can today you can buy a 3d printer for 20000 rupees for, on amazon so you can buy have your own 3D printer for twenty thousand rupees, and then the service we provide is a um, basically a, a a file or a patient's uh, 3D model uh, STL file, what they call it as a digital file. So what we have done is the one of the first tier is okay. You know, if you have your own printer, we can give you a digital file which can cost say anywhere from five thousand rupees to twenty uh, thousand rupees, depending on the complexity. So that is just the file part. Okay. Then if yeah, you want to get it printed, it's more like you know thirty forty thousand. <throat> if it's an implant, it goes to one or two lakh rupees, depending oh, yes. on the I size. I think that 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 answers the question. Okay, I think we can move forward now. Uh, thank you, Ketan. Uh, may I invite Dr. Chabra to speak on? 
the role of robots on uh, spine, in spine surgery dr chabra please yeah i hope you can see my screen yes yes we can yeah thanks um, bhavuk has made my task easy by talking about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning um at one point of time it was thought that humans have intelligence and that's why they are superior to machines but then came uh, artificial intelligence machine learning and deep learning uh, bhavuk has talked about them and uh, this has enabled the computers to evolve a new path towards human intelligence and uh, what uh, was revolutionary, revolutionary was when the computer defeated the world chess champion right and in 1997 um the history of use of robots in uh, surgery dates back from 1985 when the first robotic surgery was performed uh, to obtain a brain biopsy since then it has gradually evolved and uh, 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 till 2016 over half of prostatectomies and a third of hysterectomies were performed robotically in the USA and in 2019 over 5000 da vinci surgical systems were installed worldwide and 6 million surgeries were done globally uh, with the regard to spine there has been an increase in incidence of spine surgeries and also increase in inc incidence of instrumentation surgeries and revision surgeries and we are we know that uh, minimally invasive sur spine surgeries are uh, the state of the art now uh, and with more and more complex uh, spine surgeries being uh, done there has been an increase in complication rate and there has also been an increase in radiation so people try to find out ways and means to reduce the complication rate and the radiation rate and here is where the robotics came in particularly handy um, so it was adopted more slowly in spine surgery than in other surgical disciplines primarily due to the difficulty of accessing and visualizing critical structures through small closed working channels but ever since it was introduced in the 1990 with better understanding of spine biomechanics more sophisticated instrumentation and refined technique it has gradually evolved so as we mentioned the first reported three dimensional surgical navigation for spine surgery was by nolte in 1995 but now they have evolved to uh, quite an advanced stage of robotic spine surgery let's see how it works you can do a pre operative planning at your leisure and uh, um, over a sip of coffee the day before or in your um, office you can um uh, do mark the region of interest uh, position the screws and or trajectories plan the route and then the surgical plan is reported and exported and during the surgery in the theater the intraoperative workflow enables the surgeon to execute what has been planned at convenience before so this is the beauty of robotic surgery in a step one you affix the surgical system Uh, to the bony anatomy in the step 2 you define a safe work volume uh, in which the surgical arm should move uh, then you draw spine in which the surgeon marks the segment currently being operated upon uh, then two clear fluoroscopic images of the spine ap and oblique are required the system software matches the two fluoroscopic images with the pre operative ct study of the current patient and registers each vertebral body position in related uh, in relation to the surgical arm position and then uh, for each preplanned drilling site the robo accurately sends the surgical arm to the position in the surgical field according to the surgical plan and drilling of the spine is commenced through the arm guide position and then you have additional feature where you can use navigation to see real time where your implants and instruments are going and that gives an enhanced confidence to the surgeon that you are in the safe zone there have been enough uh, published evidence about the accuracy uh, that comes in with uh, uh, robots 
and it has improved accuracy by 70%. So you can achieve almost a 99% accuracy. It had reduced X-ray radiation by 50 to 70%. It has reduced complication rates by 48% and reduced reoperation rates by 46%. Our review of literature also um, uh, confirmed these findings. Let's see how we have used uh, the robo to our benefit in complicated cases. You can see this cervical uh, thoracic kyphotic deformity, almost 90 degrees kyphotic deformity. The patient had tubercular spine was treated elsewhere, operated upon, the implants had to be removed because there was infection. And you can see the severe kyphotic deformity, the destruction of the vertebra, and uh, you can see how the cord is getting impinged upon. The patient had progressive neurological deficit when she came to us. So we did a stage surgery, applied a halo gravity traction. In the next step, did a corpectomy and then applied a halo pelvic device and distracted her while she was awake to gradually correct the deformity and then did a def uh, robotic assist assisted definitive surgery and the results were good and the patient recovered very well. Uh, in deformities, which are again very complicated surgeries, uh, you can achieve good results using robotic surgery. As you can see in this case, the results were quite good. Another case of deformity with good results and minimally invasive spine surgery you can have it like a conveyor belt phenomenon where you can reduce the surgical time substantially by robotic guidance. So you can plan, simulate surgical outcome, achieve drill trajectory, assist in putting screw, and you can do both MIS and open procedures. But you, what you can't do now and what is a possibility and a potential is to assess the decompression, rod alignment, fusion, rod placement, and difficult approaches. So what we expect in future is that it should be able to, software should be able to plan the instrumentation by itself. And rather than the CT, you could use MRI for the planning, minimizing the radiation exposure, uh, provide a rod which is automatically bent as per the planned contour, contour and integrate the existing OR devices such as power drills, et cetera, with the robotic system. And... Uh, when you have to do front and back surgery with robots, you can do a, a single position surgery, which is gradually evolving in this time. The surgical robots in use today are remote control devices operated by surgeons. The robots don't control the scalpel, the surgeon does. Technology is still a long way from delivering autonomous surgical robots. But then many, there have been the question, will robots take over surgeons? Many experts believe it will be, it will. Like this 2017 study from MIT showed that an artificial intelligence system was at least equal, if not better than radiologists at reading mammograms for high-risk cancer lesions needing surgery. Exactly a year later, JAMA reported Google study, which showed that computers are similar to ophthalmologists at examining retinal images of diabetics. And then, Subsequently, computer-controlled robots have performed intestinal surgery successfully on a pig. While the robot took longer than a human, its sutures were much better, more precise and uniform, with fewer chances for breakage, leakage, and infection. So there are experts who believe that robot doctors will definitely replace surgeons. However, others feel that there are challenges regard to perception and manipulation. Jobs that involve understanding subtle visual cues and fine manipulation of objects, both key skills for surgeons and which are extremely difficult for AI to master. And they feel that it will take time before these are mastered. Machine learning deals best with a predictable world. As soon as you try to cross the divide between the digital world and the messy analog world, machine learning does less well. Surgery you know, is an extreme example of this messy world and interpreting from a camera image what is going on in soft tissue is hard enough for people and harder still for the machine. Again, AI is only as good as the humans programming it and the system in which it operates. And it is dependent on data. With, and like for other computing, garbage in results in garbage out. And there is a major concern about the data which is available right now. 
and uh, will this improve with robotics it will only it may compromise results that is the fear the machines do not and cannot verify the accuracy of the underlying data uh, they are given rather they assume the data are perfectly accurate reflect high quality and are representative of optimal care and outcomes thus uh, many experts believe that it may not the the robots may not ultimately serve them so the world is divided in this regard even if people who believe that uh, it is possible how long will it take for robots to replace surgeons uh, the general view amongst the ai experts is that it will take at least half a century if not a whole century if it is possible so we don't need to lose too much sleep uh, in this regard right now at least a couple of generations are safe but does that mean safety the experts may be divided on whether robots will replace surgeons but ultimately <coughs> it is the patient's benefit that we have in mind and it is definite and there is a consensus that both are very useful partners so robotic assisted surgery is here to stay and we should make use of this uh, wonderful technology so that we can keep pace with technology and gradually as the potential evolves we will be in touch with it thank you thank you for your patience uh, thank you dr chabra uh, rightly said that robots can uh, replace surgeons but on a lighter note there is certainly one thing that they can't do and that is get sued in the courts is that correct <laughs> <laughs> that's true for, right. for that you will need for that you will need surgeons <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, again robotic surgery will be the in the name of a surgeon so it will be the surgeon who will be exactly. uh, sued because uh, he decided that the patient be put to the surgery yeah, through the robot absolutely, absolutely. wonderful talk sir uh, dr shekhar agrawal uh, welcome yeah. to the uh, uh, thank okay. you and, uh, please uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, any comment to make on the talks that no i think robotic surgery it's taking a little time at least in the joint replacement field uh, though there are some centers doing it but i think they are specific and uh, whatever data is coming out is not showing any superior results uh, to conventional surgery so there we go on the on the but i'm sure it's going to improve upon time and uh, we will have uh, better robotics to uh, give more precise surgery See, at the, on the other side, there is a constant uh, debate between mechanical alignment and kinematic alignment. And kinematic alignment can vary from patient to patient. And is a robot going to depend on mechanical alignment or kinematic alignment is hard to say. Right. Okay, I think uh, it's time to move on to the next speaker. Uh, welcome, Dr. Amish Sen uh, to DOA and uh, DOA Con. So uh, he's going to speak on uh, another interesting topic, role of uh, bioabsorbable implants. over to you sir okay thank you so very good afternoon and when we are talking about this uh, new technologies uh, we are talking about emerging bio absorbable as such we understand that these are kind of the ghosts which we are likely to put them and they are likely to melt away and technically speaking these, these were prioritized long back as sutures we all know about it then they came staples clips many things came as bio absorbable and what is the basic importance is that they are likely to give a reasonable amount of stability they cannot be very very secure but a reasonable amount and their degradation or their solution has to go along with the fracture healing and by the time we have to have that level in which the fracture has healed and they should subsequently dissolve out and we have many varieties from plates to screws to anchors many of these things are available and are getting available they can be natural based out of which we know about collagen fibrin gel or chitosan or they may be synthetic for which we have got a big variety available and many of these you can see are useful in orthopedic surgery of specific names now what has been observed that osteocytes can be cultivated on these polymers so they do are as they do show kind of a safety also if you look in the pictures around whenever they are there their growth is reasonably good as compared to the other surfaces the second question comes their stability or their ability to hold as far as bone to bone fixation is they definitely metal screws are better off 
but what is the strength required in a bony say they say the biodegradable screw can also provide that level of mechanical stability second is interference fit meaning by getting into a kind of a bone or of a ligament again it has been observed in this study that there is not much of the significant difference between a metal like screw interface or a polymer screw interface as such second group is ceramics which has been used as observable these could be hydroxyapatite could be tricalcium phosphate we all know problem with them is that mechanically they are very weak so they are more likely to be filling the cavities and cyst rather than to be a screw but if you combine ceramics with polymers it has been found that they have got highest densification and their compressive strength is quite quite good and that is one of the areas where things are moving on another thing which has been seen that again coming over to that natural uh, polymer chitosan and if you combined with the ceramic again we have got a very high quality absorbable material available with a very high mechanical strength now moving further from ceramics right now is the metals people tried using iron but it was not suitable they tried using zinc it has also low rigidity and deformability it was more as a alloying element rather than the primary but in comparison magnesium showed good biocompatibility favorite biomechanical properties and ability to support the bone fracture and there has been a lot of work if you look at these reviews lot of uh, animal work lot of experimental work has gone to prove these things and these magnesium based absorbable screws their degradation did not interfere with the fracture healing they had an excellent results here you can see them on the capitulum on the side of it the fixation screw then their uh, kind of a further uh, augmentation as a component they have shown a reasonable amount of uh, the degradation also if you see on the slide the kind of a screw which are there the side of screw they are there and subsequently they tend to melt away they tend to become disappear in the fibula here on the right side of the x rays another paper in last two years reported that if you take these screws with the biodegradable magnesium compression screws there was no failure fracture the healing was very well and there was no interference with the union as such so they are seen to be an appropriate candidate is magnesium screws and their components then further zinc tungsten carbide nano composite which was found to be still better in a kind of a situation as a kind of a graft so now they have been seen that these are good they can dilute away they are eventually excreted by urine or by feces and they are helpful in the subsequent some of their element is helpful in the formation of the hydroxyapatite in the bone itself regarding the use of these in plant they have rapid corrosion rate about that was one thing which was able to found so now it has been observed that for the corrosion you can have the hybrid coating on them and their quality can still become better in this kind of a situation another metal tried is strontium strontium impregnated by absorbables and they find they also have a good osteo integration especially in an osteoporotic bone so they could be good in that kind of a condition another new thing which came up is the black phosphorus it is just this year the publication says it also has got a very good optical and mechanical property and work is going on more for this black phosphorus in plants now what are the uses we are looking for definitely we are they have been there as films which you tend to put in a heterotopic ossification which you put as kind of a wound dressing which you put in the area as a kind of a prevention of adhesion between the bones they have been used as threads also to get the fixation of the bones using a thread this is another area which has developed then they as a glue also we know there has been a lot of use of glues at many places other in uh, but here gluing of the nerve as well as a kind of a delivering of the neurotrophin inside his one area which is being worked upon this area then as a scaffold meaning by to take away a kind of a uh, cover up for the cells to hold for the biological things to hold or to tendon repair surgeries they have been used as an adhesive for the bone fragments another very interesting we have been uh, looking for or maybe we had sometime i remember about 15 years ago some company from america had come up that they are likely to provide us material for research was this biodegradable adhesives also 
the work is still going on and this is 2019 paper they say now we are nearing that uh, research to get this kind of a situations we all know we have all probably used these poly pins or uh, from the one of the co companies over here which we used to use and they have got a very good purchase of the fragment in the small osteochondral fragment in children where you do not want to have more metals inside it there are screws also which has been used as a kind of uh, fixation along with the braided polyester suture is another area. There are plates also. If you remember, we had these plates available with us even 15 years back also. There were issues, I'll talk later, but these plates were also available and they are now being looked at another area where there is not much of the stress. And these non-stress areas, again, these screws, especially for these osteochondral fragments have been there for the chondral trauma these uh, biodegradable things uh, have been used and for the anchoring into these tendons these pgla tcp all those ceramic to be polymer combined screws or these uh, degradable stunts have been used for these reconstruction so there are many areas where the de degradable or bioabsorbables are being used for for those osteochondral injuries where you do not want to put metal into this area or on the calcaneum fracture so these are the, this is the paper where you have used a plate also by kind of a stripping of that polymer and dividing it over and giving a kind of a purchase to that in area or for the another fractures also which are degradable screws which has been used. Then implant spine also. I was interested to see these spine cases also where the biosabular magnesium PCL cage has been used and this is the study which say it could be useful as a cage. Then biotics, another area is taking up antibiotics or growth factors along with and putting them into that kind of an area is the another area. They do not have their own antimicrobial uh, property, but they can be used to carry over those antibiotics. And as an antibiotic delivery vehicle also, if you coat and screw, and if you contain that screw and the screw has got that antibiotic, they have been found to be effective. And this is quite an old study. But as a drug delivery also, this has been found to be suitable for long lasting. Now you see here, it the dilution and subsequent delivery can go to 350 days to a year even. So in those situations where you want to give for just like in osteomyelitis case, for a very, very long period of antibiotics, this is one area which is there. They're all recent papers. And this, uh, this is another paper, which is Indian paper in the release of profile display drug levels, continuing up to two months. This is the older thing. And these things are already available with us. But this is all not rosy with them. If you look at it, the kind of issues, osteolysis as an issue has been reported. And there's a big story about it. It was in 2000, the things came up. Even in the spine also, there were papers which said, no, it causes a lot of osteolysis, 44%. They did have that problem seen with these cases. And another area, implant failure, screw breakage, these were all reported in some of the areas where they were used. And in the clavicle, they said they fixed, they could fix the clavicle, but they could not manage to hold that alignment which was there at the surgery time and post-surgery during the healing the fixation had failed and they had given way. And this is our own experience also way back about 15 years ago when these came from one of the companies. The left side you see, these are the conventional implant and the right side you see the biodegradables which we used at that stage. Some cases did very well. We had a very excellent radiological picture because we were not seeing any metal and the fracture was appropriately stabilized also. But the problem which was coming, they showed excessive discharge post-operatively. This discharge was bad for this patient where we did the fixation. It was a between three kind of an injury, though the, the surgery was, but we understood the area of mechanical stress where we put simple metallic screw. But in the head reconstruction, we put these degradable screws, but they gave a lot of irritation, a lot of fluid. And we did complain to the company also about these things which we were observing in these screws, but definitely they had a problem and we had to take it out. The implant failures, because they uh, uh, demonstrated some efficacies, but they did not really fulfill the total. This, this is the last year perception. So what is happening? We may have a use where the metallic devices are problematic, maybe in a pediatric situations, maybe specific situations. But if you know the history, because in 95, 96, there, it was, they were much more proposed by a specific Helsinki group of people 
there was a lot of literature which came in support of these devices and later it was found it out it was more a market driven uh, work in the publication that stage subsequently those things we also suffered all those problems with our patients subsequently these things were taken back and now but that does not mean the research is coming up it is coming up again in a proper scientific way now we have got make in india campaign also where in india we have got these biodegradables available now these are available and we feel that within proper area where it's not much loaded till the time we do not have very new things coming up which are proved by just like magnesium screws or which might have a better strength also there <laughs> we still be use where we can avoid a second surgery we can see a good post operative picture where we don't see any implants we don't have to take these implants they should remain biocompatible and in those areas especially these days going across for the um, flights also the metal sensors are not likely to make an issue and uh, they can be the patients can be comfortable while undergoing short wave diathermy microwave diathermy so these are still the benefits which we can look for and maybe in the future we get much better quality of these biodegradables or bioabsorber and we can have a better future thank you thank you thank you sir any questions or comments from the panelists <laughs> Rishika, you want to ask anything? No, these biodegradable implants uh, are not good for any weight-bearing bones. They may be all right for smaller bones, uh, but mostly they are used for antibiotic delivery or as <clears throat> osteotomies and things like that. But uh, uh, I think as fracture fixation, they've still got a long way to go. Yes. That's, that's One area where the uh, yes, yes, please, Doctor Sen. And yeah, this is what I'm saying. Dr. Shekhar has rightly said it out that we are still evolving in these areas, and maybe in the years to come, we might have better documented and better kind of a stable and more stronger implants available. But right now, we are in that transition stage for that. Yes. So uh, one mm -hmm. one area where these bio implants they have found a definitive place is the sports uh, injury reconstruction. Yes. So in all the ligament reconstruction, it is now a uh, standard of care to use bio implant. uh the same cannot be said about the anchors but yes bio screws for acl pcl and other ligament reconstruction they uh, are supposed to be and they have been given uh, giving given very good results without any significant complication like osteolysis etc and another advantage as i have rightly said they do they don't show on an x ray so i am very happy using that uh, because the patients are very happy not to see any metal in their bones Yeah, with that, thank you very much, Dr. Sen. Uh, may I invite the next speaker, uh, Rehan, uh, to speak on uh, implants which are infection resistant? I think uh, that is an interesting talk. I'm looking forward to. How are you, Rehan? I'm fine, Dr. Amete. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, yeah, please. Am I audible to everybody? Yes, yes, yes. Over to you. First and foremost, thank you very much, Dewe, for inviting me for this lecture on infection resistant implants. Although I am joining you all from bhopal but i think i am a part and parcel of delhi and i am there as a in house faculty so basically uh, the things that i'm going to talk of today are this is a disclaimer i want to put the science and the clinical use of infection resistant implants is actually in its nascent phase like all of you i have limited experience of their use and efficacy like most of us we have used antibiotic loaded cement spacers we have used antibiotic coated nails most of you must be familiar with the gentamicin coated nails which have come in the market but a lot of research has gone into the newer sort of technology which is coming up in this field and i will be talking based on an extensive review of literature on this subject so basically four important points i'm going to cover one is the basic science behind implant related infections strategies to make implant infection resistant most importantly what is available as a surgeon research is all right but my primary concern is what is available on the shelf which which i can use and last but not the least the advantages and limitations of what is available so if we go to the basic science i think uh, from the day we join our post graduation we are always talking of the biofilm and very briefly from a clinical point of view the biofilm is nothing but the moment you put an implant inside the body there is a race between the host cells and the bacteria and this race has been called the race to the surface if the host cells win 
and they form a layer onto the implant surface, the implant is safe. However, if the bacteria will form a layer, a biofilm is formed and that is the key problem in all implant infections because the moment you have a biofilm sort of a thing formed here, neither your antibiotics which are represented here, neither your macrophages or the antibodies which are being produced by the human being against these bacteria will penetrate the biofilm and therefore the, if the biofilm is there, the chances are that implant infection would be very high. So although five stages of biofilm formation have been described, the reversible binding, the irreversible binding, colonization, maturation, and finally dispersion. As practicing orthopedic surgeons, we need to understand that this whole process is a very fast process. It completes itself within 18 to 36 hours. And the only reversible phase of this is the stage one. Therefore, if you want to have an implant which is resistant to antibiotics, you have to create a surface, an implant surface, which has the properties of not going in for this phase one. That means you have to somehow reverse the stage one. If you can take control of stage one, all things are mostly sorted out for you. So basically there are three strategies which have come up. The first strategy is the passive surface finishing. That means this is a non-pharmacological method. What you are trying to do is you are trying to create a surface which will automatically repel the bacteria. Therefore, once the stage one is not happening, you are in safe hands. The second, which is more promising for which more clinical results are there, is that you create an implant surface which is either impregnated with antibiotics, antiseptics, metal ions, of which silver is most promising, or any other ion, and very recently iodine. So once you coat it, not only does it prevent the bacteria from lodging onto the surface, what it also does is a sort of a contact killing. So the moment the bacteria comes in contact, it is actually killed, and therefore a biofilm is prevented. And last but not the least, this is our gold standard sort of thing, which we all use the antibiotic uh, beads and the antibiotic cement. So this is something like a perioperative antibacterial local coating. You have done a coating and this coating is not only bactericidal, but it also prevents bacteria from forming a biofilm. So these are the strategies. The question is what is available for us in the market? Like I told you, the non-pharmacological methods a lot of research has gone into it, but they are still in the preclinical phase. What is available to us is mainly from the pharmacological materials which have been put up on an implant. The most promising of which is the gentamicin loaded nails which have recently come up in the market. They are available for the tibia. They are also available for the femur, but they have their own advantages. For example, 80% of the antibiotic is released within the first 48 hours. And like I was saying in the basic science, the biofilm forms within this period of time. So if you can take care of not the biofilm forming, you are in safe hands. The limitation is if you have a bacteria which is already resistant to gentamicin, there is no other choice because as of today in the market, we only have gentamicin. Again, from the pharmaceutical point of view, Silver iron coating is something which has come up. The advantage is these cations not only are bactericidal, but they also prevent bacterial adhesion onto the surface, especially useful for tumor surgeries because in a tumor patient, the patient is already immunocompromised. And because the patient is immunocompromised, he has high chances of infection, a biofilm forming and the whole surgery failing. So if you have something like a silver iron coating, it probably helps in some ways and prevents the implant from getting infected. Again, silver coatings come with their own limitations. There is a toxicity of the silver ions. There is harm at the distant site, not only at the local site, but at the distant site, the ions can be of failure and dry. Lastly, you cannot completely coat the implant. So because the implant is only partially coated with the silver ions, the biofilm can actually form at some sites. 
I was talking about iodine. So this is a concept which has recently come up. We all know iodine. It has been with surgeons for so many years. We use it for painting and draping. And for all our previously, we used to do it for wound lavages also. So iodine impregnated implants have come up in the market. And the, the good thing about these is that there is extensive preclinical as well as excellent clinical efficacy of the iodine coated implants especially for the titanium alloys. So I personally feel that this is one of the very promising implants, which is the way forward and probably are going to come in the market in a much bigger way in the very short near future. However, again, the problem is that the long-term effects of the local application of iodine is still not known. And except for titanium dioxide, the use of iodine with a uh, say stainless steel and other sort of implants is not known. And this is uh, the last one which I would like to talk uh, is the perioperative antibacterial local coating. We already know about it. We talked of the non-biodegradable, which is the, uh, the bone cement. But a lot of companies have come up with some sort of a hydrogel. So this gel can be mixed with an antibiotic and then it can be put onto the implant. The propriority one has come up from Italy, which is called the DAC system, the defensive antibacterial coating. The advantage is you can put in, unlike the gentamicin nails, here you can put in any antibiotic that you want. The amount of drug that is released is almost 100 to 1000 times more than the MIC, which is needed to, to be bactericidal. So actually there is very good chances that no biofilm will be formed and the implant will be resistant to any infection. However, clinical trials to this is only in case of primary and revision joint arthroplasty. I think some of the panel panelists would be better aware of this and only for closed fractures. So there is limited literature about use of the DAC technique in the open fractures technique. And again, like anything which is new, there is limited data for long-term follow-up. So I think my only take home message from this talk is that prevention and development of the biofilm is the key to, to developing infection resistant implants. There are three promising techniques. One are non-pharmacological methods that is passive surface finishing. Then there are pharmacological methods which are most promising, which I have three or four things which I have discussed. And last the perioperative antibacterial local coating which we all have been doing. So gentamicin, silver iron, iodine, and hydrogel coating are those available in the market. But the, I think uh, in the future, we'll have more options. Thank you. Thank you, Rehan. Uh, that was really interesting. Any questions or comments? We can carry on. Okay. Okay, thank you, Rehan. Uh, now, uh, the next uh, and the last talk would be by Dr. Maninder on gate, uh, uh, gate analysis of gate and uh, let me just... Okay, over to Maninder. You can tell about your topic. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the UA and Dr. Dhananjay for the kind invitation for talking today uh, and for giving me this topic. Uh, the topic that I've been given to talk on is gate analysis the future of assessment of implants, surgeries, and patient outcomes. So I'll try to do justice to this. And we have a really great series of futuristic orthopedic talks and uh, has made you know a lot of overlap with what I'm going to say, uh, especially Dr. Bhavuk's talk on AI. So, uh, so um, what's a normal orthopedic surgeon's perception of a gait analysis? That it is boring, isn't it? We're not really interested in doing any gait analysis, majority of time. Yes, so it's oh, comes from time consuming... It requires trained personnel. Uh, it is difficult to interpret for the normal orthopedic surgeon. And the data is more useful for research and not for clinical purposes. So we try to debunk those perceptions. Uh, and that does not really need to be the case. So first of all, I'm just going to talk about the basics of what uh, the types of data analysis are and how we can use them in our daily orthopedic practice to improve our outcomes uh, and to assess our patients, uh, sort of uh, the progress and the analysis of their gait patterns and their recovery from surgery. 
So the first, the, the, in injury to this year, this uh, excellent paper has been published, which tells us about the different uh, types of gait analysis that are there. The first is pedobarography, which is pressure measurement. The second is marker-based, which is the most common gait analysis. The third one is very exciting, which is the marker-less gait analysis. And the fourth one, which uh, is the variable system, so different sensors all over across the body to assess our gait patterns. So what is the first one is a pedobarography. So that's basically essentially a plantar pressure measurement, and that can be in the form of a platform system where the patient stands on a specific platform, a pressure sensing platform, or uh, and that platform can be as small as like uh, half a square feet, or it can be a long platform with pressure force plates. Uh, or the other one, which is a very in exciting one, upcoming in a big way, is the insole system, which is measuring the whole of the pressures on a real-time basis while the patient is walking on it. So the sensors are all inbuilt into the insoles and the, even the, it is battery operated with the battery incorporated into the insole. So it is, a, a, it is a portable system which a patient can wear while even, so it's a dynamic, more dynamic system and it can allow us to measure the pressure while the patient is walking on different terrains. So uh, there's two types of pedagogy. One is the maximum pressure picture which assesses the total maximum pressure on any point or pixel and the other one is the pressure time integrated system, which is basically tells us the time of how much pressure is put on a certain point, which is more relevant, more for diabetic feet. So what are the applications of pedobiography? So first one is sports is prevention of overuse injuries to assess the foot pattern of a specific athlete or a professional athlete and look at where you could do more padding in his footwear or modify his footwear to prevent overuse injuries, especially stress fractures, uh, deformity correction, uh, pre and post surgical. So this is basically any uh, analysis of uh, di different foot deformities like calf valgus or uh, uh, heel valgus deformities, flat foot to look at whether we've actually improved the pressure post off and then diabetic foot is to prevention and treatment pressure also. So this study in International Office 2018 assessed uh, 27 patients with a variable insole uh, pressure monitor and they found that, you know, the uh, the, they found that the census would evaluate specific patterns which were associated with a poor prognosis, and those patients with early intervention did better than ones which did not. So it is an important thing to identify these patterns early, and we can do that now. The next one is the marker-based gait analysis, which is the most common gait analysis that we have. It is basically has skin markers attached to different anatomical landmarks, basically it's the bony landmarks, and then we have motion tracking systems, optical systems, or other systems to track those sensors and tell us the joint movements in different planes, and we can measure walking speed, cadence, step, step length, or external joint movements, even joint power, muscle power can be assessed with these patterns. So this is something which we have in our uh, in-house in ISIC, basically. Uh, so this is skin marker based, and you can assess different joint patterns, uh, and even the movements of the specific joints with this pattern. So if you sort of uh, make the patient do certain jumps, so you can assess the different patterns that are there, and you can apply it to different orthoses that are there. So what are the applications of marker-based gait analysis? The most common indication in orthopedics at present is in surgical decision-making in uh, cerebral palsy children. So that is, is an area where these, this has really made a big mark and has uh, several studies have shown that uh, incorporation of gait analysis in, a, in the study allows us to change and modify our uh, treatment plans according to so these two studies have actually shown that you know the, the treatment plan was changed in the majority of times when a gate analysis was done versus when it was not done so again a very important mark but then in more uh, other applications uh, along with cerebral palsy is for post lower limb trauma pre and post arthroplasty uh, and deformity correction along with spinal indications like spinal deformity so these studies basically show that in a knee arthroplasty a normalized gait parameters analysis, it, it basically is closely related to the outcome measures that we do. So if we, instead of outcome measures, we can just have sensors which the patient can take home with them and we can take, you know, get data from them afterwards uh, according to how, what the rehab is going. Uh, so that's basically one of the op options of gate analysis, which is portable. And that is coming, you know, in the near future. Uh, and the gate analysis along with spinal disorders, again, basically sensors and gait analysis sensors with the patient can go home with. So the, the next one is a, a markerless motion capture. So this requires a camera or a 3D camera sort of system. It does not have any markers. Uh, 
and there's no trackers as such which you have to apply to the patient. It just senses the body position as, as it is, and then it allows the computer to analyze where the joint is and then make decisions depending on the AI, sorry, AI artificial intelligence and make sort of different graphs which, doesn't, which come out in real time as the patient is walking. So it's not cumbersome, it's very easy to use. This is one of the systems which we have in our, in our uh, in-house, uh, which is the Walker View, which allows, it's a basically a, a camera, a 3D camera based system, which the patient can have a big screen in front and he can actually get visual feedback as well, sort of so, uh, along with the physio who can monitor his progress. So it, this basically allows us to do guide gait analysis, even outcome measurement and training as well for the patient. So if we just to look at an example of a gait analysis, so this is a patient who's had a knee, knee arthroplasty surgery, and this is like two days after uh, the knee arthroplasty, and she's walking slowly, and you can see the different parameters that are there, which are coming uh, real time uh, to assess is basically the range of motion of the hip, the range of motion of the knee, uh, and you can see the, how the graph is very variable. Uh, so there's asymmetry in hip extension and inadequate knee flexion, so that is what we want to improve on. So the patient can be trained on this system, and then uh, it allows us to assess the actual movement real time. Uh, and so slight symmetry, so she basically tells us the velocity is slow, she has different vari variable left and right step variability and a short step length. All of this can be assessed just by the means of the camera, doesn't require any sensors. And if you see the pre and post, before and after uh, sort of uh, videos, so you can see that, you know, sort of she's walking faster, uh, and there is knee flexion. So you can see this is an, a graph of knee flexion which comes out in real time for you uh, and basically tells us the knee flexion has improved from where it was here, uh, quite low and very variable. Now it is coming to quite significant, simple knee flexion pattern uh, on both sides. So it tells us both the right and left sides. And then we can assess that. So, uh, and that gives us a basically an, a very objective view. And the, even the patient can see what, how he's doing uh, real time. So this is one of the, you know, uh, new uh, sort of gait analysis along with training, which is very useful for orthopedic sort of assessment as well as rehab. So, uh, so we can in measure all these parameters in how this is just a gentleman who's had a total hip arthroplasty, and then he's basically we can measure the same things along for him. Uh, so initially he may have inadequate hip extension, inadequate knee flexion, and then with training uh, as we as he goes. He, we can also measure actually the, the, the weight that he puts on, on each joint and the AI system can detect that uh, and the along, along, uh, along with the instability of the hip. So uh, after training, uh, the, the sort of, he starts to walk better, he starts to walk fast and then we can show the same picture pre and post to the patient at the same time and he can actually assess how he's doing. Uh, and that really gives us uh, sort of, you know, an, a, a gait analysis as well. So we can analyze all these parameters that we are actually improving the rehab. And this takes very little effort, actually, or, or, or very specific training with these systems. So all these systems are now, you know, sort of uh, very widely available now. And we can use these to assess our patient's rehab uh, uh, in our normal day-to-day -day practice with, without much of difficulty. And... Uh, the training includes virtual reality, which has been shown to have the increased biofeedback to the patient and reduce the amount of rehab that they require. So quicker recovery for the patients as well. And you can make the patient walk in different environments, like on a street or on an uneven surface. And you can make the, you know, make the different uh, variabilities inside the treadmill system. And the visual feedback again tells us, so if you see the patient without visual feedback with the camera, with the monitor switched off and with the monitor switched on, you see the side-to-side -side, uh, uh, swaying of the patient less with the biofeedback, with the visual feedback, which is available. So that gives us an idea that, you know, sort of the lateral flexion is reduces. And again, that's an important component of the uh, overall rehab. So it's an easy to understand output, both for the patient and to the surgeons, and does not require any complex calculations or a specific technician to do it. It's this minimal training required for the physios to operate this system and can be used for assessment and training both at the same time and incorporates virtual reality and AI machine learning. Now coming to machine learning in gait analysis, uh, it's been shown in various studies that machine learning or AI can assess the various gait patterns much more accurately than if we were to present it with a series of graphs, a human would do much, you know, a machine would do much better at assessing those gait patterns and telling us what is wrong than what a human could do. Uh, 
Uh, and again, it's accurate, more accurate, more reliable, and exactly simpler, much faster results, and we can get real-time results. So uh, all this enhances our ability to actually provide better care for our patients. So let's look at the first slide that we put up. An orthopedic surgeon's perception of a gait analysis is cumbersome, time-consuming. It's not. It requires trained personnel. It does not. It is difficult to interpret. It's not no, no longer the case. And the data is more useful for research and not for clinical purposes. No, again, that's not. We can use it daily with these helps from the systems that are now coming up. So what does the future hold? for gait analysis. So the future would incorporate a continuous assessment of gait by always on sensors, including EMG sensors on the body, which will tell us what exactly the body is doing. And we can have the sensors, patient wearing these sensors post-operatively post to allow us to assess from re remote locations how is rehab is going. A real-time <clears throat> correction of gait and posture is also possible with continuously adapting orthotics and insoles. So they can modify according to the way the patient this foot is landing incorrectly, they can modify the insole pressure or the position uh, in real time. And, and, then, and this is not far away. This is all coming up real soon. So thank you very much. I think that's it for my side. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maninda. Uh, any questions from the panel? Okay. I think uh, definitely gate analysis will have more role to play in the way we rehabilitate our patient or even uh, plan the surgical correction of some of the difficult gait patterns. So I think it has a definite role. The only uh, issue would be the availability of uh, uh, these uh, devices so that we can, if, if we can have a portable device in near future, I think uh, yeah. more and more orthopedic surgeons would be happy to incorporate that uh, analysis into their day-to-day -day practice. And these will be much more economical to use as well. Right? Yes, exactly. So I think uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, the eminent speakers and the DOA and my uh, uh, co-panelist, uh, uh, Dr. Shekhar Agarwal, who had to leave. And I don't see Dr. Yash Gulati, he couldn't join due to, and Dr. Mahishud, he couldn't join uh, the session, but thank you very much. So we sign off from here. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Amitai. Can we go to the next session? Uh, Dr. Shekhar, there are two talks before this session. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ravi? Dr. Ravi, are you here? Yes, sir. So, uh, just uh, uh, guide Dr. Shekhar. What are uh, there are two talks remaining now? Yeah, there are three talks. Uh, uh, Shekhar, sir, there are three talks are remaining of the last session. Okay. Uh, first talk is of Dr. Rajesh Malhotra. Dr. Bhavu mm -hmm. Garg will play the video of sir. Okay. And thereafter, followed by Dr. Manish Dhawan talk and thereafter, Dr. Dharanjay Gupta talk. Okay. So, we'll start our session after that? Uh, uh, no, before, before your session, sir. Okay. No, no, that's yeah. what I'm telling you. You can that. start with these three talks, sir. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Malhotra, we can't hear you. So I think, can we uh, go ahead with the second talk first? I will just see what is the problem with this. It's a recorded talk, so I'm just checking the audio part. Uh, okay. So uh, can I go ahead, Dr. Ravi? Dr. Manish, yeah, please. please, sir. Yeah, I'll uh, share my screen. Uh, 
uh, my screen is visible uh, yes, yes sir is visible sir so good afternoon everyone and uh, my talk is slightly unusual of all this academic stuff but it is one of the most important talks because nothing moves about money you have money you can do this webinar you can big doa has money everything can be done but if money is not there you can't do anything so we have to see that how covid has affected our uh, community the medical community and overall the other uh, population so this corona virus has totally engulfed whole world now the whole world i think there is no place in the world at present which is not affected by corona virus so this is covid 19 pandemic now labeled as a black swan event and linked to economic scene for world war 2 the outbreak of covid 19 the disease caused by severe uh, it causes severe acute respiratory syndrome corona virus 2 that is sars cov 2 virus and has the detrimental effect on the global healthcare system with ripple effect on every aspect of human life as we uh, know it same situation we had in the spanish flu before the world war 2 and the world war 2 created a havoc in the economy and probably the covid crisis will surpass the economic crisis of world war 2 now world health organization declared covid 19 outbreak uh, on january 30 as a go uh, global pandemic in response to flatten the curve government enforced border shutdowns travel restrictions quarantine in countries which constitute world largest economies uh, sparking fears of impending economic crisis and recession particularly in india which is one of the fifth largest economies in the world and the lockdown why was i think the uh, uh, the largest and uh, it was the longest lockdown ever we have experienced and it was the longest in the world now in order to understand the turmoil effect on economy we need to summarize the effect of covid-19 on individual aspects of world economy focusing on there are primary se sectors like the industry which involves like extraction of raw materials like agriculture petroleum and oil there are secondary sectors which involve the finished products like manufacturing industry tertiary sectors including all service provisions like education health we come in the tertiary sectors pharmaceutical finance hospitality tourism aviation real estate housing sector sports industry information technology media research development food sector and social imp impact is like family dynamics now uh, since there was a lockdown lot of video gaming webinars also we have seen that domestic violence increased because husband and wife were staying together so it triggered lot of domestic violence also now financial toll of covid-19 pandemic on our healthcare system has been enormous or as the hospital cancelled non urgent admissions and surgeries like elective surgeries were cancelled outpatient clinics were cancelled practices deferred elective and pre pre preventive visits were deferred and uh, basically what revenue was coming it just evaporated hospital and health system faced catastrophic financial challenges in the light of covid-19 pandemic now the uh, you know covid-19 had a you know very big catastrophic effect on the health workers like they had to they were the uh, corona warriors the frontline warriors they suffered uh, with finances they suffered with their health lot of became ill a lot many uh, medical fraternity you know died because of corona virus most of the opds were closed during the lockdown so no money and you know there was you know reduction in income of all the two types of doctors there are two types of people in our community one is the people who draw the salaries like people who are working in government job or in a private sector job and other are which are self employed so both suffered paycheck cuts now era of video consultation started and it went against all the principles which we have learned in the hutchinson's manual that you have to uh, see the patient if there is, and you have to talk to the patient history taking can be can be done 
but you can't you know feel or move or you can examine the part so it is just a virtual video consultation which is not what we have been taught in the medical colleges now financial management is a cyclical process so it the elements of management are flow of input like money will come then you have to the money retains and the outflow means your expenses and bills will go away now the retention thing is very important because whatever input is coming at least 20% you have to save for you know your future and then you allow the uh, outflow so you have to maintain this cycle now there is a cyclical period of input and outflow outflow and it is always important to manage the frequency of outflow to maintain the resources of uninterrupted supply of finances even if the inflows of finances are more than sufficient one you should increase the retention in terms of savings savings are very important instead of mismanagement or excessive outflow like you know mismanaged expenditure should be avoided for past 100 years nobody faced such a kind of long term crisis uh, which covid has given us a long term lockdown crisis in business earning has forced people to think and learn most uh, important question how the finances can be managed in long term crisis without affecting the normal style of living so now in the uh, uh, slides which are coming we'll know that how to cope up if this situation arises again so there are you know four categories of people the poor the un and the underprivileged section of the society the medium class of people the upper class of people and the class who are well established in the society and committed to serve the community the same rule cannot be applied for finance management of all these means all the four categories there are different rules of management now the most affected category is the poor section or the underprivileged and in this every science fails signs of economics fail in this thing now the only option for this uh, poor section or underprivileged is to uh, you know get them you know get the help from the government uh, you know programs which government has launched and second thing they can do that they can have a harmonious you know relationship with their business houses so that you know you can cope up uh, in this situation so they have to depend on the government program now what are the hidden un underprivileged the mi migrant workers like india witnessed which actually it was a surprise to the government also there are estimated 139 million migrant workers and rest 400 million will be pro poverty stricken so this huge number nobody realized and in the lockdown suddenly all this migrant worker they came on the surface and it was a huge number and government also didn't know what to do so our government has a adequate food grains stores but the distribution system failed one nation one ration card many government schemes but benefits people were not aware because in a survey done by hindu newspaper or showed that only 96% uh, only showed 96% did not get their ration cards and 90% did not receive wages so these are poor people uneducated they do not know how to avail the government uh, schemes so we have seen all these harrowing pictures of this migration and they are also known as the ghost among the citizens because they suddenly erupted so they are the ghost now the medium class people were affected the most and neither may be interested they basically are the bulk of you know uh, you can say after the migrant worker their population is india has the largest middle class but these uh, you know community they have a habit of saving so they somehow coped up and in this category we have entrepreneurs also who have either just started their career or have not reached the milestone which have been they have been dreaming about particularly the young doctors who have started opening their clinics they come into this category so these people the doctors who had opened the clinic and they got were very badly affected with the covid situation now how to you know do your finance management so regular saving plans with retention intention of improving the infrastructure facilities at the clinic so regular which i have told that 20% of income you have to save and you have to have provision 
to improve the infrastructure your clinic should be top class in that area you have should have a insurance policy your life insurance policy some life insurance policy you should have medical insurance policies because you are very prone to disease but people working in hospital are sometimes covered but it is very important to have a insurance policy also you can have one more policy for the in case of uh, you know natural disaster or accident disaster uh, disaster so if you are not working the insurance companies pay you uh, pays you for the days which you are not working so these th few policies can help you now medical field is vast changing so uh, technically and scientifically so you have to upgrade your clinic keep on in, uh, upgrading your clinic with technology equipment and you know you have to create a you know a clinic which is better than the other people's so that attracts patients in my opinion all the doctors should have a syndication with or at least one good nursing home see it is very important for doctors who are having running their own clinic they should also have an attachment with an hospital so there should be two ways suppose one way is affected so at least your second way is happening similarly people who are working in big hospital they should have their own private clinic so that one avenue closes or other avenue is working now also it is also important that a, a doctor should also you know help the needy and uh, you know they should uh, basically if the uh, uh, country or the government says that you have to help the poor and underprivileged so you should be uh, open hearted to help the poor people now other important thing is that uh, you should if you have to take a loan you should make your sibil strong what is sibil sibil is just a credit worthiness of the uh, person like suppose you have taken a credit card and you have defaulted on the payment this reflects in your sibil or if you are taken a home home loan and if you default on the payment then it uh, reflects on your sibil so when you take a, another loan then this causes problem unless you have cleared that thing so strong sibil helps you uh, become more uh, dependent on the loans and you can take more loans so it is very important for sibil to be good so finance management is not like only you think that about yourself but you have to think about other people so category c and d are well managed people and mostly the doctors they come in the c and d mostly in the d category so these are the people who have contributed to the pm fund other government agencies and establishing various rescue camps but these are the people who have come and helped the society a lot of many people have Uh, you know donated in the pm uh, fund also so category d is our category and uh, we are also known as the corona warriors so what effect you know people the salary this is a picture which was very you know uh, it's on the headlines of hindu newspaper uh, in a big hospital in a delhi like uh, hindu rao hospital there was no salary or there was a 30 to 40% salary cut so this was a situation or people who are also in the government job which got affected by the corona crisis so it is also our duty to uh, differentiate between the needy and the poor patient and you have to help them and also with hospitals there are there should be provision to you know or you have to have it some tie up with the ngo so that you have a corpus and you help the poor and needy so finance management seeks an opportunity and it is best time of the finance management to use the resources of the institutions to cope to use the corpus to achieve the very objective in the field of medicine soft words can heal the patient but fast uh, patient fast but providing medical and other facilities on well subsidized value through our finances is like cherry on the cake so this is the category and c and d can do lot of social uh, you know upliftment of the poor people finally i can say that it is always the planning of everybody to manage one's finances for a defined contingent period this is the time it has been much uh, longer time but all this is management for your own we belong to the society with a good well being but society who can, who can think of others we should manage our finances to help the others and find a better place for all so category c and d should help the poor poor and the under underprivileged So thank you very much
and any questions i can take it now can we just move on to the next lecture please we can yeah yeah sure 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 sure, sure. Dr. Bhavok, are you ready with Dr. Rajesh Malhotra talk? Yep. To the new normal, these are the things which we used to get for this opportunity and we are going to talk about restarting elective surgeries uh, following covid how to clear backlog and ensure uh, optimum outcome the world has changed a lot and we are now passing through the new normal these are the things which we used to get scared of however uh, our nightmares have now changed and this is our latest nightmare um, the uh, we need the hammer and the dance we know that doing nothing or mitigation um, doesn't work actually you have to go uh, with a hammer where you uh, for 3 to 7 weeks um, strike the uh, the infection hard and then the dance over the next uh, few months after the initial hammer is to keep the covid infection under control and this is the approximation of countries uh, along the hammer and the dance phases and you can see we are somewhere uh, here now and um, we are hopefully past our peak for this time and uh, this is uh, how uh, uh, the uh, covid has really challenged us for orthopedic so we have the high risk uh, for the orthopedic patients uh, they sometimes tend to stay longer in the hospital we need rescheduling of the orthopedic surgeries uh, we uh, we have to avoid face to face uh, meetings there is a constraint about the supply of the orthopedic instruments and implants um, then orthopedics uh, ranks low in the priority for the hospital administration to make available the customized uh, and constrained resources and uh, of course uh, there is postponement teaching activities the proper control of infection is very important and of course there is challenge of uh, diagnosing corona as well as the challenges with delays in the treatment so this has required some unprecedented measures and all of us are guarding many unknown gates uh, shifting from the robotic ot to the covid facility um, and then we know that uh, it's like uh, being airborne during the pandemic um, we have to do it only uh, when it's an emergency or an urgency and the elective things have to wait and this is uh, the statistics which show that 20 8.4 million surgeries uh, uh, have been postponed for uh, during the 12 weeks of disruption and now the disruption has gone much beyond uh, uh, the uh, the uh, 12 week period over 3 2.3 million cancer surgeries have been postponed and almost uh, 3 out of 4 elective surgeries has been have been postponed uh, so um, uh, this is the uh, um, 12 week cancellation rate which is uh, almost 82% for the orthopedic surgeries with an average of 2 million operations cancelled every week and um, the much has been written about uh, the impact uh, on the elective orthopedic surgery that it is it was said that if we had restarted the surgery in june 2020 it would have taken um, uh, anything up to 16 months to overcome the backlog and now you know that we have gone much beyond the 16 months so the future is quite uncertain uh, as is the availability of vaccine and the uh, and the resumption of the uh, elective surgeries Uh, is uh, is actually something where we have to move uh, forward with cautious optimism um, so uh, um, so uh, actually the elective surgeries is a misnomer because there are emergent surgeries and non emergent surgeries uh, and the backlog of elective surgery is decided by the demand as well as the uh, decreased healthcare capacity you have to strike a balance between the two and when we resume you cannot try to accelerate the simple system you have to actually uh, balance the speed with strategy and you have to ramp up these strategies so uh, one thing is that you have to have the consistent transparent and bias uh, aware algorithms for uh, surgical uh, prioritization uh, avoid the gold rush mentality do not leave it to individual surgeons avoid first come first serve or the uh, 
or the nuisance or the loud uh, voice uh, makers to uh, don't prioritize them. And then the work has to be algorithm based, uh, depending on the surgical risk factors, the capacity requirement factors like the availability of OT time, the PPE consumption, the ICU bed requirement, as well as the COVID-19 risk factors have to be taken into consideration. Um, the risks have to be made visible. You can expand the surgical capacity by transitioning to the outpatient care or minimizing the hospital stay of the patient. You have to form dedicated teams to improve operating room efficiency. Uh, it has been shown that 30% of the list start late and 38% finish early. So you have to optimize your resources and make strategies for that, standardize them, and then improve them. You have to think beyond the traditional working hours. So you could actually make three shifts and uh, keep on changing the uh, the teams it's not doesn't mean that uh, the ot's have to be available to one individual 24 into 7 and uh, then you have to uh, improve the excess of ot's during the uh, during the weekends you have to focus on simplifying the patient surgical care uh, experience so you have to alleviate the corona pandemic uh, corona pandemic fear among the patients uh, consider the economic consequences and affordability of the patients um, try to streamline everything so that the patient doesn't have to run from one department to other within the hospital avoid price of Capacity and use uh, uh, telemedicine. You have to honor existing procedures and protocols and ad adopt the new ones as required. And much has been written about the, uh, the commendations to optimize the safety and the primary objective remains do no further harm. There has to be protocol for testing for indoor patients, who, those who are undergoing surgeries or not undergoing surgeries, outdoor patients and healthcare staff. Uh, if a patient tests positive, the recovery, uh, the surgery has to be delayed till recovery. And we use in our institution 10 and 3, which means 10 days since the start of symptoms and three days without fever before we call a patient negative. Healthcare professionals may need testing when they have signs or symptoms suggestive of COVID-19 or when they have had exposure or when they uh, are in special settings like nursing homes or when uh, they are recovering to test them negative. A high risk contact is more than 15 minutes or any duration of uh, the aerosol generating medical uh, uh, procedure or a close contact less than six feet. Um, it is, you can test asymptomatic healthcare workers, but there are ethical issues about losing manpower if they are positive, a lot of uh, centers are actually letting them work unless they develop symptoms. The theater preparations have to be for COVID and non-COVID, and this is what we published in Indian Journal of Orthopedics. It shows um, the uh, donning and the uh, and the empty room, and then going on to the operation theater, exit room, and the doffing area. All this has been uh, defined. Air conditioning has to be uh, um, central, um, uh, dedicated with negative pressure and HEPA filters. And um, you know, if you don't have these uh, advanced settings, you can actually use a non recirculatory type of system, turn off central air conditioning, block off all return air vents to the OT, and then use the 100% fresh air. Now, for um, to deal with the air going out, you can use actually either the HEPA filters or 1% hypochlorite or UV radiation. And the, um, the pressure, uh, uh, negative pressure should be 2.5 pascals. The supply air should have 12 air exchanges per hour, and then split alone ACs may be useful. The other 80 OT protocols are to minimize requirement and the personnel do not carry any personal belonging inside OT, use disposables, use special equipment uh, in the breathing circuit and the patient should be uh, um, uh, observed post-operatively in the theater. If the patient turns out positive after surgery, you shift him to a COVID facility. That is the best way to deal with it. Uh, the, um, the regional anesthesia is preferable to general anesthesia wherever possible, but when intubation is required, should be done by the most experienced anesthesiolo anesthesiologist. The use of PCP PP is important. Uh, N95 and N99 and N100 are equally effective. Surgical helmet systems are uh, useless. And um, the PPs have been defined as level 1, 2, and 3. And I would just like to say that the OT needs the level 3 and the wards need, uh, general ward need level 1. All other area where you interact with the patient needs level 2 PP. And all areas have been divided into three zones. The green zone is the zone of social distancing and masks. Yellow zone is COVID-19 status uh, when it is not clear, when you use FFAP2 mask and isolation. And red zone is the COVID-19 patients and you need special PP. Avoid the use of cautery drills, ultrasonic uh, scalpels, pulsatile lavage. Avoid contact with the splashing of the body fluids of the patient. The smoke must be removed by the aspirator. And uh, of course, the post-op uh, follow-up should uh, concentrate at minimizing the patient visit. You can use some of these uh, glues instead of suture so that the patient uh, doesn't have to come back for suture removal. There are some unintended cash 
casualties like osteoporosis, chronic pain, or sedentary lifestyle. Telemedicine has been extremely useful in the pandemic uh, uh, for managing the patients. And then, of course, uh, we have carried on with the training of residents and fellows with sim simulation-based examination and interviews. Uh, and then, of course, this is also an opportunity for research. The consent is important. You must uh, tell the patient about the risk of contracting COVID in the hospital or may already be infected without knowing. And um, uh, it's basically tell them that the threat is the virus and that's all we are taking all precautions. So to um, summarize the resumption of elective surgeries even has to be moving forward with cautious optimism. We are in this together and I'm sure all of us will get through with this together. I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, fine. Uh, since uh, Dr. Shekhar is not aware of the leftover lectures from the earlier sessions, uh, so that's why I'm barging in without his permission. And But let me assure you, this is the last one, and, and I'll try to keep it very short. Uh, this is one survey with which, with the permission of Delhi Orthopedic Association, we had conducted. Um, and uh, it was something which was a great eye-opener for all of us. See, as we all know, and as Dr. Manish has uh, has discussed in detail that there is a serious repercussions for the health industry. And uh, if you see all the hospitals, they have almost their expenses that cost 80% uh, fixed. So that means in such time, there's going to be a severe uh, impact on the cash flow and the losses are going to be tremendous. Uh, there's already been a survey which has been conducted uh, from Lucknow PGIMS, and uh, it was published in the Indian Orthopedic Journal also. And uh, as you can see, uh, uh, they had uh, sent a survey, a questionnaire online to about 533 people, out of which 407 had replied. And uh, their results were given in a, in a concise form here, which says that almost uh, 90% of the people, they, 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 they saw almost half of the uh, practice went down and 64% had stopped their elective surgeries and even emergency ones had uh, by 21% they had to reduce. More than 50% of the doctors had their earnings reduced by over 75%. That's a significant number. Yes. And there was a direct relationship, uh, there was a direct relationship rather between the people who were working alone, they had their own clinic or the setup, and the people who had their own small nursing homes, et cetera, they were the ones who were most severely affected. People working in the government hospitals, by and large, they were spared, and the corporate hospitals, they were left off with a reduction of almost 30 to 40% from their salary. So this survey, apart from the financial aspect, we were also trying to cover the various other aspects also. So we had almost 257 responses in this particular survey. Not a big deal, but nonetheless, it was an eye opener for all of us. 70% uh, of the people uh, who responded were in private practice, 16.3 in corporate and 14% were in the government hospital. Most of them, majority of them were in the general orthopedics, and arthroplasty was the second commonest one, followed by your arthroscopy, sports medicine, and other such uh, specialties. The monthly surgeries, I'm really surprised to see that most of them, they come under the category of almost 15 to 30, which is a quite a healthy number if you look at it from their perspective, almost one daily. And uh, the second category was between five to 50. They, we had a good sizable number of people who were doing more than 30 surgeries in a month going up to the 50. And so this is the pre-COVID era where we are trying to give you a breakdown of the uh, number of surgeries, the percentage wise. But this is the post-COVID surgeries. The majority of the people, they were down to less than five surgeries in a month which is a severe, severe cut short, a shortcoming. But there was still a certain number of people who were doing more than 50. 
So perhaps on the hint side, either there were the government hospitals where they were still open, they were not fully COVID uh, 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 hospitals, and they were still taking the patients who had no other way to go rather than coming to these uh, government hospitals because all the private hospitals had closed down. And the other side also, like in South Delhi, all the major hospitals like Ames and Sufferzing, they had closed down for the COVID patients. So our hospital, they did see a good jump in the emergency surgeries. So this is the percentage of the surgeries post-COVID. And uh, this is the comparative study between the, uh, between the two. As you can see that, yes, it's a substantial, substantial decrease. Only less than five surgeries in a month which has been conducted here. Now, earnings, yes, uh, due to COVID, more than 50% reduction in the earnings they were seen by almost 30% of the people. No reduction, only in 8% of the people. If you um, see it from that perspective, uh, we had had almost 50% uh, reduction in 25% uh, of the patients, which is quite substantial. Sorry. Uh, we had almost 30% uh, 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 orthopedic surgeons saw a 50%, more than 50% reduction in their earning, and almost 25% uh, saw uh, up to 50% of the reduction, which is again quite substantial. I mean, this came as an eye opener to us. Uh, so the question came how were they able to survive? Did they have any alternate source of income? And again, as all the doctors are very bad, financial planners, we had almost 60% of the doctors which didn't have any alternate source of income. I mean, at this time and age, can you really believe that? But that was a fact. And few people, almost 20%, they had investments, some trade uh, stock market, almost 12.5% had property and other such investments, which are supposed to be quite healthy. Only 8.2% uh, had medical businesses going on, such as hospital or nursing home. So then the next question was that how much of their earnings was from the alternate sources of income? So you have almost 51.4% uh, doctors responded that it was 0%. So this is the magnitude of our financial planning, absolutely catastrophic. And only, and uh, up to 10% uh, was uh, suggested by 22.6% of, of the population, and more than 50% was hardly, uh, I would say about 5% of the people, so-called the smart people who were doing the medical <clears throat> practice only for the sake of it and not for the uh, financial uh, benefits. So the next question came, now that you have faced this particular situation, do you think it's high time you should start seeking an alternate source of income or might change to alternate profession due to financial needs. So zero was, they are absolutely comfortable, happy in this present scenario. They won't look for alternate source of income. And the 10 was where the people, they are desperate. They want to give up this particular profession and move on to something which has more financial uh, benefits. So, only 7% they were quite happy with the present situation and the percentage slowly gradually kept on decreasing. So almost 50%, I mean the fifth percentile rather, uh, they were sure that they were sitting on the fence and they could jump over any time. Now we are gradually going towards the people who are looking for alternate source of income and that's a quite healthy trend because the, the way that things are, the medical practice is not going to be the same anymore. We have to uh, we have to diverge. We have to get independent of the separate sources of income also. So the next question we asked them was, what should be the source of alternate income for you? And the maximum number of people feel that investment are still safer. The second one thought whether it is the investment into the property which is going to work here and. 31% uh, were confident that if they continue with their medical business, or rather they, uh, if they expand more of their medical business, and if they get revenue out of it, they will be better off. 30% of the opinion that they should go into non-medical business. So now the next question was, why? We all know that we are facing financial constraints, and what should we do? 
how how should we handle it so only 9% of the people were confident they still wanted to continue with the same lifestyle same way 78% are delaying like me also their luxury expenses the travel plans have been postponed and the first part almost 5% of the opinion that they had to cut down on the expenses of the children uh, deduction uh, uh, child education which is going to be Yeah. Then we, when then we, then we try to ask them, do you feel that your lifestyle, the social status, has been impacted? And yes, only ten percent felt that there has been no change in their lifestyle or the social status. While almost fifty, sixty percent people were of the opinion that yes, it has affected our lifestyle. So, gentlemen, this is. uh the uh, overall talk and i think this is a high time we should start thinking in terms of alternate source of income so that we are never caught again in the same predicament thank you very much for your patient hearing now dr shikhar it's uh, yeah. totally up to you you can start with the next session thank you thank you dr dhananjay it was a very interesting survey i think 2020 will always remain as a watershed year between pre covid and post covid era and that will lead to change in the attitude as well as how you conduct your practice now we uh, start the next session that is uh, regenerative orthopedics and i think it's a extension of the last session that is futuristic orthopedics because i think the future of orthopedics is in uh, gene therapy and biologicals so uh, i welcome dr raju ishwaran as co moderator and dr prati gupta and dr r k manucha as the panelists for this session uh we start the first talk with uh, platelet rich plasma uh, platelet rich plasma good bad or ugly now prp came in a big way as a panacea for many unsolved problems of orthopedics like tendinitis and condyle defects has it really lived up to its hype so let's hear it from dr karan rajaki Thank you, Dr. Shekhar sir. Uh, I hope everyone can see my screen. Yes, we can. So, yeah, it's visible. Can I request uh, the other people to un uh, to please mute themselves? I think Dr. Bhavo Gurg's uh, screen is still on uh, with the volume on, and it may disturb the stock. Sir, I am muted. Raju sir, I have muted him. Okay. Thank you. So. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Karan Raj Jaggi. I uh, specialize in regenerative orthopedics. I did my undergraduate and postgraduate and subsequent surgical training from Delhi University in Delhi, uh, and then I went to UK for my super specialty training in regenerative orthopedics. I currently work uh, at Fortis Hospital, Watson Kunj, and I wanted to thank the Delhi Orthopedic Association and especially Dr. Dhananjay Gupta for giving me an opportunity to talk about uh, PRP. and essentially whenever we talk about prp it's a very polarizing topic amongst orthopedic surgical groups uh, and one of the reasons major reasons for that is that prp today shows drastically different results for two different surgeons uh, so no two surgeons today agree completely about prp and you know one of the most important reasons i think that this is there is that today there exists no standardized protocols either for prp preparation or for clinical decision making and patient selection uh, while you know giving prp injectable therapies and there's also you know varied differences that exist in the mode of application of prp so i'll just go through them uh, you know over the course of the next maybe 5 10 slides and essentially i want to highlight that today you know there a single spin versus a double spin uh there are a wide variety of commercial vendors who will come with you know first generation fifth generation 10th generation prp kits and they will all claim that their prp kits are superior than anything else that you can find in the market and although this might not be an area where orthopedic surgeons get into directly i think it is always wise for us at least to know the basics uh, of the methods of prp preparation even if you don't get it to them directly and then the second the clinical decision making itself so you know knee chondral lesions are today probably one of the most prescribed and used areas for prp but that itself is a fairly large bucket you know are we talking about traumatic chondral lesions are we comparing them to degenerative chondral lesions degenerative chondral lesions you know again further should be classified is it predominantly patello femoral predominantly tibio femoral even in the tibio femoral is it associated with with degenerative medial meniscal pathologies 
So you know, these are some of the things that I want to highlight in the subsequent slides. So I think today there is enough evidence about the use of PRP. And like I said, let's start with a specific example, which is knee osteoarthritis. And this is a landmark study which was published in 2020. And this is a meta-analysis of 34 randomized control trials. And what the authors have done very well here is obviously there is, you know, 1400 plus knees in both the PRP and control groups. But what they have proved quite unequivocally is that PRP is clinically and statistically superior than placebo, than hyaluronic acid, and, and, it, and it's also superior to steroids. What is important here is how is it superior? So what I want to highlight here is that you can see that at a 12 month follow up, PRP is clinically superior in terms of the Womax score. And this sort of benefit is retained across all categories, even in hyaluronic acid, even in steroids. This is another study from 2020, which tells us more or less the same thing that intra-articular PRP is more efficacious. And again, what the authors have done, the metrics that they have used have all been patient reported outcome scores, the WOMAX score, the WAS score. And they, the authors have confirmed the same that PRP is superior to visco supplementation at a one year follow up. This is another meta-analysis, although this is just four studies, the authors have told us majorly the same thing. So today, I think there is high level evidence that suggests that PRP, intra-articular PRP injectables are superior to hyaluronic acid and to steroids at a one year follow up. And you know, let's just go back and try and understand why that is. So if we go towards the pathogenesis of osteoarthritis, although it is a degenerative disease, at the core of that degeneration is a chronic inflammatory cascade. So there is a cytokine storm that happens, there is cytokine release that activates the MMPs, that causes articular cartilage damage, that also activates osteoblasts, which results in osteophyte formation. So if we consider osteoarthritis having at its very core a chronic inflammatory pathway, some of these clinical uh, discussions become a lot easier. And this is a slide that goes back to you know, our pathology days. And this is a classic chronic inflammatory cascade. The, the circle that you see or the peak that you see in dark brown is your stage of inflammation. The one in light brown is the stage of early repair. And the one in gray is the stage of late repair. So now steroids will act only on the stage of inflammation that they predominantly, they are excellent in giving us a short-term control over the inflammation, reducing synovitis, but they, you know, like I've mentioned, act exclusively on the stage of inflammation. They have little to no effect on the stage of early repair. They have little to no effect on the stage of advanced repair. Visco supplementation, on the other hand, predominantly works through its mechanical properties. There are reports which say that there are, you know, there are some evidence of uh, decreased production of matrix metalloproteinases. There is decreased synthesis of prostaglandins. Uh, but the major action of hyaluronic acid is uh, the viscoelastic effect that it does. And now once we start coming and analyzing how PRP actually works, PRP and all platelet derived products essentially work on release of growth factors from activated platelets. And on the screen, you find the four most important growth factors, which is the VGF, PDGF, TGF, beta and IGF. And essentially all of these growth factors contribute towards neoangiogenesis, contribute towards chemo, MSC chemotaxis, MSC differentiation. And this essentially highlights how PRP and other platelet-derived aggregates essentially act on all stages of the repair pathway, which explains why the benefits of PRP at a one-year and subsequent follow-up are significantly higher and better than hyaluronic acid and steroid. So I think this is, this is one of the first points that I wanted to highlight uh, in the talk today. But coming back to these three uh, meta-analyses that I had shared with you, and I had mentioned in passing that they've all kept the VAS score, the PU score, essentially patient reported outcome scores as their outcome measures. So yes, PRP has got, is clinically and statistically superior in terms of patient functional scores. But what is the actual radiological improvement that we have with PRP? And surprisingly, this is an area where we have very, very little literature that exists today. Uh, I'm you know, very honestly very surprised by the paucity of literature that we have. But this is one of the, you know, again, a landmark study that was published in 2013, where they took only 15 patients, single injection of PRP, and they compared a pre and post analysis. 
So, and the authors found that in 73% of the cases, which I've highlighted on the bottom of your screen, had no radiological improvement in their uh, cartilage, knee cartilage volume and other uh, radiographic parameters. Now this, this leads us, you know, this is where the confusion now starts happening or occurring. We have meta-analysis, 34, 20 RCTs saying that there is functional improvement. And then we have studies saying that there is no radiological improvement or little to no radiological improvement. So why is there a discrepancy? So this was a recent study published in 2019, which cleared up some of uh, those lacunae and some of those confusions. And what these authors did was that they, this was actually a randomized control trial. They had 46 patients, 23 cases, 23 controls, and the controls were placebo. And again, the authors confirmed the improvement in the WOMAX score. So all patient functional parameters expressed or showed clinically significant and statistically significant improvement. But the authors also demonstrated three important points. Now, the first of that was, as you can see, this is an image borrowed, borrowed from the study itself, that they actually demonstrated that there was a statistically significant improvement in the tibiofemoral cartilage volume. Uh, sorry, the patellofemoral cartilage volume, as you can see on your screen. The tibiofemoral cartilage volume remained more or less the same. So there was a statistical significant improvement in the patellofemoral volume, but the tibiofemoral volume and the medial and lateral meniscal integrity was not clinically significant. So yes, there was an improvement, but it wasn't clinically or statistically significant, as you can see from the p-value. And then again, there was an improvement in the synovitis, but again, the significance remains to be seen. So I think at the end of this study, some of the controversy started getting cleared up with regards to the actual functional and radiological efficacy uh, regarding PRP. And this, and you know, in the next two slides, I just took two patient uh, follow-ups, which I think highlight, you know, where PRP stands today, especially for patients with knee osteoarthritis. Uh, and these patients received three injections four weeks apart. Uh, there was, you know, we've been using various variety of commercial kits. And uh, as of now, although this evidence is not statistically significant as of now, but anecdotally, there is no difference between Arthrex, Remy, the various, uh, you know, commercial kits that are available. Uh, the Coo score was utilized for this. And the first patient that I wanted to speak to you about was a 42-year-old male who was a squash player, uh, came to me with a classic anterior knee pain. Radiographs, including skyline view, were normal. Uh, uh, following an MRI, he had a grade 2 uh, chondral lesion in the lateral patellar facet, a grade 1 in the medial patellar facet. And his main uh, problem was that he was unable to get back to his sports without experiencing significant pain. So now if we go back slightly to, you know, the literature that I've just shared with you, this is a patient who's relatively young. This is a patient who's got a focal chondral lesion. This is a patient who has got a focal chondral lesion in the patellofemoral joint. The tibiofemoral joint majorly is preserved. There are no structural scaffolding issues. Patellar tracking is normal. So this is a patient, patient that theoretically should respond very well to PRP. And this is a patient where we had injected. And as you can see from the data, this was just before the lockdown. This patient actually got back to playing sports, uh, you know, two months following the first injection. And, you know, although he might not have been, he might not have played after that due, due to the lockdown, but at least, you know, we did our job. So this, this I think is a classical example of a patient where the decision making completely mirrored the findings that one would expect through literature. And now we contrast this patient to a 65 year old female. So this was a patient who came to me with, you know, severe tricompartmental disease, had been advised multiple surgical options, was hell bent on not getting operated despite all evidence to the contrary. And this patient, you know, wanted to get a PRP injection done. This patient, although had degenerative uh, medial meniscal tears, did not experience any mechanical symptoms in terms of locking, but had significant medial joint line tenderness and McMurray's was positive. And despite explaining to this patient that the meniscal pathology is not expected to improve uh, following a PRP injection, she was still very, very keen to undergo that. And as you can see that there was improvement in the overall score, in her symptoms, in her stiffness, in her pain, but advanced function and quality of life remained majorly unchanged. And this, I think, again, mirrors some of the findings that we've been discussing that chondral pathologies, while they might not regenerate, at least functionally patients will improve. And, you know, we can attribute that functional improvement to suppression of the inflammatory cascade, 
suppression of the MMPs, suppression of the Sinovitis, and you know, actually saying that PRP today regenerates cartilage, uh, especially in the tibiofemoral joint, and it affects meniscal healing. To this date, although theoretically possible, has not been validated uh, in literature as of now. And you know, whenever uh, you know, we try and understand or try and get some evidence into our clinical decision making, this is a triad of regenerative medicine that is actually helpful uh, in patient selection. And an optimum regenerative environment for patients uh, includes patients having adequate cellularity, having adequate growth factors, and having a proper scaffold. So PRP, yes, it provides us with growth factors, and it does to some extent affect cellularity as well through MSC chemotaxis, but PRP clearly does not affect scaffold in any way or form. So patients who require scaffold, scaffold or who require structural stability, there are, there are studies today happening where patients with complete ATFL tears are being treated with ultrasound-guided PRP injections, which, to my opinion at least, seems it doesn't seem to have a scientific basis for that. If, if you do not have a structural scaffold, injecting PRP will not work. And which is why, you know, I, I don't want to uh, sort of, you know, there are speakers ahead of me who are speaking about the, Dr. Master will be speaking about the cartilage, various cartilage repair options, options. But essentially for ultrasound guided applications in cases with epicondylitis, in case, patients with tendonitis, since we do not have a structural scaffolding abnormality, PRP should be one of the first line of treatment options that we consider. And meta-analysis, again, I've tried to keep, you know, level four evidence and above, and they've all, the 515 patients in the study on the left, 374 on the right, and they all say the same thing, that PRP uh, is better than steroids. And now coming to one of the last points uh, that I wanted to make was the mode of application. And, you know, we've discussed that there exists, you know, differences in patient selection, there exist differences in uh, PRP preparation as well. But the actual mode of application also affects uh, treatment outcomes drastically. And this is, you know, just three studies that I wanted to highlight. These are all studies treating partial ACL tears, all adult patients, no pediatric patients. And the only major difference that you can find with them is that the first study is an intra-articular study where the, where the surgeons have injected intra-articularly simply, whereas the other two are intra-ligamentous. And both the studies at the bottom, although they are not high-level studies, they are case reports, report that patients have been symptomatically improved. So yes, while evidence might not exist today, it is, you know, it is in our interest to move towards collecting these evidences, keeping, you know, basic science in mind. And, and you know, the last point is with for medial meniscus as well. So... PRP today has shown to retard cartilage degeneration, yes. It has shown to improve tibiofemoral, patellofemoral cartilage volume, yes. Tibiofemoral is questionable. The impact on medial and lateral meniscus per se as of now is again questionable. So patients with degenerative meniscal pathologies, especially if they are severely symptomatic because the meniscal pathologies per se probably are not suitable candidates for PRP, at least intra-articular PRP. Intra-meniscus ultrasound-guided intra-meniscal injections, while anecdotal case reports you know, are present here and there, I, as of now, the evidence suggests that these patients might be better served with surgical options than, or a combination of bone marrow aspirate concentrates and fibrin scaffolds, uh, which Dr. Vinod sir is already speaking about, so I won't get into that. Finally, this is just a slide which summarizes the discrepancies that exist in the PRP preparation protocol today. So you can see that, you know, intervals for application vary from two weeks, weekly, every three weeks, monthly on the studies on the table on the right. And then you have the differences in approach. So high level, I think I just wanted to highlight two important differences. The first thing is that we should always be aware whether we are using a single spin approach or a double spin approach. A single spin approach does PRP sedimentation and concentration in the same sitting. Whereas in a double spin approach, obviously we have the sedimentation first followed by the concentration. The proponents of a double spin approach say that the double spin yields a better platelet yield. 
but the proponents of a single spin approach say that the double spin actually affects platelet morphology and interferes with growth factor release so as of now this is an area of immense controversy and there are and there is enough evidence on both sides so i think this is an area for future research but at least as surgeons we should be we should be aware of what uh, prp we are injecting and the second is actually are we using an activated prp or not now this is an area which is slightly potentially less problematic because chemical activation of prp has globally been accepted as probably the standard of care calcium chloride and thrombin are the two most commonly used uh, ones either individually or in combination and these are two questions i think that we should always uh, you know or two answers that we should always be aware of when we are injecting prp and these are just some of the you know discrepancies or the unanswered questions i've gone through this so finally as a take home message today prp serves an identified therapy gap yes it has excellent short term results so today literature that exists surrounding prp is a one year 12 month 18 month at best a 24 month follow up we need longer term results to make a a definitive statement about the use of prp functional and pain improvement is now been proven inconclusively so i think that there is the, conclusively so i said so there is absolutely no doubt that patients respond better in terms of pain and functional scores radiological outcomes on the other hand are slightly inconclusive tibio femoral patients probably behave a little better uh, patello femoral sorry patello femoral behave probably a little better tibio femoral probably not as much cartilage regrowth as of now has not been conclusively proven so i finally i think the most important tips are that we have a patient, proper patient selection uh, proper communication and obviously one of the most common we avoid uh, nsaid 3 days prior and 3 days uh, post any prp injections thank you thank 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 you thank you karan so uh, we can take few questions now uh, current uh, initially uh, previously there was a lot of talk about leukocyte leukocyte rich and leukocyte poor prp now yeah. so does it still exist do we uh, use the same kind of prp for tendinitis and for arthritis or no, ab effect? no absolutely uh, abs that i think that's been proven now so so for intra articular injections leukocyte poor prp for uh, tendinopathy then intra ligamentous and intra meniscal it is actually leukocyte rich Uh, we actually now uh, have reports of concentrated growth factors uh, being used instead of prp so we have now uh, cgf or gfc there are uh, products available which actually take away the platelets themselves which is actually a very interesting concept because they say that the actual activated particle in a prp is the growth factors themselves the platelets themselves do not do anything and which is why now uh, there are kits available which actually cause chemical activation release the growth factors in the serum and that is then collected as an inserted so for intra articular pathologies there is absolutely no doubt that we need to inject leukocyte poor uh, but for ligament and tendons it is leukocyte uh, rich uh, dr shikhar can i ask a question yeah uh, dr karan excellent presentation uh, i would just uh, ask you a very basic question uh, who would be the ideal uh, patient uh, for a prp uh, injection Uh, in a case of osteoarthritis, who will be your ideal patient to inject PRP? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, I think an ideal patient would be uh, somebody, uh, let's say, thirty to forty years of age, having a focal traumatic, purely chondral lesion of less than one centimeter square. Uh, and I think all of these four or five parameters are important. So, age of patient affects the regenerative potential. Traumatic, purely chondral, not osteochondral, but predominantly. purely chondral pathologies especially if they are like i said in the patello femoral joint not the tibio femoral uh, are i think patients who are ideal candidates for intra articular prp injections clinically for the knee joint ultrasound guided has not been proven to be beneficial as compared to a clinical injection because i think you know for the knee we we are fine uh, for intra ligamentous especially for rotator cuff pathologies obviously an ultrasound guided uh, is is probably the treatment of choice uh, dr karan i think dr sharad probably meant uh, the kind of osteoarthritis patient that walks into us not the 30 to 40 that you are referring to uh, maybe the higher age group let's say 50 plus 
So what according to you would be your indications for, because if I can just make a devil's advocate kind of a comment on both the cases that you presented, maybe a lot of placebo role also played. The squash player would have been very keen to get something into his knee so that he could start playing squash. The lady who was reticent for a knee replacement would be similarly keen to get something into the knee to not get a knee replacement. So what is your indication for OA? So for degenerative pathologies, uh, I think it's it should reasonably a, be a purely degenerative pathology. Patients either should not have degenerative medial meniscal tears or lateral meniscal tears, or even if they, you know, commonly we will find patients having these tears, at least they should not be symptomatic from a meniscal point of view. So 50 to 60 years, uh, patellofemoral osteoarthritis more than uh, tibiofemoral osteoarthritis have relatively asymptomatic from a meniscal pathology, having patellar symptoms being prominent, I think these would be patients who, uh, you know, should be considered for PRP prior to uh, any surgical intervention. But having said that, I, you know, as of now, honestly, there is no standardized protocol that dictates, uh, you know, this, this is just uh, evidence-based medicine that has been collected over time. And this could be a personal opinion as well. And this is a very valid point because patellar patients traditionally do very poorly with visco supplementation. So maybe PRP is the answer for that. But I think May for patellofemoral pain, there are a lot, lot many other factors. So uh, I think let's move on to the next topic because we are very late by almost one and a half hours. Uh, may I invite uh, Dr. Vinod Kumar and he'll be speaking on uh, BMAC. Is it the magical potion we have been hoping for? Yeah, good afternoon to all respected seniors and dear friends. I hope I am audible. Yes, yes, we can hear you properly. Yeah, screen is visible. Yeah, we can see. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, so okay. thank you. So uh, thanks to Dr. Dhananjay and all team to uh, allow me to share my views on this. Although the language of the title is very fascinating given to me, that BMAC is it the magical portion we have been hoping for. Uh, I, we all know that nothing magic in medicine, but yes, uh, we will try to analyze the literature and see where does it stand today. So uh, like we all know that the stem cell uh, are actually the basis for regenerative orthopedics and mesial Chymal stem cells retain their properties after culture expansion. And this is the uh, feature which is unique and uh, probably uh, the chondrocytes uh, which does not maintain their phenotype after expansion. So this way, the, these cells uh, probably seems to be having better potential. Sources of these mesenchymal uh, stem cells are various, bone marrow, adipose, umbilical cord blood, and all these periosteum dermis, et cetera. But for orthopedic purpose, uh, this probably bone marrow uh, origin mesenchymal stem cells are the best. So what actually this bone marrow aspirate contain? Uh, majority is basically this neutrophils and erythroblasts. And the neutrophils concentration is uh, lower in male, while these erythroblasts are more in males. And this constitute almost around 60% uh, of this. Rest are these lymphocytes, eosinophils, blast cells, etc. And these actual uh, cells of interest, these are the mesenchymal stem cells, are very few, that is 0 0.01 to 0.01% only. What was going on? So uh, just uh, to have a few important things about the technique issues, I'll not go into detail. Uh, there are various techniques, but the most favorite site is uh, basically the iliac crest. And uh, posterior iliac crest gives better cells. That is more than 60% uh, higher than from anterior iliac crest. And technically, there are few points which are worth to understand if we are going to aspirate from iliac crest that uh, there are anatomical studies which clearly guide us that how we should proceed. If they have divided this iliac crest into six zones and only these second, third and sixth, these are the three zones which are actually safe and as well as provide better concentration of the cells. 
there are uh, definite risk uh, also to aspirate from these area they are not without risk there are chances of external iliac artery to get injury if you are taking from anterior side and you get suddenly slipped under pressure and uh, there are also chances of even sciatic nerve injury if you are aspirating from posterior iliac crest and there is if you see if you insert the trocar in the posterior component more than 6 cm and deviate more than 5 degree then you there are chances to penetrate the cortex so as you go deep chances of uh, tilt injuries are higher and higher so you have to be very careful uh, just don't take these things lightly and another important thing is that uh, a uh, size of syringe also surprisingly matters that the concentration of mesen camel stem cells were approximately 300% higher if you have used 10 ml syringe versus 50 ml syringe and uh, this looks uh, against that but yes so we have to use the small volume syringe and to perform the aspirations from multiple sites rather than to use a big size uh, this thing so in the same way the ideal volume aspirated from each area also varies and uh, the limiting aspiration volume if you want a good concentration is not more than 2 or 3 ml from one site so it is better than you you should take from a different sites rather than to collect all from one area now question comes why uh, we want to convert this uh, bone marrow aspirate into the concentrate and reason is very clear that as uh, we know that the cells concentration is very less and which probably is not optimal for most of the uh, means regenerative procedures so there are two methods to increase the concentration of these mesen camel cells first one is the culture that you can isolate them and send them for culture and second is that you can concentrate and increase uh, their concentration so we have to understand both methods there are advantages as well as disadvantages of each if you are culturing these cells then this has an advantage in terms of that this gives a homogeneous cell population and the number of cells is really very high so these two are uh, the advantages we say is this bmac has a heterogeneous cell population and this has a um, you can say the limited capacity to increase their concentration that is almost around 5 times what this study says that normally this is around 600 cells per ml and if you concentrate it it to one fifth make it one fifth then accordingly the five times roughly around 2500 cells per ml is the average which you can get by this bmac but there are the other other sides of this that disadvantages of this method are that uh, question of sterility genetic instability and this ethical issues probably that's the reason why these are not approved uh, by fda and the high cost and they are the two stage procedures these all are the limited factor in spite of having these biological advantages however in this bmac these all are the advantages that it's just a uh, one stage procedure which can be done in the same sitting on the same ot table and this is uh, definitely cheaper and there are no ethical issues that this come as this comes under a minimal handling of the uh, tissues now the mechanism of action of bmac is basically by both ways one is through the mesen camel stem cells directly which are the multipotent cells and they have the a uh, uh, quality of immunomodulatory capacity as well as the multi lineage differentiation and they can transform into different cells maybe vessels bone cartilage or fat and muscles etc depending on the milieu and 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 these other modulators available at that particular site and the second important thing is as in prp that all those uh, factors Uh, these pl uh, platelet uh, derived uh, factors growth factors are also there which have some impact on the chondrocyte proliferation as well as in the healing through the collagen synthesis now we have to uh, understand what are the indications of this bmac in orthopedics there are uh, these three and uh, four main indications that is in bone 
defects, avascular necrosis, tendon injuries, and cartilage defects. So I'll just go briefly one by one. BMAC has been used to augment in some cases to replace the bone graft with the aim of improving the incorporation of bone graft. These are the various studies which have used BMAC along with grafts as well as alone and there are encouraging results. Even the study says that injection of pure BMAC also helps in osteogenesis and management of non-union. However, we have to understand that non-union is a complex situation. We cannot just expect from uh, BMAC to treat all non-unions because it requires a lot of mechanical things and other things also. But yes, there is an evidence that it has a good osteogenic potential and may help in achieving the union. Now, another indication is avascular necrosis, which is commonest in the femoral head. And there are uh, these three, four studies, which clearly says that uh, this use of BMAC uh, along with the core decompression definitely gives better result than core decompression alone. So this is one area where this uh, can be successfully used. Results are encouraging. Now into the tendon injuries, there are not many studies uh, on this. There are only these few small studies which have used this BMAC in uh, rotator cuff repair procedure as an uh, adjunct. And uh, these studies are suggestive that this BMAC uh, has a potential to increase the healing, but probably this part is not very well supported by some randomized trials and all, so require larger studies, only some few pilot studies are there. Now coming to this uh, last one, which is the most important challenge, that is the cartilage repair. Where does BMAC stand? And the BMAC has a definite place in procedures treating the cartilage. And the modalities, how you have to use, are also variable in literature. It has been used alone, just like an injection intraarticular. It has been used then gradually in BMAC with scaffold. And it can it also used along with some other procedure as a concomitant uh, along with other microfracture, etc. So let us see uh, how uh, this technique in the uh, cartilage is basically the same, that first you have to evaluate the defect, then you can uh, aspirate and prepare the bone marrow aspirate concentration. I will not go into the detail. Basic philosophy is that it is based on the, on the centrifug uh, centrifugation principle, differential centrifugation principle. You have to do twice in first cycle you make it 3,500 RPM for five minutes, and it separates the RBC uh, in the lower chamber and Buffy coat having all the mononuclear cells in the middle and plasma in the upper. So then you just lock the RBC chamber and mix the rest too. And then after that, you put this PD back in the centrifuge machine and spin it again for three minutes at lower RPM of 3,200. And then finally you aspirate this uh, concentrate and prepare it prepare it with mixing with the thrombin and fibrin and load it in the dual syringe having this mixture and fibrin. So there are different techniques of this with the different available kits. So you have to read those, uh, these, those instructions. It's not uh, so important, but yes, now there are professional kits available how you should do this. And these kits are uh, very handy now. Now coming to the results in cartilage repair, uh, on exploring the literature, there are two uh, type of evidence that is the translational and clinical. Now, first, these translational studies are uh, majority of studies are favoring that uh, probably this BMAC is uh, giving better results than microfracture alone. And these were done in goat and horse. So by getting encouragement from these studies, these uh, clinical studies also started. The first study was in 2009. And then till date, almost there are 17 studies where this has been used for cartilage defect. These seven studies were used for only full thickness cartilage and 10 were used for osteochondral lesion. Out of these, a majority were for knee, but also in talus and patellar defects as well. This is according to this uh, review. Now, 
the few important studies which have uh, seen these results this uh, gobi has done uh, really the pioneer work uh, in use of bmac so he has studied and uh, seen that it is actually helping and uh, it has been compared uh, by other modalities like uh, prp and others and they find out that probably its results are uh, better and encouraging however the the good clinical efficacy of bmac both as a concomitant with cartilage restoration procedure as defined time after surgery and as isolated injections is almost uh, there early clinical data results bmac helps stimulate more robust hyaline cartilage repair tissue response but still there are some questions uh, like cell source cell expansion optimum optimal pathology where you have to use and the timing of injection and what should be the ideal quantity all these things still are not very standardized now there are few studies which have compared directly uh, with the other cartilage restoring procedures like this microfracture so this uh, bmac provides better clinical outcome and more durable cartilage repair uh, than uh, microfracture alone now there is a only one study which is uh, also has compared this bmac with the maci that is aci third generation and uh, this is uh, again with having 3 4 years follow up by gobi again both the techniques were viable and effective but these were for petal of femoral condyle lesions not for tibio femoral the deterioration in uh, maci and improvement in bmac group scores were noticed from 2 year to final follow up but there were no difference this messy patients with trochlear lesion showed better results than patellar lesions while location was not a prognostic factor in bmac group so uh, this is only one study which i directly compared i have uh, some experience uh, to doing this procedure for last couple of years only these uh, one or two cases i am sharing on cartilage defect so uh, this is the first case which is a 24 year male patient diagnosed with a grade 4 osteochondral defect you can uh, see that it's a huge defect and even significant bone loss is there so i think uh, this is a uh, the condition where definitely uh, this mscs take over the pure aci because here we have multipotent cell which are expected to take care of these bone defects as well this is a clinical picture so in a, in a very bad shape and uh, here i have done this bmac with all standard procedures so i have filled it completely after preparing the defect it became quite big almost 6 7 cm square area and uh, this is a 6 month follow up so it's uh, almost no stiffness walking painless doing all uh, his day to day activities and uh, this is the uh, the mri picture of 6 months after which is suggestive of uh, the some some healing response you can see not completely healed but uh, definitely uh, this is a healing response is there and uh, i think it's early to say probably in a in a later mri uh, i i will be in better position to tell you i uh, still uh, patient is in follow up this is the second patient which is again is a young guy 35 year old uh person he is uh, having the same features of recurrent effusion pain and his diagnosis is again is a major osteochondral defect grade 4 even visible in x ray you can see uh, uh, yes almost half of the condyle and even in lateral view there is a is a major collapse these are the mri pictures and uh, see all this these are the very vague sort of osteonecrotic patch probably although there was no history but these type of uh, picture sometime is there in steroid induced osteonecrosis we are not sure about this but it was very funny picture but there was a massive defect in the osteochondral the uh, uh, defects so this is the uh, per operative picture again there is a massive defect very poor quality of cartilage as well as bone so it was actually a an indication for a allograft osteochondral but somehow we don't have this facility so here the depth of defect was more so i was not very sure and uh, i put this uh, autogenous osteochondral grafts from the lateral condyle 
these were the 8 mm in diameter i could harvest 5 but in spite of that there were definite uh, area which still were uncovered and here to take care of this area i used this technique as a hybrid use of bmac and i filled all this area by that i could find out in literature only one case in teles like that and there was no case report in the literature in knee so somehow i was reluctant but i performed because i was having no better option other than this so i tried this and now results are encouraging this was just 3 uh, months 3 uh, months uh, post op and uh, he was having no stiffness and pain relieved uh, general uh, physical activities uh, resumed this is the mri picture at that time they are getting well incorporated although it's very early to say because 3 months is too early for it and uh, actually i just called him uh, just once i got the talk invitation he is from bhopal so he was unable to come because of the fear of delhi that its the panic is there so i requested him to send me some uh, functional video and these are the video prepared by patient attendant himself and uh, he just uh, send me on my whatsapp so he is looking i think quite good and he is comfortable he has no complaint now and uh, i could not get mri probably he will come in uh, after this covid and then we'll see in mri and uh, then exactly the pattern of healing but this clinically seems to be uh, a good results so dear friends uh, here take home message is that probably bmac is not a magical portion but definitely as an emerging potential the early results are promising but still this technique is evolving and large multicentric studies are needed to exactly standardize the uh, the procedure the cell source expansion optimal pathology and timing of injections so uh, thank you to all of you for your patience here thank you. now any query or any thank, question thank i am ready you know, it was a really very good presentation and uh, your results have shown the good work which you have done thank uh, you so uh, do you use a uh, aci technique also yeah i have used initially not uh, for last i think 2 years because of this problem of uh, that it was got uh, banned by the icmr but i have experience of around uh, 10 15 cases before and aci also is good so uh, i have not done any comparative in my hand and literature also is silent on this except one study which i have quoted so uh, it's uh, not an evidence based to say which one is better till till today but theoretically i see some advantage with aci in terms of more concentration of available homogeneous chondrocytes so probably the cartilage repair should be faster and better but the deficiency is that uh, it is a selective so if there is any osteal uh, osteochondral defect then it may not take care of the associated subchondral bone problem in that way uh, probably bmac may take better but it i think till today uh, i cannot say that which one actually is better uh, in large defects It's difficult okay. to say okay and histologically with bmac we get a superior uh, fibrocartilage yeah I, this uh, actually high line like rather than fibro means it is better than micro fracture it is uh, almost uh, you can say same as aci in early it's it's not you see even in aci it is not the true high line because the because the pattern of collision parallelity and all that is still could not be achieved in those 5 6 years that may take long time so it they say in aci in bmac that it is close to high line is high line like you can say nothing is a true high line okay do we have any more questions from the panelist so i think shikhar in the interest of time let us uh, move on with yes. a excellent talk by uh, dr vinod and uh, i think let's invite uh, the next speaker vikram maskar to give his talk and i would request all subsequent speakers to please kindly stick to the 10 minute allotted time thank you Thank you so much, Dr. Raju, and uh, thank you, team, DOA, Karan, Dr. Dhananjay, and it's a real honor to be able to 
present a lecture on a very, very uh, important topic, which is an enigma in itself uh, in, such, in front of such an esteemed panel. And I hope to demystify this uh, to some extent with this lecture. So cartilage lesions can be classified into focal cartilage lesions, which is the topic of concern in our present uh, talk, or diffuse, like osteoarthritis, which I would not stick to because it's a topic in itself. And when you manage it, you take into consideration the size of the lesion, you take into consideration the pathology, the cause of the lesion, and the depth of the lesion. So these are the three things you consider before you decide on a particular modality to treat it. And size, we divide it into those that are less than one or two centimeters squared, we call them small lesions, something like this. Those which are two to four centimeters squared are called medium lesions. And those that are greater than four centimeters squared are large lesions. So this is something we quite uh, commonly encounter in our orthopedic practice, an MRI like this with a lot of bone edema. So this could be due to an acute uh, incident or a traumatic or a chronic, sorry, a chronic incident to the bone or the cartilage. Now, whether acute or chronic, the causes are variable. Could be osteonecrosis, traumatic, very common, overloading, OCD, osteochondritis desiccans, or steroid usage. And depending on the size of the lesion, it could be either small or large. So we know that articular cartilage has various, uh, you know, cartilage is made up of various layers, starting from the articular surface to the superficial deep layer, and ultimately the subchondral bone and the calcified layer that separates it from here. So grade one lesions, it's important to know these grades because your treatment is dependent on them. So ICRS and outer bridge are the biggest grading systems. So ICRS refers to uh, those where there's a little bit of softening of the cartilage is grade one. Uh, grade two are those that extend variably within the cartilage layer depth, uh, grade two. Outer bridge also takes into account the diameter of the lesion as less than 1.5 centimeters, which is ICRS, which is outer bridge two, or greater than 1.5 centimeters. And those lesions extending all the way down to the calcified layer, but not through it, are ICRS grade three. And grade four are those that extend all the way into the subchondral bone. Now, subchondral bone is extremely important for nutrition. It helps in load bearing, and it's a warehouse of bone marrow stem cells and growth factors. So before any cartilage repair, the take home message is consider subchondral bone. So if we look at this, this is the layers of the cartilage. They act like a, the subchondral bone acts like a trampoline. So it basically takes the load off the cartilage layer as can be seen here. So what are our management strategies? They are divided into, for simplicity, repair, which involves refixation of lesions or microfracturing of lesions, regenerative procedures where we try to create more cartilage like autologous chondrocyte implantation, better known as ACI, or reconstruction, which is um, your oats, mosaic plasty, allograft transfer. So we can broadly classify it into these three categories. So let's start with refixation. So typical traumatic lesion that we received is one of my patients. You can see the lesion arthroscopically. I like fixing them arthroscopically with multiple biopins to stabilize them as can be seen here, which stabilize the lesion and help in healing later on. The other possibility is to do a suture bridge fixation. So you may have a large osteochondral lesion like this. I like fixing them with bead pins carrying non-absorbable sutures like the suture tape that are delivered on the lateral or medial cortex. So I put them in a cruciate fashion and tie them over a bone bridge, or you can even use a sort of implant on the lateral or medial aspect. Microfracture is something wherein we stimulate bone marrow stem cells to be released to produce fibrocartilage over our lesion. So look at this typical lesion. First thing you do is debride it till you reach the calcified layer, then use a curette to remove the calcified layer. Once that's done, using a bone awl, multiple trephinations are made in the bone to reach all the way to the subchondral bone to release bone marrow stem cells, which ultimately lead to healing with fibrocartilage.
cartilage. So certain technical tips here, so should be done in outer bridge, three or four lesions. Your pick should be directed perpendicular to the lesion. There should be at least three to four holes per centimeter that are three to four millimeters apart and about four millimeters deep. So how do you know you're deep enough? You'll see fat droplets. So that's something to look out for. Then we move on to auto, osteochondral autograph transfer, oats, mosaic, plasti. They're both more or less the same. It's just the company, one is Smith & Nephew, one is Arthrex, that manufactures these kits. They are used for more active patients. And typically, these are the lesions that you get. First thing is to measure the lesion with a tamp. Then to go through adequate depth to the lesion to accept osteochondral plugs that have highline cartilage in them. These are harvested from non-weight bearing areas like the lateral femoral condyle or the intercondylar notch. So these plugs are taken and then fixed into these lesions as a press fit uh, uh, sort of fixation. So you do uh, one, two or whatever, depending on uh, the size of the lesion. And this ultimately leads to a highline cartilage cover. So best done in those less than 45 active people and the bone plug length should be at least 15 millimeters, if not more. It should be kept proud rather than subsiding them because bone overgrowth rates are less and best results are with one to two plugs. More than them, the results are not as great. Next, we come to autologous chondrocyte implantation. So this is best done for active people with larger lesions. And when the lesion is more than six to eight millimeters deeper than the subchondral bone, we may have to graft it first because remember the subchondral bone is very important for cartilage regeneration. And this is always a two-step procedure. So what do we do first? We first clean up the lesion a little bit. The next step is to again harvest uh, uh, cartilage bits from non-weight bearing areas. These are then taken to a lab and put into a medium which is cultured. These are then harvested from this after about five to six weeks, mixed with a fibro gel. They are injected into the lesion and over a period of time, they form hyaline like cartilage. Now, sometimes, as I said, when it's deeper lesions, you need to bone graft them first to get a good subchondral bone before you do the ACI procedure. So greater than six to eight millimeters deeper, do a bone grafting and then do a ACI after that. Now, sometimes you have massive lesions, very, very big. You know that ACI may not help. And in those cases, osteochondral allograft transfers can be done, difficult to get them in India, but there are a lot of companies that manufacture them where you get these osteochondral allografts that you can put in in a press fit manner after pre preparing the bed. So this is my algorithm to manage a case with uh, a cartilage lesion. So these could be the reason, uh, the reasons for the cartilage lesion, OCD trauma, OCN in a patient who's younger than 50 years old. If the lesion is less than two centimeters, low demand patient, first choice, microfracture, second choice, osteochondral transfer. High demand active chap, a woman, first choice, osteochondral transfer, second choice, ACI, or autologous chondrocyte implantation. Two to four centimeters, low demand patient, microfracture first, OCT, osteochondral transfer second. High demand patient, first choice and only choice is autologous chondrocyte implantation. Let's say we have a failure here. What we do is a redo ACI or an ACI if any of the other procedures have been done. Those greater than four centimeters, low demand or high demand, you do an ACI and or a bone grafting along with it. So important factors to consider before doing anything. Alignment, so unless you correct biomechanics, you are not going to cause the cartilage to heal up again. So biomechanics, extremely important and greater than five degrees mechanical valgus, very important. Habits, smokers, healing is worse. Age, best done, best results of these procedures in patients less than 40 years of age. And if you have a ligamentous deficiency, correct that before doing any kind of cartilage procedure along concomitantly or otherwise. So this is a animation showing you why when you do a cartilage procedure, it's very important 
to unload the compartment where the cartilage procedure is done by doing an osteotomy so that the alignment is corrected along with a regenerative procedure. So what are our recent advances in this? So this is the latest thing, particulate articular cartilage. These are two types, which is the CIS, which uses a autograft and de novo NT, which uses juvenile allograft cartilage, which are particulate cartilage. So they basically in CIS, you basically take cartilage from the patient itself. It's a one step procedure advantage over ACI. You take it out, you take a little highline cartilage, you, you, you make it into small one to two millimeter pieces and you put it into the lesion and then put a fibrogel over it. In de novo NT, the same thing essentially, but they have a prepared juvenile allograft uh, which you can put in, which is small one to two millimeter chips. Advantages of this, uh, which, which are very preliminary, one to two year follow-ups have shown that the shape of the cartilage chondrocytes are more spherical, more like the original highline cartilage rather than highline like cartilage where it's spindle shaped. And of course, we the latest is augmentation of microfractures with scaffolds that are available like car gel and stuff like that, that have these factors that stimulate cartilage regeneration. So ultimately we have this highline like cartilage. We want the one to your right, which is highline cartilage. And that's what Thank you. May I ask a question? Yes, please. Yeah, Shikha. Um, mm -hmm. Vikram, excellent talk. Uh, you did mention, I think in between, wanted to find out like some of your cartilage procedures, would it be useful because to increase the concentration of cells to use, as we have heard in previous speakers, mesenchymal- I'm sorry, I lost CRP. you. Did you, I'm sorry, I lost you. Uh, I'm just back into the uh, this thing again. Is my presentation complete? Yes, I think we should. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah, you can stop. please ask me your questions again. I'm sorry, I couldn't follow you. My internet connection was dodgy. Sure, I've been having the same problem. No worries. Vikram, it was an excellent talk. Just wanted to find out, you did mention about uh, mixing, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, scaffolds uh, sometime with mesenchymal cells, but I was thinking for cartilage repair procedures like you do microfractures and other things, uh, would PRP and mesenchymal cell in association with the uh, procedure would increase the uh, result? So maybe sometimes we have very little chondrocytes. So uh, if we augment it with MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells, they would have a better outcome? I agree. I think after listening to Karan's talk, I decided to just stick to the surgical aspect. But I think there's a variety of options and any of these, though I don't have any personal experience of using PRP along with these cartilaginous procedures that I do, but I'm sure... I think we've lost Vikram again. Uh, maybe Dr. Pratik, you can um, uh, listen to his reply a little later. Uh, if you kindly permit, uh, can we move on or are there any other, uh, I think questions would be impractical because he's not able to join. Uh, Shekhar, shall we move on to the next talk? Yes, yes Raju. Yes. Right, so uh, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Sandeep who'd be speaking on uh, biological factors and soft tissue healing. Dr. Sandeep, you would need to unmute yourself, please, first. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes please go on. So at the outset itself, I express my extreme thank to Delhi Auto Brigade Association, particularly led by President Dr. Dharan Gupta. Please. Sir, uh, either you stop your video because your an internet connection is some sort of instability there is there. Can you stop your video, sir?
so i think that's the next speaker knocked down by a poor internet connection and dr pradeep if i may ask you it was very interesting in vikram's presentation that there was no mention of bmac so we had uh, dr uh, professor kumar speaking solely on bmac and vikram in his uh, nice algorithm didn't even mention about it do you use bmac in your practice till the time we are able to get dr sandeep back dr pradeep you are muted sorry yeah yeah is interesting value you you're right and i was going to ask again thanks to internet connection i could not in bmac you see both studies have shown that the even after concentration the amount of wiesen camel cells that we get is anything between 0.01 to 0.001% so uh, how much applicable it is to increase the you know to bring the results so there have been various studies and there is a plethora of heterogeneous uh, material used uh, so i am not uh, using it at the moment because in you know in a usual practice we use prp which is much simpler procedure to do less cumbersome as compared uh, to bmac but obviously in certain indication like dr vinod showed some you know fabulous uh, uh, you know results with such a big wow. lesions where my heart would be little you know not allowing me but uh, he showed tremendous results so that encourages us to maybe use it next time true sure. and and the biggest drawback is the uh, need to flip the patient around to go to the posterior iliac crest even though people have used it from the anterior crest and some from the tibial plateau as well but uh, yeah and it's very biggest. painful and it's very painful as well yes. when the patient lies at home when he lies on his back which the people mostly do it is painful so we have done few for avn uh, you know early stage of avn i have done few but that is my only indication is avn where we are seeing in stage 1 or you know a pre collapse stage where we decompress and then we put bmac and then seal it with the uh, bone wax so but it's jolly painful raju can we take the lost talk i think so let's do that and then Please, we will come back to him yeah 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 So Shikhar, please go on and uh, invite. I think the last speaker is Dr. Vivek Mahajan. He'll be speaking on uh, the role of biologic arthroplasty. Dr. Vivek, are you ready with your talk? Can you upload it right now? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Raju. Am I audible? Yes, loud and clear. Your screen okay. is not visible though, as yet. So, is the screen is visible? Yes, indeed. Please go on. Okay. Uh, just. Well, uh, good afternoon, respected panelists. Uh, moderators and i would like to thank dr dhananjay for giving me this opportunity well uh, most of my talk has uh, already been covered by dr vinod and uh, dr vikram so this might be a summary of what you have heard before so i'll be talking about biological arthroplasty is it the future of regenerative orthopedics well we already published a chapter on this in this uh, cartilage book by icrs and uh, well uh, to begin the talk this is what we call as orthobiological surgeon sprayer is to have the ability to help when you can the judgment to know when you can and cannot help and the wisdom to know the difference well when we talk about the biologic arthroplasty i want to make it very clear that we're talking about the focal defects which can be managed not about the generalized osteoarthritis where the patient needs the joint replacement uh, in my practice the indication for biologic arthroplasty as focal full thickness articular cartilage defects osteochondral defects localized avascular necrosis as shown very well and beautifully by dr vinod and early degenerative defects i usually don't try to uh, do these techniques in older individuals who are more than 60 years obese with a bmi more than 30 tri compartmental severe oa untreated malalignment knee instability any patient who have undergone a multiple steroid injection in the last 3 months of uh, biologic arthroplasty and patients who are non compliant to rehabilitation just to share with you this is a soccer player grade 4 defect patella defect with the anterior cruciate ligament rupture defect was quite big so we discussed all the options with the patient from microfracture aci bmac cartilage plug patellofemoral replacement and even to leave the sports and eventually bmac was done he was back to doing sports at one year of follow up 
MRI showed the almost complete filling of defect at two years of follow-up. Two years follow-up arthroscopy showed almost the complete healing of defect and biopsy was taken which showed type 2 collagen. It was hyaline-like cartilage, not the exactly hyaline cartilage. Well, our goal in biologic arthroplasty is the restoration of the structural and biomechanical integrity of the articular cartilage. If we talk about ideal cartilage regeneration, we need something which should not have any fibrous tissue. It should show a good basal and lateral integration. It should have abundance type 2 collagen and proteoglycans with no advancement of tide mark. And it should protect against the osteoarthritis in future. But at present, we don't have something which we can call as an ideal regenerate. In last 20 years of uh, evolution in orthobiologics or biologic arthroplasty, there have been two big steps, which we can say the steps forward. So one is we know the disease mechanism in a better way, and they have been dramatic enhancement in terms of biotechnology. So probably now a chance for articular regeneration does exist. If we talk about the global options, either you replace the cartilage using an auto or allograft, or you, you do a transplantation by ACI, or do a mesenchymal stem cell stimulation, either by microfracture or BMAC. Microfracture has been a good step, but maybe not ideal because the clinical effect, it tends to decrease after some time. The repair tissue or the fibrocartilage, it tends to deteriorate after some time and whatever functional or athletic activities achieved, they tend to decline after some time. Moreover, sometimes the microfracture in almost 30 to 50% of the patient, it causes the formation of intralesional osteophytes or a bony overgrowth. Due to alteration in Hello, the Hello, that's Naveen Talwar. Good afternoon, sir. This is Dr. Tarandra Jaggi. I am calling on behalf of the Goa Quan team. I would request the non-speakers to uh, mute so themselves. So this you is invited the... uh, as a panel member for the discussion on national telemedicine. Well, uh, due to alteration in the subchondral bone, and intralesional osteophytes, a lot of time what happens that if you need a subsequent cartilage repair, it tends to fail, especially the failure rate of ACI increases almost by three times if you have attempted the microfracture. So microfracture dictates a worse outcome for the next cartilage surgery. So it is not as benign as we always assume and it does burn the bridges if we talk about the next or uh, subsequent cartilage repair. So maybe we should change our protocol and try to avoid doing microfracture <clears throat> in defects where we expect the high failure rates, especially in patella or trochlea, because these defects might need a subsequent cartilage repair. ACI, 25 years of clinical experience, fantastic results, durable, good clinical results. However, it involves high cost because it involves the cell cultivation and scaffolds and two surgeries, of course, and it does not address the subchondral bone. If we are doing a pure chondral treatment like ACI, it will not have any effect on the subchondral bone and the joint microenvironment. Maybe it's a time to think that when we are addressing the cartilage issues, we need to look after both the subchondral bone as well as the cartilage because the subchondral bone matters. And we have learned it the hard way. Like in this case, you can see there's almost grade four defect, subchondral bone was involved. We did the cartilage repair. It has given us fantastic results, but still you can see the subchondral bone, still it has not regenerated. So probably we should have done some procedure for the subchondral bone in the beginning. Because no matter how beautiful your cartilage repair is, if your subchondral bone is not strong enough, eventually this cartilage repair can collapse. Due to these assumptions, Sanchez proposed the sandwich theory, which presume that probably the primary driver for the cartilage repair are subchondral bone and synovium, because these two structures are highly vascular and highly supplied by novel tissue, neural tissues. Cartilage by itself is avascular and a neural tissue. If we talk about a biological arthroplasty timeline, we started off with ACI, first, second, third generation. Then new scaffolds have come up, 
slowly we are moving towards a one step surgery using bmac dr vinod has spoken beautifully about all things related to bmac so i'll just brush through this bmac why we prefer it because it's easily available high proliferation capacity can differentiate to chondrocytes for cartilage regeneration and moreover it's a one step surgery the all steps are very simple you just need to prepare the defect harvest the marrow prepare it and do the final implantation we evaluated 25 patients with a large defects using bmac and publish our results at two years of follow up we concluded that probably the bmac is capable of regenerating a repair tissue for chondral defects but is there any evidence in literature for a biologic arthroplasty the results of biologic arthroplasty or using bmac and collagen matrix has been published with a 3 years of follow up showing promising results this paper uh, reference has already been given by dr vinod that if you compare bmac to aci both techniques are viable and effective for the large patellofemoral chondral lesions at a minimum follow up of 3 years another interesting paper which has come from nick that uh, in this paper it was compared aci oats and bmac for taller lesions and the author concluded that probably bmac is a treatment of choice for primary osteochondral taller lesions just to share with you a case uh, this gentleman a uh, young chap 22 years old had full thickness cartilage defect over the medial femoral condyle with anterior cruciate ligament rupture so i did anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction by all inside technique and the cartilage repair and you can see on table uh, taking the knee through a range of motion you can see the cartilage repair looks quite stable enough so biologic arthroplasty is a user friendly technique which involves the various cartilage repair techniques however we need prospective randomized studies at long term especially in large lesions if we talk about uh, bucket of wish list for a surgeon involved in biologic arthroplasty we need a scaffold which can give a good integration to the bone subchondral bone as well as the cartilage we need a optimized chondrocyte source we need growth factors surgery which is a single stage can be done arthroscopically cost effective with a low complication rate and a high success rate and which in the end should give us a normal cartilage my humble advice is that each available technique at present has a role always consider the local regional factors and the comorbidities there is no single option at present which can establish the highland cartilage seen naturally to conclude that we need a new framework which can improve the efficiency and rigor of cartilage repair clinical development and it needs collaboration between the industry regulators patients academicians and clinicians at the end we all are trying to find a biological solution to a biological problem thank you so much gentlemen thank you so much uh, dr vivek it was a very nice uh, talk and a very good summary uh, do we have dr sandeep has his internet connection been restored and is he able to join us i guess not uh, dr shekhar then let's take one or two questions and uh, then we yeah. can wrap up this session so vikram has joined back and vikram it was an excellent talk my question to you would be uh, you mentioned the role of osteotomy in cartilage unloading whenever a cartilage surgery is done what is the threshold value beyond which you would consider a proximal tibial or a distal femoral osteotomy uh, the angular threshold that is thank you Thank you. Thank you so much, and my apologies for these technical glitches. It worked throughout, but the, thank God my lecture at least could be completed. Well, you've heard uh, of Murphy's I, law, surely? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it is. So uh, it's very important to see the physiological virus or valgus that you have. So comparing it to the opposite limb is very important. For me, the threshold is usually five degrees of mechanical valgus. So if it is more than that. then concomitant uh, osteotomy should be performed because the cartilage uh, is going to find it very difficult to heal up unless you correct 5 degrees absolute value or 5 degrees five. of side to side difference vikram so i'm sorry to interrupt 5 uh, degrees of side to side difference or 5 degrees right 
So literature says five degrees mechanical values. For me, it is basically a difference of about three to five degrees as compared to the other limb. So if there's the a side difference, side difference of three to five degrees as compared to the other limb, I would go ahead and do an osteotomy along. Correct, because it's a major procedure to, to offer to a. Factors to consider here, of course. Absolutely, I agree with you. Ah, uh, Doctor Raju, I have a question for Doctor Vinod. Please go on, Doctor Manojha. Yeah. Doctor Vinod, I heard you speaking yeah. that uh, BMAC is best taken two to three mL from one point, and you told there are three points on one side. So, considering that you need about thirty mL. that means uh, it will be exhausting all the points and then only will get a 30 ml of a bmac so i am getting the bmac kits this year i was not aware of this point uh, will you please elaborate on this you see yeah no you are perfectly right that is a the ideal you see suppose you require a uh, 4 ml concentrate depending on the defect area which can cover around 2 cm square then it is better that you can take from two sides but like uh, what we have used and you are probably asking for that there is a huge defect i require around 10 ml uh, concentrate which requires at least 60 ml of uh, aspirate because i concentrate it uh, one sixth time or one fifth time to get the this thing then uh, it is it is advisable that you should try to get in different ratio like if you want to take uh, 60 ml you can take uh, 10 ml or 20 ml uh, from three sides it's not possible to limit yourself in each case of 2 ml or 5 ml what the study says that if you are aspirating the first 2 ml concentration is actually optimal after that for your psychology you may draw 20 or 40 from one but that has hardly any mesen chymal cell so you should Uh, optimize both ways seeing the theoretical advantage as well as the practical situation what is permissible in your hands you have to compromise in between what that 2 ml is a theoretical experimental study that yes beyond that concentration decrease significantly but it doesn't means that we can reproduce that in each and every case i agree with you it's, it may not be practically possible right thank yeah. you I think yeah that's not the correct order we know the studies have shown that the first 1 ml has got maximum mesenchymal cell and rest all 9 ml out of 10 have very little mesenchymal cells so yeah. if you take at different spots you are likely to get a better concentration of mesenchymal cells oh, uh, that's a validation of an english proverb as well first impression is the last impression or the best <laughs> impression <laughs> and one thing i want to add here what dr prateek was asking that about prp you see once you are using bmac bmac itself has a bone marrow dried platelets so uh, there is no use to add prp with bmac if you are using for cartilage so i think bmac is not merely the mesen chymal cells it has uh, bone marrow dried platelets which can give the uh, all the advantage of growth factors which are there in prp So, Dr. Vinod, I was meaning microfracture along with that, not uh, PRP with BMAC. Okay, okay. Microfracture, microfracture with PRP. Or the cartilage procedures okay. along yeah, with yeah, that, yeah. PRP or BMAC yeah. or PRP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That will enhance yeah. uh, the. Definitely, procedure. definitely, definitely. And Dr. Dr. Vinod, oh. are there yes, any sir. other sites from where you can take bone marrow, like trochanter and all? Yeah, yeah. You can. You see, you can take from so many sites. Like uh, best one is the posterior iliac crest. What what I have mentioned. Then the sternum. then the lower end of femur upper end of tibia and uh, even calcaneum so you can take from many uh, it's not a problem okay sir i have a question to for binod dr binod yes, sir. sir yes sir sir you mentioned about 10 ml syringe and 50 ml syringe yes sir it means ki if less amount we are taking yes so cells will be more yes yeah that is uh, very important to understand because yes, uh, if uh, there is a uh, means a study on that uh, that if you take 10 ml then the concentrate has uh, better number of mscs than if you take 50 ml and reason is that if you use high pressure then with the same pressure the chances of liquid come and diluting effect become more and more so you should not use the bigger size of syringe 
we should use 10 ml syringe or even small syringe depending on our need yeah yeah use i mean multiple so, time multiple time rather than one straight 20 ml or 30 ml so that's why i asked you this question and tell me is it dep- is it depends upon the bore of the needle also no uh, i don't think Do you so any idea about that uh, sir uh, uh, just I asking think, uh, i mean that is the standard uh, jamshedi needle which we use i think 23 or some goes i am not exactly remembering i don't find any study which has compared needles there may be effect okay. i am not aware sir i couldn't find no, that, anything on I, this i just just i inquired sir because uh, more bore needle will be will, will get better sales or yeah i agree of- with you uh, I, i i agree with you there may be impact but uh, again the question come of uh, balance as dr okay. pratik was saying if you use more and more then uh, you may have more and more pain and chances of perforation and all those things will increase Definitely. so somewhere you have to and if you will take bigger then it may even get blocked you will have a bone it will become a cannula or bone biopsy needle rather than a aspirate if you want yes. to aspirate a liquid then uh, you can't go beyond a level uh, yes. of diameter so and it is probably best to follow the manufacturer's recommendation yes. Yeah. Dr. Shikhar, uh, uh, shall we I wrap think, up this session with, yes. with your summary? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, you can just summarize the salient points and then we close it up. Right. So I think uh, the, the very subjects which most orthopedic surgeons would have spent their least time studying in the MBBS hematology has come back to haunt us with PRP and all these biologicals. The nomenclature keeps on changing. The the preparation methodology keeps on changing single spin double spin can sometimes lead to a lot of head spin to the orthopedic surgeon but i think the best is to read latest evidence and evidence can actually go in either directions uh, the important take home points in this session were prp is good evidence in uh, knee osteoarthritis as we heard from dr karan's talk and uh, dr vinod's talk the very important point is not to take the entire uh, sample for bmac at one go but to harvest it in 3 to 4 installments of uh, 10 ml each uh, excellent talk by uh, vikram in which he explained all the options for uh, cartilage repair unfortunately we couldn't have the talk by dr sandeep and uh, a very nice summary towards the end by dr mahajan so i think it's been a very fruitful session would like to thank all the speakers my co moderator dr shekhar and dr prithi thank you very much Dr. Dhanandi, uh, please uh, uh, take over for the next session. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, partner. Thank you so much. It's been a great discussion and a great talk. I really appreciate. Uh, Dr. Karan Raj, are you there? Yes, sir. Fine. Yes. Sir. Please take over. Uh, take over the next next session. Thank yes. you. Yes. Yes. thank you dr shekhar thank you dr pratik uh, thank you dr raju uh, thank you for a wonderful session okay so now moving on quickly to our last session we have dr varun gupta who is the vp of medical affairs at uh, 1md technologies and he'll be speaking to us about the national telemedicine guidelines uh, all of us have heard a lot about telemedicine and the role going forward in the covid uh, scenario and even in the post covid scenario uh, so let's have dr varun gupta uh, talk about this and dr varun was instrumental in actually uh, getting these telemedicine guidelines implemented so i think he's the you know the best person for us to hear this from dr varun and i'd also like to get the panel in place so we have dr sharad uh, as a part of our panel uh, and we have dr rk mishra sir uh, please if you could chair the session thank you dr varun please thank you dr karan thank you very much and uh, it's pleasure to be part of this uh, privileged audience and uh, i would uh, thank you very much. i'm really thankful that i have given me an opportunity to present this guidelines i'll present my screen uh, should i start or dr karan yes please go ahead please go ahead yeah okay i'll share my screen so that's uh, the topic of the session decoding telemedicine practice guidelines uh, before starting this quick introduction i am um, part of the leadership team at 1mg i am a senior vice president uh, and part of the core team at 1mg and part of different industry association like fiki 
IMI, uh, digital health platforms, and so on and so forth, and have been involved into uh, different stakeholder consultations, specifically regarding this telemedicine practice guidelines. So, I mean, there was a long thought process that went inside the formulation of those guidelines. And I start with, I was, interestingly, I was, on the weekend, I was uh, cleaning my shelves and then I got this document. I thought I would use this as one of the reference documents. So this was when we were, uh, as a part of the industry stakeholder consultation, we were preparing those guidelines. We prepared this uh, dossier where we looked at all the international guidelines and thought that what is what is going on in telemedicine across the country, across the globe? And what is that is the missing link for us? And in in our context, what is more important? Uh, so that's as an industry stakeholders, we were trying to put something which is more practical, which is uh, is important for, uh, should not be too technical in the terms of legal, it should not be a legal document, it should be a practical document. And that's the context. So one of the things, which is uh, which was the basic context of the entire telemedicine guidelines was that if a physician or a surgeon is practicing in his offline clinic, that should be the basic premise and that should be replicable to the telemedicine also. Telemedicine should just be a uh, should just be a mean to enable practice. Not there should not be additional layers of uh, additional layer of compliance, additional layer of uh, uh, regulations that should come in and inhibit the practice. So uh, I'll start this and this is, uh, if you look at the first, this is the first important slide where I would also want to show the uh, document per se. Sorry. So if you look at this, uh, this is this Telemedicine guidelines is part of the Appendix 5 of Indian Medical Council Professional Conduct and Etiquette Ethics Regulation 2002. That's the first important point to note that this is an amendment in the IMC Professional Conduct and Etiquettes Ethics Regulation because that's the basic premise that uh, determines the practice of a registered medical practitioner and this is an amendment within that IMC Act. So that's the important point. Then. What the overarching principle is, is a practical advice to doctors. It encourages the use of telemedicine as a part of normal practice. It helps provides effective and safe medical care to ensure patient and provider safety, realize the full potential of advancements in the technology for healthcare delivery. It's a practical framework. And it's, it has been divided into five sections. First section includes the definitions. Second section includes the elements of telemedicine consultation. Third includes duties and responsibilities of IM in general. D is framework for telemedicine and E is it is a guidelines for technology platforms which enable telemedicine. Platforms which enable telemedicine, there's a, a set of guidelines for them. So let's go section by section. First is the definition. And there is a definition which WHO guidelines, WHO definition has been taken by this telemedicine guidelines definitions. But the important point is, I want to highlight three important words is used for, they have included diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of the disease. Telemedicine can be used for all the three of things, and it can be used for uh, injuries, research, evaluation, and the continuing education of healthcare workers. So the point I'm trying to make is, if look, if you look at that, definition and if you look at the intent of board of governors is to make it as broad as possible so that all facets of uh, healthcare education as well as management are covered within this uh, definition specifically very very important the journey of telemedicine in india started in 2005 where there was a document that was launched by ministry of it and that included a lot of hardware related specification. So good point is that within this guidelines, they have given specific exclusions. They say that this specifications, it specifications for hardware or software are not a, a part of this telemedicine guidelines. Data management systems, standards and interoperability is not part of this. Use of digital technology to conduct surgical or invasive procedures remotely. They have not been included within the scope of these telemedicine guidelines. Other aspects of telehealth, such as research and evaluation, 
has not been included and does not provide for the consultation and this is a broader point because this is a, a paradigm shift uh, as i look into the history of telemedicine within india and within the globe uh, the the last guidelines which we had was more on the hardware and software kind of specifications and there was nothing for doctors there was no framework for the doctors and in this they have taken a change that this is for the doctors nothing to do with hardware and software and that's good they have not gone into the details of hardware and software because that's keep changing and this is a good step forward then initially broadly they have divided into four pieces they have said it is telemedicine applications could be based on mode of communication and they have kept it very very broad it could be text it could be video it could be audio everything any mode of communication is part of these guidelines then second point is purpose of consultation whether it is a first time consultation or whether it is a follow up consultation and for part of these guidelines uh, mind it very very important they have defined what is first consultation and what is a follow up consultation and they have defined that if it is in a within a 6 months period time with the same physician then is a first consultation uh, so uh, if first consultation is any consultation that is first follow up consultation is if it is within 6 months of the first consultation and the same physician so there was this point of debate and that was interesting the purpose this was defined was that say if a chronic disease patient like diabetes patient or hypertensive patient has been on medication for so many years and he is not he is uh, consulting not his primary physician but a new physician right now this is a continuum of care this is a follow up treatment but will that be a follow up consult according to the guidelines is not a follow up consult if the uh, if this is a new physician it's is a new consult for that physician is very logical is uh, but they have put that explicitly in the guidelines that's the important point that uh, if a physician is looking at the i i will use for the uh, consistency purposes they have used the word rmp registered medical practitioner so i would use rmp for all the registered medical practitioner so if rmp is looking at the patient for the first time or within the 6 months uh, of the first consultation that's a that's that's the first consultation uh, that if it is within the 6 months then it's a follow up consultation and if it is beyond 6 months it will again counted as a first consultation so that's the purpose of consultation then they have defined as timing of information transmitted and across the, this is i think according to the global standards they divide telemedicine consultation as synchronous or asynchronous if it is a real time chat it is a real time video consult if it is a real time audio consult where the information is transmitted real time that's real time if it is asynchronous that uh, somebody has forwarded the details on whatsapp chat and that's not real time a physician or rmp is responding to that after some time or uh, responding to documents on the email that is asynchronous so the purpose is they are saying that it both synchronous and asynchronous it is part of this telemedicine guidelines and then uh, they have included individuals included individuals involved it could be a patient to rmp it could be a caregiver to rmp it could be an rmp to rmp all such interactions are part of these guidelines so uh, so the point i'm trying to make is that with this they have set the context that look telemedicine according to them is very broad two it does not include hardware and software it does not include data management system so and so forth three audio video text everything is included first and follow up is included synchronous and asynchronous is included doctor to patient and patient uh, caregiver to doctor as well as doctor to doctor is also part of this and fourth they have defined care uh, through health worker consultation through health worker so this is the broader context they have set any questions at this point should i move forward uh, dr varun uh, this is dr sharad agarwal uh, yes can i ask a question i mean uh, yes, I, i'm surprised that you, you said that journey started in 2005 and what i remember is that it quotes even the beginning of 2020 we were told that uh, the penalties for giving any advice on phone or telecommunication is going to be very severe and uh, suddenly the everything has changed the moment the uh, pandemic struck and uh, uh, the telemedicine has become very uh, sort of uh, sort of thing 
uh, I mean, how do you and uh, uh, explain this kind of a contrast? Uh, so, uh, sir, so the journey of these regulations. Uh, so, the when I said 2005, I was referring to the first document by any ministry of the government on telemedicine, right? So, uh, that was a document that was uh, published by Ministry of IT and Ministry of Health. That was a panel, a mind panel. But having said that, pandemic, I would say, because I was involved in the entire piece of the journey, I would say the pandemic was just a facilitator because the work on these final telemedicine guidelines was on. And the reason it was on is because there was a Bombay High Court case that was well uh, uh, talked about that case that uh, the Delhi, uh, the Bombay High Court has banned telemedicine and that was being circulated all across. Right? And uh, that and two, uh, under Ayushman Bharat, there are um, there are wellness clinics and one of the important component of wellness clinic is telemedicine. So to enable those wellness clinics and telemedicine within the within those wellness clinic, there was need of the telemedicine guidelines to enable the uh, even the Ayushman Bharat program. So broadly, there was the work that has been started on telemedicine guidelines, I would say uh, later 2019 or early 2019, it started again where the momentum was built to come out with those guidelines. It just happened that the guidelines were ready and the pandemic stuck. If you remember, it was published on 25th of March, right? That was uh, just immediately after the lockdown. The detailed guidelines could not be worked out if, uh, in two or three days. It was a work of so many months. It would have been, it would have taken uh, much more time. Maybe uh, it would have gone through round of consultations, so and so forth. But that piece of things were uh, kind of uh, circumvented and it, it got published as early as 25th March. No, but then so, is the, is it, is the yeah. judiciary accepted it? Because suppose there is another case comes and uh, we got a, uh, it is precedent by the, uh, the court you just mentioned, uh, the same thing is quoted again and again the doctor is penalized. I mean, uh, how will that be, a, how do you protect from there? Is the yeah, very, very relevant, sir. I think Dr. Shah, that's a very relevant, pertinent question. Uh, now this, the initial 2005 document was just an advisory, right? This is a part of gadget notification. This is a gadget notification. First time um, in Indian regulations, telemedicine has been a gadget part of gadget notification. When I say gadget notification, that means there is a definition of telemedicine guidelines. There is a definition of what uh, RMP is expected to do. So even uh, so there is a framework which is notified framework so it's a part of regulations now right so now if the reference point let's say that there is a medical legal case that goes to the court right now the reference point would be this guidelines as a reference point whether the rmp or a particular case or a patient has ab uh, they abide to these guidelines then it is fine if they don't abide to these guidelines and there's there are some gray areas if there is a discussion that goes on that then there can be precedent, but it is a uh, it's a gadgeted notification as a part of gadget. This is a, uh, so that's the answer I would say that before that it was not part of gadget notification. Before 2020, it was not notifi notified. Right. So is it, it is similar to it is similar to let's say IMC guidelines or it is similar to any NMC, uh, anything which is a notified gadget. Uh, generally, in a court of law. Uh, that's that becomes a reference point and uh, a person has to abide by the law of the land so this is a law of law of the land now so uh, and very short crisp answer to this is before this uh, telemedicine was not defined in any of the laws of the country this is the first time telemedicine has been defined and a framework has been given for the RMPs that what they need to do to practice telemedicine. And now this becomes the reference point uh, that this is, we can refer to this document and say this, look, I am on the right side of the law if I have these checkpoints because this is, this is what law expects me to do. Uh, I am Dr. R.K. Mishra. Yes, sir. Hello, audible? Yes, sir. Uh, actually, whatever you are telling, you are quoting about 2005, definitely it was a suggestion, advice. Mm -hmm. But due to this pandemic and all, whatever the things is coming, it is becoming 
a prompt better to say that that is the need of time that's why it came in this way and whatever the dr uh, sharad agrawal sir was telling about this court matters and all always it is a gray area it was i mean to say because whatever the court is deciding they are deciding on the uh, uh, what do you call uh, medical board's advice they they are not doing by themselves whatever the case whatever the litigation or anything whatever it is with court they are asking medical boards and medical board had no power and no not to analyze anything without this gazette definitely after gazette whatever they will say in the court as advice definitely it will matter and no courts on this basis penalize any doctor dr sir sir is it clear to you sir yeah yeah uh, i i got the point yes sir thank you thank you proceed sir yeah thank you sir i think thank you for the nice explanation i will move to the next piece uh, that's the second section of the telemedicine guidelines uh, it talks about telemedicine elements of telemedicine and they are divided into seven parts context identification of rmp mode of telemedicine patient consent type of consultation patient evaluation and patient management let's go to them one by one let's first talk about the context now this is very very important base uh, one of the take home message from the entire piece of the guidelines uh, professional judgment and they have i think they have used this word professional judgment for less more not less at least for 10 times in the entire piece of document and the entire document is based on this piece that rmp should exercise their professional judgment to decide whether a telemedicine consultation is appropriate in a given situation complexity of the presentation or an in person consultation is needed in the interest of the patient so the basic premise in telemedicine guidelines is that let's say let's take an example of a person of an rmp looking at a patient in a clinic in an offline setting right now the rmp has the entire uh, judge, entire uh, treatment entire diagnosis entire approach depends on the professional judgment of the rmp rmp is a trained person is a registered person he takes his professional judgment to see that what all investigation needs to be done what all treatment can be done whether it is surgical case or it is a medical case or whatever that all depends on the professional judgment similar to that situation in telemedicine guidelines everything to so telemedicine telemedicine is just a means or mode it does not change the context context remains the same that a patient and a doctor a patient or rmp has a professional relationship and rmp uh, is the best person to decide whether this treatment diagnosis and so on and so forth is important for the patient similarly rmp should exercise their professional judgment to decide whether telemedicine consultation is appropriate and in the flow chart given in the later in the guidelines what they have given is that rmp can decide to exit any time of the telemedicine consultation and say to the patient that look uh, this particular case cannot be handled on telemedicine consultation i can provide you a first aid or a basic guidance but you need to go to the uh, offline you need to go and have an in person consultation that's at different points of us uh, uh, rmp can exit the interaction between the patient and patient right so that's a very very important point uh, and second is of course availability and adequacy before proceeding with the patient management rmp should consider the more technology available that's the that was the point of debate let's say i i am doing a whatsapp chat with some patient patient gives me a history on whatsapp chat and i don't think that whatsapp chat is the right mode of communication i can put my foot down and say that look this can only be done on a video consultation and i am available on this 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 date uh, consult my uh, coordinator for booking an appointment so our narmp should uh, exercise his right to choose the mode of technology and uh, adequacy for a diagnosis whether that mode is adequate for the diagnosis or not so entire context is that one if one has to visualize the telemedicine guidelines they have to visualize the normal in person consultation uh, same principles would apply to a telemedicine consultation that's the context what they have explained 
uh, second point which they have been uh, saying that multiple times that telemedicine consultation is not designed to be anonymous neither from a patient and not from an rmp end rmp should verify and confirm patient identity on the name age address email id phone number registered id or any identification that may be required there are no hard and fast rules uh, they say that uh, because in an offline in an in person con consult also when rmp feels comfortable that he know that patient well he moves to the next step similarly to telemedicine consultation similar to this in telemedicine consultation it is on rmp that he should verify the patient identity and he should be comfortable with the identity of the patient and uh for patient patient should be able to verify rmp's identity the credential the contact details and there should be a proper display of registration number according accorded to rmp by the state medical council and national medical commission on prescription website electronic communication receipts so there should be a particular way It doesn't means that you start the consultation with saying that look this are my credential but there should be a mechanism Uh, for a patient to check for all these credentials uh, and the mechanism could be as i as i said in the earlier slide that we have to see an in person consult uh, when uh, rmp looks at the consult all those credentials are available on the prescription right similarly if a end result of telemedicine consultation is a prescription and it has the credentials of the rmp that is absolutely fine so Uh, they have not defined that as black and white, but given a, a broader framework. And the point is that it should not be anonymous for the patient as well as from for the RMP. And for the generation of the prescription, uh, this is a little a gray area. They have mentioned that age of the patient is mandatory. If there is a if there is any doubt, RMP to see age group. and for minor prescription would be allowed only if minor is consulting along with an adult whose identity needs to be ascertained now they just uh, touch this point right and they not given the entire details of what does that mean there could be different use cases for this for, for which this may or may not be applicable so they have just touch this point plus on the identification of the rmp third on the mode of telemedicine anything can be used audio video text and uh, as i mentioned rmp must decide the best technology to use to diagnose and treat and may switch, switch the mode of communication if required patient consent now that's interesting right so they have uh, taken a very different view on patient consult the reference point was in person consult when a patient walks in into a opd chamber there is an implied consent consent of the patient right similarly if the telemedicine consultation is initiated by the patient he gives uh, the rmp a phone call or books an appointment or send a whatsapp chat or an email that has been initiated by the patient so the consent is implied but explicit consent is required if the consultation is initiated by a health worker or a caregiver explicit consent if it is required that it can be recorded in any form patient can just send an email text or audio video message uh stating that yes i consent to avail consult via telemedicine or any such communication in simple words so as i mentioned earlier um what i realized after reading this for multiple times is that uh, it is very very light on the legal side so they have not given they have not used too many legal jargons to make it more complex it is more practical framework for rmp to use so uh that's on the patient consent side then types of consultation uh first consult and follow up consult first consult is for the first time earlier but more than 6 months have lapsed since the previous consultation earlier but for both but for a different health condition uh that's what they have explicitly defined that if a person was uh referring a internal medicine physician for diabetes and he has some other problem let's say covid and he is consulting for the covid now in that case that's for a different health condition so it would be considered as a first consult even if the consult is within the 6 months of the first consultation so a lot of a lot of emphasis has been given of first consult and follow up consult and the reason they have given a lot of emphasis is that type of medicines that can be prescribed 
based on whether it is a first consult or a follow up consult and follow up consult patient is consulting within the rp within 6 months of his or her previous in person consult it is for the continuation of care and of the same health condition it not to be considered as a follow up if any of the following is true more than 6 months have lapsed before, from the previous consultation there are new symptoms that are not in the spectrum of the same health condition rmp does not recall the context of previous treatment ad advice so that's a uh, to be considered as first consult not as a follow up consult then patient evaluation so now it starts the exchange of information between the rmp and the patient again uh, the type of information the quantity of information is based on the professional discretion as i said this word has been used multiple times and lot of importance has been given to the professional judgment professional discretion of the rmp so it is depending on how much history how much investigations how much uh, information is required for a professional uh, for the professional judgment that is based on his discretion and the type and extent of patient information is also dependent on professional discretion person can uh, rmp can request for additional information can request for physical examination or a surrogate physical examination or some lab findings or lab reports uh, before taking a professional judgment and rmp should maintain all patient records including case history investigation reports images as appropriate and there was a lot of debate around that do we need to store this do we need to store the video recordings do we not to store the audio recordings there's a lot of debate that if you have to uh, go abide by these regulations do we need to store this so um, as i said the intent was that it is part of medical ethics guidelines imc 2012 guidelines part of that it is a chapter within that particular guidelines so you have to look at this guidelines in the picture of the entire imc guidelines not as an isolated telemedicine guidelines and uh, at lot of this point it refers to the imc guidelines as a, as applicable in imc so so we have to do whatever we do uh, in our normal in person consult if a particular case requires records to be maintained in in person or ipd settings that needs to be done in telemedicine guidelines if it does not require records to be maintained you don't need to maintain the records within the telemedicine setup also it is similar to what we do as in an in person consult uh, patient management so prescribing medicines again they have used this word that same professional accountability as in tradition traditional in person consult if an rmp is writing any medicine any treatment that's a professional accountability and similarly uh, uh, that's true for telemedicine also they have used they have taken this lines from that uh, bombay high court judgment right this is what was the judgment was that prescribing medicines without an appropriate diagnosis provisional diagnosis will amount to a professional misconduct so this this is the quote unquote lines that were there in the uh, bombay high court case and that is what they have also referred to and this is true for in person consult and there is a basic format of prescription that includes date of consultation all the basic stuff is there and uh, a prescription can be a type of the prescription it could be a scan of a signed prescription it could be an e prescription uh, there was a lot of debate that e prescription has not been defined what is an e prescription so they this that is in the process of clarification that there there is a chance that a clarification may be issued as what is an e prescription at this point they have just left e prescription open for interpretation but given a format of the prescription transmit the prescription to the patient or to the pharmacy as appropriate patient management uh, they have defined the group of drugs uh, drug health education counseling and medication that is what uh, broadly and there is no restriction of health education and counseling that can be done on any mode of consultation any nature of consultation but for medicines they have used two levers one lever is which type of consultation is there whether it is a video audio or text and two what type of consultation is there whether it is a first consultation or a follow up consultation and the basic principle is uh, that if it is a first consultation the basic otc medicine kind of drugs can be prescribed on any type of consult but what but if it is a first consultation and it's a video consultation only list a medicines can be prescribed and uh, for the follow up 
for the follow up patient there is a list b there is a more broader list that can be prescribed only to a follow up patient now there is lot of gray areas between list o a and b and uh, what they are working and there were some clarifications that were issued by uh, ministry of health after 25th march that listed lot of drugs that were in a b and c but the broader point which i see and can be a uh, used as a framework is number 1 if it is uh, if it is an health education counseling or uh, generally over the counter medications that are prescribed any mode any patient first patient first time patient or follow up patient if it is a video consult if it is a first consult prefer a video consult to prescribe medications if it is a follow up medic follow up consult then also it is absolutely fine i'll take a small uh, part at this point if there are any questions uh, happy to discuss uh, uh, sorry dr mishra please go ahead no 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 sir 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 you continue sir continue then so uh, varun uh, what uh, i want to know that as, as i understand uh, regarding the consultation whether to continue with the consultation or ask the patient to be uh, to be seen physically or to visit the clinic lies with the doctor i understand yes. right so uh, it, at times it may become very difficult to decide uh, uh, the case which have probably been mentioned probably bombay high court case is same that gent until elderly gentleman called the doctor for a fever that i got a fever and uh, naturally any of us would first day they take a coat tablet of paracetamol see if it doesn't settle in a day or two then you seek advice the same was done probably in that case and that gentleman developed some complications of a dengue fever and died ultimately so this no, no. Kind of, yeah okay this kind of error this kind of but i'm trying to say this kind of error can happen very easily on a on a, on a tele consultation Uh, you talked to a patient calls you you think that is it something which can be tackled on uh, on on telecommunication and ultimately in a short short period of time there a complication develop and the patient has a problem does this whole uh, act of all guidelines do and give any protection to the doctors from these kind of judgment uh, judgment uh, error of judgment uh, if they are given on phone uh, yes so uh, coming to your first point the i have reviewed that bombay high court case in uh, much detail and i have gone through the each of these documents so there were lot of things that happened in that particular case and it was a uh, it was a case where the uh, the patient was admitted in the nursing home of that doctor and uh, the discharge card was even given to the patient a day before he left the city right and uh, and there were so many so many nuances in that case that was not only one of those incidences of consulting on telemedicine there was a uh, and i'm not commenting on that but at least uh, the honorable court has observed that negligence was at many points uh, at okay. at least 10 15 20 points right so they have noted and observed that so tele part was just one piece of it having said that uh the question you ask is they have a kind of defined if you look at this this is what they have defined that they have given some framework that patient patient identification consent and if quick assess if emergency care is required if yes advise first aid immediate relief measures guide patient for referral as appropriate so one of the things they have been mentioning uh, it is similar to offline in person consult let's say i am a internal medicine doctor and there is a patient which is beyond my capacity and ophthalmological case comes to me right and but he comes to my clinic i have to take a stand look i don't know about this domain uh, you better refer to an ophthalmologist i may prescribe some uh, symptomatic treatment and refer document that you need to refer to an ophthalmologist for this condition this is beyond my scope right so similar to that uh, at least theoretically they have mentioned that rmp has to exercise Uh, his right and say that this is not this cannot be done on this professional if prescribe only if he is comfortable prescribing that if he has gathered the adequate information that all the checks and balances have been taken care of that's what at least that framework is plus uh, plus as they have mentioned that it is the professional judgment and if prescribing paracetamol for, for a particular case of fever if there is a professional uh, 
if we have reason 1 2 3 4 the reason we have prescribed a particular medicine for that case and if we are able to uh, produce that in a let's say i'm hypothetically saying court of law that's professional judgment right that's part of rmp's professional judgment that i thought that this is i prescribed this particular medicine for reason a b c right so one can justify those reasons then it is absolutely fine Uh, did i answer doctor uh, 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 just just, uh, just just a little more clarification i want on that what i am trying to say is that if the rmp thinks in the, at the first consultation that this problem can be solved on tele telemedicine and he does prescribe something and unfortunately it turns out to be something more sinister and i mean uh, very quickly patient develops some complication in the next one or two days is there any there is a sub, there is obviously a error, error of judgment on the part of uh, of the of the rmp in deciding whether it was an, a real emergency or it was just a, a simple problem uh, is there any protection for the rmp to making this kind of error of judgment uh, dr sharad sir i have a follow up question on that just to build on this because this was discussed multiple times and the way it was built was that let's take similar scenario in an in person consult right an rmp looks a patient and takes a professional judgment of prescribing medicine and that may be an error on the part of the uh, rmp right now what yeah. happens in a normal in person consult okay uh, i agree it i mean it depends on it depends on the uh, whether that so the particular if the patient uh, puts up a complaint puts up a complaint it would depend on that particular case whether that professional call was part of the uh, judgment or was it uh, because there is a thin line that differentiates between the judgment and uh, negligence so that would be decided by a board or ethics committee of uh, nmc and so on and so forth that depends on the particular case so only my only point is that in person uh, the, uh, patient, the doctor rmp would have more data to decide on on telic medicine you know that we cannot see uh, examine the patient cannot uh, sort of uh, see all the parameters that's why it is more chances of doing an error, error an error on telecommunication medicine telecommunication that's what i'm trying to say you know yeah, more data I, i agree i completely agree uh, in the sense that if let's say i am arguing that case in a court of law i cannot argue that because the rmp has done a teleconsultation there is an uh, there is a case that can be filed i cannot argue on the telemedicine as a means because that's a telemedicine is an accepted gadgeted definition is there before 2000 uh, before march 2020 i could have argued that telemedicine is not an acceptable uh, mode of communication or mode of consultation i would have argued on that also now my uh, sub arguments depends on a particular case but as you rightly said it has its own limitations uh, telemedicine has its own limitations and strengths so it, it is on the professional judgment it is similar to um, so there can be such scenarios in different kind of in person consults and opd versus ipd versus or whatever there could be different uh, and rmp would have different data points or different variety of data points at different levels so based on that a person takes a uh, call or professional judgment similarly in telemedicine also i mean but as you said it's too early uh, there would be all this litigations would come in the year to follow and we would see that how it evolves right so right uh, can i add one thing to sir sharad sir yeah uh you asked one thing sir your question is very valid sir one thing firstly <coughs> you told sir ki in emergency if anybody is consulting me for tele medicine definitely according to his symptoms we can prescribe the medicine and if we think it is a case of an emergency or it is not to be handled by me or by the better person i mean to say rmp of that particular uh, thing so in that condition we can tell them or make a note of that as early as possible to visit to the cons uh, consult uh, uh, i mean to say uh, concerned consultation or if we are writing anything whatever we are writing in giving in 
video audio or anything it is documented so nobody will say why you are not given any uh, a referral to other person let's say might be in mid of the night some of third person you are you have not seen that patient before telling you sir i have heard your name by a name of orthopedic surgeon i am getting pain over any part of that body or something something just you can give a medicine to get relief from the pain or वैसे condition में better to tell them कि आप concern मेरे को लगता है कि ये ये भी possibilities है तो you better consult to the next consultant or it's better to visit them definitely sir telemedicine is a very good thing even then physical examination of the patient is always will be there and it will help a lot sir so many things can be changed on telemedicine and physical visit verification uh, uh, visit of the patients this one yes doctor am i right or wrong what absolutely. is your opinion absolutely uh, telemedicine is just is just a tool uh, is just a tool uh, is the yeah. rmp to decide whether to use this tool or not to use this tool definitely telemedicine was started with a thought that ki any time somebody is in remote the person can get the benefit of be best of his uh, 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 doctor if somebody is sitting in delhi and see uh, and patient is sitting in somewhere in any part of india and that is in remote area definitely if he has number or contact number or by any means he can get better uh, treatment he can do this lekin sir iska uh, thoda sa galat bhi use ho raha hai that is we will talk afterwards doctor you have mentioned one thing that first consultation and follow up consultation first consultation was not uh, defined before this telemedication first consultation after 6 month if anybody is coming to a uh, doctor even he is on but he or she on the particular uh, this one treatment it will be considered at first first uh, uh, first uh, uh, first only is it clear yeah ha huh? yes sir yes sir because so many times it happens you have written patient prescribed patient for dead Uh, six week or three months or two months, but after that the patient has not come for follow up. He is coming after six months, eight months, nine months, ten months, and will tell you that I was continuing this medicine only. What it may get complicated due to those medicines also. Sometimes it happens whatever he is telling that is not the true also. In that condition, this daily medication. gadget has given a very good explanation that in that condition patient should be treated as first consultation because ki aapko nahi malum hai ki is 6 mahine mein usne kya dawaiyan li ya nahi li ya ya wo kis condition mein tha it is a very good one according to me am i right yeah yes sir okay please sir continue sir and uh, sir we can to uh, move forward sir sir yes, sir okay yes sir okay thank you sir i would like to move quickly now because it is getting late so we'll yeah i just don't, now finish just, the talk then we'll discuss okay thank yes, you okay sure i'll just take uh, two three more minutes and finish this uh, so there is a list of prohibited medicines that has been published and mostly it includes the uh, anti cancer drugs narcotics as such as morphine and codeine but the my uh, take on this list is that it needs to be evolved and uh, in subsequent years you will get a detailed list of such medicines can prescribe on what consult but from a direction perspective this gives us a direction what is the direction that needs to be taken so that's what how we should look at it rather than looking at it academically uh, so that's on the duties and responsibilities that the next section and broadly they are saying that 
medical ethics data protection and privacy penalties this is as per the prevailing laws there is no new thing that has been introduced in this guidelines and that's that's the important point technology technology breach i uh, as an rmb i am very happy to see this line rmb will not have, will not be held responsible for a technology breach or breach of confidentiality privacy by a person other than the rmb because as we use telemedicine there are multiple stakeholders we have to work with if there is a particular problem with a particular stakeholder rmp is not held responsible there is a protection for the rmp for the technology breach and misconduct uh, next section is misconduct uh, actions that willfully compromise patient care or privacy and confidentiality or violate any prevailing law are explicitly not permissible so uh, broadly if i have to give one of the things after reading this i got it is that uh, whatever is there in IMC Indian Medical Council Ethics Act that's the prevailing law that is also applicable while we practice telemedicine uh, maintain digital trail and documentation uh, it is incumbent on an RMP to maintain and retain the following for a period of as prescribed from time to time similar to what uh, we do an in person consult for an OPD or IPD interaction similar to that that has to be maintained in telemedicine uh, explicitly they have mentioned for telemedicine fee for telemedicine consultation consultation fees as appropriate an appropriate fee can be charged depending on the type of consultation experience so and so forth but they have mentioned that receipt of the fee charge should give a receipt invoice the fee charge that is what they have explicitly mentioned uh, is a step forward i don't think i have ever seen a document where these things have been mentioned explicitly uh, summary that's the last slide summary is Do's and don'ts. Do's is assess the context and appropriateness of teleconsult. In this remote world, we get a lot of calls, messages. We have to uh, put our foot down. Maybe prepare some templates to which, if we, if an RMP does not have enough time to reply to all those messages, at least those templates could be pasted that go and refer for an in-person consult. So that's important to assess the context and appropriateness of teleconsult. is important to at least document the identity of the patient and the caregiver while uh, documenting the teleconsult inform about your identity there should be a link uh, or there should be a signature in the whatsapp messages or whatever the where the registration number and identity can be done so that is important confirm the patient consent prescribe in according to the guidelines broadly speaking if it's a first consult better use a video consult to prescribe any medicine that's the in general would be the safe mode uh, maintain the patient records as applicable don't do an anonymous consult do not continue if you are not comfortable do not breach the confidentiality do not deny emergency consult they have mentioned that a person uh, an rp can give first aid and refer to uh, the appropriate care do not prescribe from the prohibited list uh so professional judgment should be the guiding principles same principles apply irrespective of mode video audio text exercise professional discretion for the mode of communication not to proceed and there is a right for the rmp to discontinue the conversation that's the broadly the essential principles i would uh, end my presentation over this point with this and they have given the detailed flow charts which uh, one can refer to that what needs to be done in the first consult and this is a, this is just a, a flow chart and whatever we have discussed in text as given in the flow chart uh, and there are some guidelines for technology platform which are enabling telemedicine these are not applicable to rmps for the technology platforms uh, they are obligated to ensure consult with conduct due diligence before listing an any rmp they need to report non compliance AI and this is an important point. Artificial machine learning can assist and support RMP, but not consultations. So that's an important point. Explicitly, they have mentioned that all the AI and machine learning tools need to assist the RMP. Should not directly uh, interact with patient in any form or manner. That's important. Proper mechanism to address queries and grievances and violators should be blacklisted. May be blacklisted. Uh, a single uh, one line about what is one MG. Uh, this is a healthcare tech startup, and why we kept it as one MG because our first office address when we started late in 2014, our office address was one Mahatma Gandhi Road, and it was also kind of uh, 
related to medicine strength so we thought that it is a sciency name uh, this is a management team uh, uh, globally experienced team management team we uh, want to do information engagement internet hospital data science and ai enabled models personalized health management is um, where we want to be. can we just to the academic uh, is it over sir no, this is this is the that's it is it over yes sir sharad dr rakesh over to you sir. yes sir any other panel, any other panel panel discussion sir uh, i think uh, dr varun you have very uh, explicitly clearly defined what the guidelines for uh, telemedicine uh, I, I, what i could gather is uh, and we and we have felt it also that there are certain gray areas and how it is going to proceed in that line will only time will tell us when as you said the litigations and that other things may come up in future and second point is whether is there are certain guidelines which are to be followed certain methodology methodology which to be followed like keeping records and uh, keeping consents and all those things which many of us may not be able to do at this stage and slowly that system has to develop but it is it is an end thing it has to stay it is not going to go away so thanks for your uh, nice presentation dr mishra unmute yourself mishra ji unmute karenge मैं करता हूं मैं करता हूं सर मेरी तरफ से नहीं हो रहा है उनका शायद हाँ, हो गया हो गया हो गया हो गया सर वेरी गुड प्रेजेंटेशन बाय दिस डॉक्टर वरुण ही इज एलोबरेटेड सो मेनी थिंग्स एंड वॉट एवर द कॉन्स एंड प्रोन्स ऑफ दिस telemedicine he has told sir one very good point is there that you may or may not keep the whatever the things uh, you have talked with or chat with the your uh, patient but it's better according to me that we should keep it as our record we can keep all the photographs all the documents with ourselves it is always legal for us in any time it will help you we us any time sir and any litigation or any point is not coming after 4 to 5 years it is definitely within 6 month 1 year 2 year 3 years not more than that so it's and nowadays it is not very difficult to keep it us with us सो so, कहीं भी रख सकते हैं सर गूगल ये वो बहुत डॉक्यूमेंट्स हैं वहां हम लोग डाल सकते हैं और इट्स बेटर टू कीप इट क्योंकि हम लोग जितनी बार प्रिस्क्रिप्शन लिखते हैं दैट इज वी आर नॉट कीपिंग विथ एज रिकॉर्ड बट विथ टेलीमेडिसिन वी कैन कीप इट सो सर ये हमारे लिए फायदे की चीज है और बाद की जो चीजें आएंगी वो तो समय के साथ पता चलेगा कि टेलीमेडिसिन में क्या प्रॉब्लम है और कैसे है ठीक है सर right dr mishra sir it's a developing science we all learn it thank you i think we can thank end the session thank you sir. thank you thank you very much dr over to dr dhananjay for uh, uh, final uh, i think uh, uh, i think we should declare the close of the academic session of doacon 2020 with your kind permission sir it has been a marathon run uh, for a, a, any state conference and i'm really glad that we still have so many runners still on their legs at the end of the session and uh, i would like to request dr hitesh lal to take over from there and announce the winners of the competition session of the various papers and the posters which were held, which was held yesterday thank you sir uh, these are the results of the competition held during this doha con 2020 for the pg competition the first prize goes to dr arpit sahu second goes to dr dr sharukh khan ahmed third goes to dr dh nikuni ova i think three cheers to all the winners yes sir cheers sir cheers for non pg contest first prize goes to dr pranjit khuran of esi rohini the second prize goes to dr bhushu harna of max for forget wonderful very good cheers for them also sir for the poster competition first prize goes to nishant mehta 
second goal goes to dr narottam das and dr kulbushan kambhoj third prize goes to dr soda varapu praveen and sagar bagwe i hope they are here to appreciate their hard work catching them yeah. nice <laughs> this is an international paper award in the more than 40 years category it goes to dr anil arora and in less first prize goes to dr pramod and k second goes to dr kunal arora and third of course third is dr ona keshian and dr mohammad danish wonderful i mean it it simply showed we had such nice uh, quality of the papers over here it was a tough call and i think all the all the uh, uh, people the margin was highly 0.5 uh, 0.5 marks or uh, one point uh, if there is uh, do 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 you want to carry on with your uh, exchange of medallion with your uh, dua activity or i just simply uh, present the vote of thanks and do it virtually it's my pride pride privilege to hand it over to uh, dr uh, many lalit many Uh, and thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you very <laughs> much, sir. Dr. Lalit, man, you 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 just need to bow your head also like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I put it there, right? Bye, <laughs> Lago, sir. So the symbolic part is over. Now we come to the most important part of this uh, particular conference: the vote of thanks. It gives me great pleasure and great honor uh, to share. Uh, all the accolades with my team, which have been working very, very hard, honestly. Uh, for any uh, just such uh, conferences, the objective remains uh, good academic content for the uh, delegates. So I'm indeed thankful to all my faculty, the speakers, and especially the presenters. I mean, you'll be surprised, as we had discussed earlier, also yesterday, that this particular. generation of uh, residents they are very well aligned with the latest developments thanks to media thanks to the net and their uh, paper presentation skills paper preparation skills they have been outstanding really i mean of course we are quite um, senior in that matter when if we compare we cannot compare ourselves from them when we were there at that stage uh, the sort of resources which we had they were uh, quite restricted but still their confidence and their uh, workmanship it was outstanding so i am indeed thankful to all the people who came over as faculty as presenters and as the speakers uh, we are really uh, thankful to all the delegates who took a first log in i still don't have an, i don't have the numbers exactly i am trying to get them from the uh, platform moment i get it uh, i'll 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 share it with you then the whole process you have men the machine or the media and the money so the men i would say i mean you can see ravi chauhan has been sitting there throughout i really hope that his chair is quite good otherwise he'll be visiting somewhere with the coffee dania i mean outstanding effort thank you so much ravi for being there all the while uh need to say uh, hitesh lal amit kansal they have always been the backbone i mean anything you get stuck you just call them over and tell them and that's it i mean blink of the eye ho jayega that's it those magical words you know and you can always count on them there are shrad agarwal i mean i must have called him up so many times for his guidance for his advice and i mean i was never ever left wondering hi and dry ki nahi ye kya ho gaya hai apna wo regarding the scientific program dr anil jain has been there at the forefront i have had some great input from the people like dr lalit mani i shared the program with him and his input was quite uh, i would say appreciated dr rajiv joshi uh, he was my senior at sanjeevi institute of orthopedics even he his input about the uh, about the topics and the other subject was quite quite nice rather uh, kavin raj jaggi i mean that man has got a wonderful mind he can just sift through he just sits down ki acha sir kya karna hai ye session hai so let's see let's let's think what topics can be taken up over there so his contribution in the scientific program was quite outstanding also uh the toast of the evening the so called cultural program dr yash kulati dr anmol maria dr rajiv jain i mean these guys they were so passionate they were so upfront 
and they mobilized everyone over there. And it was really heartening to see one of the executive committee just throwing their mask away and joining the dance, you know, at the stage. It was very nice. Thank you so much, guys. As an organizer, it gives you sort of happiness that yes, everyone was able to enjoy. Uh, the machine or the media, the author TV platform. I mean, honestly, I'm telling you, Dr. Shok Shyam, Dr. Neeraj, and Mr. Raji Menon also. Uh, the 27th November program, it wasn't in the schedule. Still, these guys, they came up on board. They prepared the whole platform. I mean, it was wonderful, honestly. Uh, it, I mean, you know, uh, I would say 75% credit goes to them for building up such a nice platform. The, the, the feeling as such, you know, that you're entering into a wonderful arena and you have lecture halls, you have poster hall exhibition area. It was wonderful, really. My first experience, but it was very nice. Thank you so much, team. And uh, again, uh, like today we had to run a special program. So these guys again built up uh, the, I mean, they gave us the connection for the Hall B again. So they were always upfront trying to help us out. And we really appreciate their help. Coming to the money part, of course, it would have been possible without the financial assistance that we received from our sponsors. Uh, the outstanding have been Zydus, Cadillac, Ortho Divisa. I mean, you can call them platinum plus platinum plus platinum. Uh, almost 50% of our budget came through them. I'm indeed thankful to them. Uh, then we had so-called platinum sponsors, uh, IPCA, orthopedic reason. They have been, um, uh, I would say, they have committed. They are yet to deliver, but I can count on them. They won't let us down. Torrent has also not come forward uh, in the terms of the amount which they will be sharing, but they have been uh, sort of uh, coming forward that, yes, we will support you. Avis, Bone Max Division, then Novartis, Panacea Biotica, Dr. Reddy's Tolia Lab, they all have been gold sponsors. And I'm sure uh, at the end of the uh, audit, Dr. R.K. Mishra will be able to tell us how much we have sort of, you know, managed uh, through DOA coffers and without the DOA coffers, or rather how much they're going to contribute. They're still open-ended. And thank you so much, gentlemen. It has been a great, great journey. And I think it's been a fulfilling ending to my association with the Delhi Orthopedic Association. As a past president, I can, I can, I can happily retire now that yes, I've done my part. Thank you so much. Dr. Dhananjay, nobody will let you go retired. And you are not, not yet retired, yes, sir. And, and three cheers for Dr. Dhananjay. Excellent sir, job. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Excellent, thank you. excellent culmination of DOA uh, EC 201920. Uh, 201920. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. We can call it off now, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Off, off live now. Well, can I stop the streaming? Yeah. Okay, sir.